I believe the most important thing that will happen this weekend is when you all are talking to one another. So as long as you're doing that, I will not interrupt. The toughest part of any group activity comes after any break in the regathering. <coughs> Very difficult. And, and it's a life thing. <laughs> That's just an automatic response to so many photo shoots. <laughs> for 11 years, I did a little retreat in Santa Barbara, California, for a group of loonies out of the Los Angeles and Santa Monica Basin. Uh, I love them dearly, but... I'm glad I don't live there. <laughs> Monastery outside of Santa Barbara up on the hill. Lovely, lovely place. But regathering was always difficult. <clears throat> and on this one particular occasion, we had a couple of professional singers who were sitting next to me. I'm not used to hearing myself talk. That's terrible. <laughs> don't listen. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody's busy chatting and we're not getting back to it <clears throat> and they know how I operate I won't interrupt so one of them went hmm his partner just reflex went hmm it was just gorgeous it just went out over the room it was beautiful and uh, at the next break when we came back in they did it again, and a couple people out there joined in. The room got quiet, and I got this vision in my head. Oh, my God. They're going to go back down into the L.A. basin and say, look what Don taught us at the retreat. <laughs> <laughs> Being on time is absolutely critical to the spiritual life. And I'm not talking about the clock. The clock comes from that. It doesn't come from the clock. There's only one time, and there's only one place, and that's here and now. The only time I can experience the presence of God is now. So I must be on time in order for that to occur. We've had a lot of fun with that, and I'm going to turn this over to Tom real quick and follow his lead. But being on time sometimes does translate down to the clock, <clears throat> because... Rudeness was my worst character defect. Imposing myself into your life without asking if you had time for me or even wanted me there. Or making appointments and meeting either too early or too late. It's all rude. So I, I watch for that. <clears throat> so being on time is very important in human relations. If we say we're going to do something together and pick a time and a place to do it, we should both be there at that time and place. And on time for me, on the clock, there's a 10-minute leeway on either side of it. We live in a world that you can't get too precise. It's a principle, not a rule. Where I worked <clears throat> was three blocks away from a place in Denver that was built to serve people with garlic deficiencies. It was a little place called Dario's, a little Italian restaurant. <laughs> And I have a serious garlic deficiency. So, it's so you good. it last night. I oh, I went for it. <laughs> <laughs> we dipped the garlic in garlic dip, boy. <laughs> it's so good that at lunchtime, there's no place to park within three blocks, literally. And that's not just because of Dario's, but that's part of it. As a result of mistreating this poor old body, I now have neuropathy in my feet. So there's days I can walk and there's days I can't. And uh, one of the guys I sponsored <clears throat> came by to take me to lunch because I allow that. <laughs> Never expect it, but I sure do like it. Pay attention. <laughs> anyway, it was one of those days I couldn't walk too, too well. So we went over to my van. He said, this is silly. You know you're not going to get a place to park. He said, just get in the car. 
that sponsor talk. Just get in the car. <laughs> <laughs> we drive up to Dario's, and as we pulled up, a car pulled out, and I parked right in front of the place. Now, I expect that. He was stunned. He said, my God, God got us a place to park, and I wanted to slap him. God doesn't care where I park. We were on time. <clears throat> That's all. And I promise you there's a rhythm that you get into that beyond your intellect that helps you to be literally on time, uh, both on the clock and within your personal life. And it's, it's worth getting a hold of. So we were in New York in December. And one of the guys I sponsor in Hilton Head has a guy in New York. And when I asked how we're going to get from LaGuardia to here, he said, he'll take you. That's sponsor talking. He'll take you. John Calasanto, lovely young Italian boy, understands garlic deficiencies. <laughs> so he picks us up at LaGuardia, and the couple with us were staying down in the East Village, and we were staying over in Brooklyn Heights. So we're going to deliver them first, and we discover on the way that John's never been to the East Village. He's driving the car. <laughs> and I can promise you, in the East Village, there's no place to park. You might as well just go on uptown. We pulled down to the corner where these people live, and a car pulled out, and he parked. And so I told him about being on time. All weekend, it was wonderful watching him be on time. Then on Monday morning at 5.30, we're supposed to go to the airport and get an airplane. And John isn't there. And we're staying at his mother's house, so she called. He somehow is still asleep. We just barely made our airplane. And he told me on the way over, he said, I got so intrigued with this business of being on time, I started managing it. <laughs> Tom? <laughs> Thank you for that wonderful introduction. <laughs> uh, that uh, I tell you, a, a buddy of mine uses the term "the power of now," <coughs> and uh, boy, is that ever a, is that ever a powerful concept? Because history has no power, has value, but doesn't have power, and the future doesn't either. If I'm living in one or the other, I'm almost powerless. And so a real, real important concept of being where I am and uh, recognizing that this is it. This, is, this ain't preparation. This is it. Um, I'd like to just sort of continue along with I would, Ross, uh, let me ask you. The mic won't pick up stuff from the group, will it? Okay. Um, now, I personally really like interactive stuff. You know, I, I think there's an absolute relationship between participation and value. And uh, I might make this deal with you if, uh, if, uh, if to, to just selfishly get a little of that. Uh, let me just, just make it available. If you want to ask a question or make a comment uh, and can do it in a sound bite style, you, you know what I mean. <laughs> Not a long, long question. <laughs> Sometimes I'll get to listen to those C-SPAN programs, and I swear to God, the question's longer than the presentation. You know, <laughs> so, but if you can just sort of distill it, and, and then what we can do is repeat it, because it is maddening on a tape to listen to an answer that's not connected to a question. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a brilliant answer, but what's it about, you know? And, and so if you would, and if you just want to make comments, same thing, just just kind of, just not because it wouldn't want to hear you, but because it couldn't remember it, and just about make it sound bite style. But I, that, I would really appreciate that. Because what, what I'd, I'd like to kind of lead us into is continuation of this effectiveness deal. Now, I suspect that, the, uh, that this group, is essentially, I know we've got some pretty new cases here, but, but that's the minority. I suspect this group are people who are involved fairly heavily in the business of working with others. And uh, there are some real tricky grounds in that business of working with others. 
that sometimes the, you know, the harder we work, the less we get. And that old cryptic kind of comment that less is more really applies sometimes in this business of, of effectiveness. And so I, I'd like to just kind of talk, talk a little bit more about that. And for that reason, I'd really like to get some interactive stuff in there if we can. Now, I have to warn you, I'm not somebody who, who milks a crowd, you know. So uh, I, I make that offer, but it's up to you to get in. Because when I get going, it's kind of like jumping on a running train. I mean, old man. <laughs> uh, so just just give me a signal or just speak up if you want to do something like that. Um, this, j- jumping ahead just a little bit to 19, the uh, that first paragraph. The other one's talking about that, those personal qualities that sort of earn the confidence and open up the dialogue with, with an alcoholic. And we spent some good time last night uh, out, out on the porch chasing mosquitoes and, uh, and talking about effectiveness and, and the frustration that comes from working hard and, and getting in our own way. And uh, so that one paragraph, I'll just kind of go through that paragraph with you. None of us makes a sole vocation of this work, nor do we think its effectiveness would be increased if we did. I was, I was sitting in a meeting last night or last week in my uh, in my home group, and we have a little spinoff group that's a big book, you know, just a big book discussion type thing. And there was a, a, a gal there, a fine person, who uh, who was who was talking about. This, this paragraph, in, or this statement in, in, in the context of working professionally in the field. And, and uh, that's, that's a subtle trap involved in that because there is a tremendously important difference between work that I do professionally and work that I do as an avocation in this given for free and for fun. And, 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 and so this thing here... Uh, this I guess it was kind of an interesting case. You know, that I won't, I won't beat you to death with the case, but this 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 gal is fairly new to our group, and she's got some disease. I, I don't know what it is. None of my business, but it has put her in a wheelchair, and she's pretty profoundly disabled. And so when she was talking about what she did as a vocation in response to this paragraph. She talked about what she had done as a professional evaluator and teacher of drunk driving. I mean, I don't know. If, I don't think they're teaching drunk driving. <laughs> Whatever they teach, I never have been through that. But thank God. Uh, but she was talking about that in in the context of of uh, of, of, of this business about how how doing this as a vocation can interfere with our effectiveness. Well, let me talk about two levels of that just a minute. One is the obvious. You know, if I can't learn to distinguish what I do professionally from what I do personally, uh, i got no business in that profession yeah, because I'll get nothing but trouble and cause nothing but grief. And I know a lot of people, I sponsor a lot of folk who, who have worked in treatment and the biggest problem that happens is when folks forget where they are and forget how to, how to distinguish clearly and importantly between the two. Um, so, so, so a tremendously important thing. Recovered alcoholics have a great contribution to make in that field. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. But if we can't understand the professionalism of that, it's, it's a real booger bear. And uh, so when I'm working with somebody who works professionally in the field, part of the way that I monitor them is to listen to them in meetings. I don't need to ask them 20 questions. I listen to them in meetings. And when I hear somebody in a discussion that gets into therapeutic counseling, I know we need to go to the woodshed <laughs> because, because it's gotten out of whack. Or if I hear, uh, hear somebody making a talk and it's a lecture, and it happens so easily 
with somebody who's accustomed to doing lectures. And they start doing a talk, and that lecture format comes in. And when that happens, it kills the value of the avocation, the value of the gift of this earning the trust and confidence. Yeah. So it's a, it's a tremendously important thing in terms of, of maintaining the viability and the effectiveness. If I can't distinguish that, uh, then I've got a lot of trouble. So it's a challenge, a real challenge. You, I'm sure you run into, Shelly does, well, I don't mean to put your business in the street, but she does professional research and excellent research. But those kind of things can really steal your mind, you know, and you get to thinking analytically about what's happening here instead of the experience, of feeling the experience. And so it, it, it's a tricky area. The uh, other part of that, and part of what we were talking about last night, it, it is about the, the good balance that makes the recovery that I practice attractive to somebody else and that makes it effective to other, with other people. Uh, I'll give you a couple examples. I, when, when, I first, uh, when, I, when I first got on the street and started, uh, I, I had the, the privilege, it really was a privilege, it didn't seem like it at the time, but I had the privilege of, of helping start Alcoholics Anonymous restart Alcoholics Anonymous in a fairly large city in our state because it just, it just died, you know. And, and so it was a very, very busy time. And uh, I sponsored about everybody in town, just, just about everybody that was sober. It wasn't many. It was a gang, uh, more than I could keep up with. And back then, that sponsor talk that Don was talking about was my language. Um, during that period... My, my basic message to folk was get in the car. And if this car is full, get in the next car. You know? and so and what we would do would be to chase around the meetings within reasonable access, the meeting within 50 miles we could usually make, and uh, run convoys. And, and that was really the deal. And I'm sponsoring so many people, I can't even get to know all of them, much less work with them intensively. Well, and that was fine. And I'll guarantee you, if if a campaign had been put out to identify the best speak, uh, best sponsor in the known world, uh, among those guys, it would have been me. I guarantee you, Tom Iverson was the finest thing that has ever come along, the finest speaker the world's ever. Known. Of course, the only one, only one it ever had. But <laughs> it, it would have been a handy, heads down victory, but. Well, a, a troubling thing happened. Two years after I went into that city, and, and uh, we got a good, strong group going, uh, I, ha I had to move away. And all but one got drunk. All but one. Now, that mean I was a lousy sponsor? Well, not necessarily. You know, I was doing the best I knew. I just didn't know enough. And, and see, what I was so busy doing was I was so busy doing the stuff of get in the car <laughs> or you sweep the floor and that I never did let them see what the solution was. You know, I never did get into the solution with it. All they knew is that I was wonderful and if they followed me, they were okay. Well, they were right as long as I was available to do that. But the minute I stepped back, see what I'm talking about? The effectiveness doesn't come from that kind of charismatic cheerleader stuff. It's about real solutions, real connection to their life, and not just being a camp follower to me. And, and so even though it was well intended, you know, effectiveness required more. Uh, and you know, what it was saying on there earlier about being equipped not only with experience, but with having real <coughs> insight about myself, real knowledge about this program, who has really found a solution and is able to communicate that to somebody else. Yeah, I, I didn't quite make it that far, and so it can it can really interfere, you know, with, with getting that. I, uh, you know, I'm an extremely active member of AA, and um, I've had an interesting history to, in, a, in a way. You're talking about a young people's group, but you got. I started the first young people's group in North Carolina. There were, there were three of us, and, and uh, the group still meets to this day. Uh, 38 years ago we started that, that group. 
And so at that time, I was the youngest member of AA in North Carolina. And uh, I thought in the whole world, because God knows I like never saw anybody that. <laughs> and strange thing happens if you keep on breathing. I'm now the oldest recovered man in North Carolina. <laughs> I'm the relic of the past. You know? <laughs> the only thing is that I'm still one of the most active people I've ever met. And uh, that has a real, it's part of what we were talking about last night. That's a double-edged sword. <laughs> that thing uh, cuts both ways. Because it's when you get a guy that's the oldest guy in the state that's as active as I am, this can have a repelling effect on people. It's not necessarily going to be a galvanizing magnet to people. It can be a repelling effect. And, and this business of, of being able to demonstrate a life that, is, that speaks of the solution is tremendously important. And uh, you know, so I have to recognize that, that most people are probably not going to be able to, 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 to take off like I do. You know, it's important for me to recognize that we are truly different people. And we're driven by different forces. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm somebody in my simplistic way of looking at stuff. I like to keep it simple so I can understand it. Uh, I, I like to think that my recovery has to match my drinking pattern. If my recovery doesn't match up with how I drank, I'm probably going to find it a little lacking. Because that's my chemistry. That's the way I function. That's the way I am. I'm basically a kind of guy that has a lot of of compulsive drive, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not somebody who can sit and vegetate. You know, I'm somebody who's like Don said, the mind doesn't shut down for a long time. And 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 I also have to keep in mind that a considerable amount of what I do in AA is a part of my amends structure. It, it's just, it's not just zeal to be a missionary. It's, it's about a very real and effective way of making amends. And, and so you know, I, I have to keep that in mind when I'm working with people and, and, and not try to get people to emulate who I am. Tremendously important because I've had so many people, it, 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 what we were beating around last night, who, that I sponsored who, who said that they had difficulty working with me because it was intimidating. It is not invigorating or inspiring, but intimidating to work with somebody that's got that kind of energy and, 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 and zeal to do stuff. Uh, so when I'm looking at effectiveness, it's important for me to recognize what is effective, what's the right agenda, uh, how do I help people achieve their potential and not conform to my model. And that's an important thing. Like I was, I was at a at a prison one night at, at uh, Central Prison in Raleigh, the maximum custody joint, and uh, a guy came over to the after me. Now, to picture this, I'm in a maximum custody joint. A guy comes over to the meeting. He was talking a little bit, and he said, "Let me ask you a personal question, if you don't mind." I said, yeah, anything, go on. He said, "Do you have to do this thing like you do it to stay sober?" I said, well, not necessarily. I said, what are you talking about? He said, I swear to God, you're so busy, you make me tired. You know? <laughs> and I said, I said, well, no, you really don't have to do it like I do. But I said, one thing you ought to take a look about like that. You sitting in a maximum custody prison saying you don't want the kind of life I got and I'm walking the street. I ain't swapping with you either, buddy. <laughs> but... But it's a sneaky thing, you know, in this thing of what it is that I convey to people. And if I want to be effective, you know, it's important for me to, t to take a look at what kind of an example I be. What kind of expectations do I put on folks? And, uh, and, and does my life really reflect a kind of life that looks like sobriety is a good thing to do? And so it's not just a given that just because I've been there that I'm going to be a real effective guy. You want to comment about that any time? Sure. Huh? Why not? <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> Go for it. No, I was I was musing <coughs> and listening. 
We only have one thing that we're supposed to do. That's carry our message to the person who doesn't doesn't know. And then whenever possible, lead them on the journey of self-discovery. Uh, they'll suggest to us that any time we're approaching a new person, we should get into their shoes and see how they would like to be approached rather than me coming out of my my box and laying it on. <coughs> 1988, I've, I've had the privilege of serving this fellowship from the beginning. And in, in the mid-80s, I was your trustee at large U.S., which I thought was funny. I am not trustee material, <laughs> but I was a good one. But as a result of that, we had occasion in November of 1988 to be invited by the Russians to the Soviet Union to tell them about Alcoholics Anonymous. This is a different culture, a different language, a different approach to things. There were rules in the books at the time that no more than five people could gather without a permit. There were heavy-duty restrictions. Uh, <coughs> we had to consider all of that. How are we going to approach these people? Now, we had taken a group of them around the United States on a 10-day trip. There's a whole afternoon story in that deal. <laughs> And they told us, see, we, to be effective, I must be a listener. You need to tell me where you're at so I can help you move to the next place. If I try to get you move on where I think you're at, I'm going to move you into the wrong place. It won't be any good. We asked these Russians, should we come to your country? And they said, absolutely. And here's how you do it. They said, if you come as a government mission... You're going to get a show and tell. They'll give you a KGB agent that will take you around and nothing will be accomplished. He said, you know us now and you know some other people and here's another list of people. Write us all letters and say we're going to be in Moscow on such and such a date. We'd like to stop by and visit. And we will confirm that. Shelley's been there. That's how you do business there. <clears throat> so four of us and an interpreter were picked to spend 17 days just sharing the AA message with these folks who we really needed to be effective. Uh, there wasn't any pressure. It's just that if we didn't do the job, we're another five years before anything's going to happen. Don't put any pressure on me. Okay. Millions of lives are at stake, but don't worry about it. <laughs> but we got by there because I, I learned a long time ago there's not millions of lives at stake. There's one. Mine. And then when you show up, there's two. And that's that's what we're all about. So in the midst of all of that, we got a chance to try being effective. How can we approach this in a way that will... First of all, I kept saying, we don't have any way to relate to God. We don't believe in God. But as we listened, we found they were very, very spiritual people. In fact, we had to laugh. They said, we don't have any history of God. Would you like to go see the big cathedral? <laughs> <laughs> now, they were museums to them at that time. But they were just a very spiritual people. We went over our traditions with them. And one, the comment of one Russian was, you should have no trouble here. What you have here is communism in its purest form. See, they weren't communists. They were socialist republic on the way to communism. There should be no problem uh, with that in principle. So we dealt with it one day at a time, trying to find out how can we best serve them so they can get it going. There were two events, and then my comments were over. I've got a whole day of talk. This was a trip beyond belief for a country boy like me. We, uh, there was one tiny little group in Moscow called the Moscow Beginners Group that had been started by an Episcopal priest who was insane. Now that's just the way it was. 
But somewhere he had power to move things. He got us inside the Kremlin and uh, set things up. The guy was something else. And what he had done in setting it up was set it up according to AA's principles. Pure and simple. They operated by the traditions. There were step meetings. I remember the joy of sitting in a in a meeting with the Moscow Beginners Group and a fellow named Sasha was talking, former uh, radio announcer who had lost his job because at that time if you were caught as a, as a drunk, it was a crime. You lost your apartment, you lost your job, you went to treatment, you slipped, you went to Siberia. You were a social deviant. you got to know that. We're not that far away from that in this country. Uh, Sasha's talking, and it was really interesting because he speaks Russian and I speak English. So our interpreter, who is a simultaneous translator, Sasha would say something, and then the interpreter would let us know what he had said. And Sasha would start talking again, which gave me the opportunity, since I didn't understand the language, while he's talking, I can listen about what he just said and really think about that, then pay attention to what he said this time. I'd, it sounds complicated, but it wasn't. He said, I had no history of God. But I wanted what these people had, meaning that small group of Russians who were not drinking anymore. He wanted what they had. So I said, he said, I did what they did, and I found a spiritual power deep within myself. And I rose to that, because that's what happened to me, too. He found a power here. But the main thing was he wanted what these people had. Then we were interrogated by the Ministry of Health. We weren't talked with. We were interrogated. We sat in a little room, and the Ministry of Health was here, and the guy sitting over here in the corner like this. I don't know who he was, but I wouldn't mess with him. He was watching us, and he was watching the Ministry of Health. This wasn't a friendly environment. And this guy is interrogating us for a little over an hour. And please know that because all of us were more interested in being effective than being right, we set aside our personal agendas somehow and never defended AA. You never have to defend AA. You never have to defend who you are. I just have to share my experience. You can't fault that. You don't have to like it, but you can't fault it. At the end of a, a little over an hour of this interrogation, the Minister of Health said, what can we do to help you get this started here? Now, what are you going to answer? Okay, this is outside of my realm. I said, give them space. That's all we need is space. Tom and I know that the job he and I did in North Carolina in corrections was mainly about giving space. Open the doors here. Give them a little room or something. Let somebody in that knows what's going on. That's the big job. The, uh, the next day, they had, it was Thanksgiving Day, they allowed this little group to hold a special meeting in the Ministry of Health. The other thing I meant by giving them space, and this is what I must do with people I work with to be effective, I've got to give them space to have their own experience, not my experience. You can't have mine. I need to help you create the space around you where you can have your own. And that takes a little bit of time. And it's very hard on me. I have a human ego and I have a spiritual ego. And my spiritual ego is even harder to deal with than the human ego because it has the answer. <laughs> and every now and then it gets to think it has the answer. It's not a very long trip from one to the other. <laughs> Is it, Tom? <laughs> oh, my group. Yeah. Oh, geez, protect me from that. So effectiveness is about me showing up, being willing to give them space, showing them precisely what I did. If you want what I have, here's what I did. That doesn't mean you have to do that. You may discover along the way, as most people do, you really don't want what I have. I'm like Tom. I'm a busy rascal. Life is about living. And whether I'm busy with AA or 
Thursday night, I got really busy with one of my favorite activities. I took my grandchildren to see Blue's Clues stage show. Uh, I would much rather watch Shakespeare, but this was fun. <laughs> I missed Steve. Steve wasn't there. There's a new Steve. As you can tell, I'm also busy watching Blue's Clues on TV a lot. <laughs> I know exactly what Pooh's going to say. <laughs> and one of the ways I effectively commute, communicate with my four-year-old granddaughter is I can say, Oh, my. <laughs> and she, in her tiny little four-year-old voice, says, Oh, my. She loves it. That's effective. The interaction of people is effective. I can't do that if I'm judging you, if I'm deciding what you should have, if I'm deciding where you should be and what you should be doing. I just, I really, my hardest task is to keep that arena where we can play together and you don't have to worry about it. Okay? You can grow at your own pace. There are now over 185 registered groups in Russia. They took off from there. The most effective thing we did was the scariest thing we did. A fellow had written a book about Alcoholics Anonymous, a man named Shikara, Dr. Shikara. Good book. Sold out 50,000 copies overnight. They were hungry. Did, did you ever get to meet him? Interesting guy. <coughs> Following that kind of success with the book, the Russians hold public meetings. They did that where the author and the appropriate government officials and <laughs> everybody who's going to have anything to say about it gets to hear from the public what the second edition changes should be. That's what was going on then. And we were invited to this public forum. There were about 400 people, police officers, what we would call social workers, uh, regular people off the street, Anyone who's interested in this new activity that's beginning to emerge. Very positive book, by the way, about AA. On the panel was a Russian tank commander that I had known from when they were here who was absolutely opposed to AA. He said, it's just another imperialist ploy to get your way of thinking into our country. When we were in Leningrad, I understood what he was saying. We stayed in a hotel across from that great, huge, six-block-long uh, memorial to the siege of Leningrad. Millions of people died. And what they're saying is never again, ever, will any outside force come into our country and do this to us again. So I understood. That's the battle we're going to have to overcome to get AA there. It's, and, and so we're fighting it. And he's on this panel. And uh, he and I had fun, by the way. At the end of our trip, we got down to actually talking to each other. Turns out we could identify because we had similar jobs in the past. He used to smuggle guns into Leningrad on a tank. <laughs> and I used to smuggle stuff, too. <laughs> <laughs> While the goods were different, the job was the same. <laughs> And it gave us a contact. And before we're through in New York, we're showing each other family pictures, of course. He took a picture, he saw a picture of my wife, and he says, you should go home. <laughs> <laughs> it's very dangerous to leave such a beautiful woman along for so long a time. And he showed me a picture of his wife, and I was kind. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely lady, but, you know. In, in, in fur and everything, it looked like a bear. <laughs> I know she had to be a lovely lady. <laughs> anyway. He said to me that his concern was that he didn't want his grandchildren killing mine. I'm not killing his. We disagreed entirely on method. He really believed with adequate therapy, in a year or two, alcoholics were cured and could go on back into life. I just know better. 
That didn't matter. We were joined in brotherly and harmonious action. He was willing to let us try something because what they were doing wasn't working. And while he didn't agree with it, so there was that, that tone. That's being affected. When I can reconcile with you instead of trying to change you, I'm affected. See, if I sponsor you, I expect you to drink. That's what alcoholics do. The only time I've ever surprised by your behavior is when you become a decent person. (laughs) Quit drinking. We were at this public forum. And the the crew knows, and you know, I'm glib. I've, I've had to live on my mouth since I was little. So I think on my feet. And if I don't have an answer, I can say something cute that will keep you laughing long enough for me to figure out what I was supposed to say. So I'm the spokesman for the group. Now, I've got a hostile audience of 400 people. Uh, And the trick question came at me. I've learned to listen for them. The lady said, how do you think Alcoholics Anonymous will work in the Soviet Union? Now, there's a trick question. Any answer I give is the wrong one. <laughs> so I did what I've been taught to do here. I opened up, and waited for it, and heard myself say I would be presumptuous to even have a guess. I've only been here 13 days. And they applauded. We made contact. The truth was, I have no idea. But it has worked in 144 other cultures. And it has worked for me. So to be effective, it has to do with taking all those kinds of risks. The only risk is not taking one. You can't say anything wrong to a new person. They're not listening to you anyway. (laughs) (laughs) And if they catch, if they happen to be and they catch you on it later, you can remind them how sick they were. Real effectiveness, as I understand it, isn't me staying sober. That's God's business, and I participate in it. Nor is it me getting you sober, because I don't get you sober. Real effectiveness is when I watch you, after we work together, go find you one. That's when I've been effective. That's the piece Bill gave us. That there were thousands who might cheerfully want what I've been so freely given, and they, in turn, might help others. That's when I know I've been effective. It's when I meet second, third generation, no matter how goofy they are, it means that the job I did at least carried forward. I'll straighten up the mess later. (laughs) Real effectiveness means that my wife knows where I am. That's effective living. She's not afraid for me or for her. Uh, It means my grandchildren know where I am. My four-year-old granddaughter, I I know she doesn't know what a map is, but she thinks it's fascinating that I'm in Virginia. She doesn't even know what that means, but I'm there. (laughs) About communication. I've got to listen and I've got to talk. Okay, Because the real work will happen after I am dead and gone. If I'm truly effective after I'm dead, somebody like me who shows up will get the same shot I got. I won't have changed anything so that it becomes unrecognizable. I love you as you are where you are. That's effective. Chuck hated everybody, including me. But I didn't care. I loved him. He was much more entertaining than most of you. And there's nothing like six weeks of solid hate to make you think, this guy's really going to be good. Uh, one quick story on, on Chuck, because it affects effectiveness. Make it, make it long enough for me to go back to the old Go man. back to the old I, I can stress this one out. <laughs> He's going to tell the story slow. <laughs> <laughs> after we had finally, after a year, gotten through the step work and Chuck began to emerge as Chuck he got rid of some stuff circumstances were such that his 
real father had died and left him $5,000 right at the time when he needed to make some financial amends. Uh, we got that cleared out of the way, got him a little little truck, <clears throat> and he had some time on his hands. He'd had 180-some jobs. He was not unemployable. He just couldn't hold a job. Well, when you tell the boss, go screw yourself, they don't keep you. <laughs> and he did that a lot. Anyway, he came to me one day and he said, uh, there's one thing I didn't tell you. I've been afraid to tell you because every time I told anybody this, they made fun of me. He said, all I really wanted to be was an actor. It's going to be a good one. He kept me entertained for a year. I mean, this is a drama queen. And I got to thinking, I said, Chuck, listen, you don't have a job right now. Your men's are taken care of. You've got a decent car. The other thing you've always wanted to do is go to Disney." <clears throat> He'd never done any kid stuff. It's one of the reasons he was so pissed. He said, look, you got a couple grand. Why don't you go out to Disneyland? Take two weeks and drive out there. And I know some actors. And we'll hook you up with somebody, and they can tell you what the price you're going to have to pay is to become an actor. There's a price for everything. So I hooked him up with one of the guys we know on the Murphy Brown show while he was out there. He was taking him around Warner's just showing him a lot and uh, the producer of the show they ran into him on the lot and introductions went on and my friend said and Chuck wants to be an actor the producer says hell we can use him right now we need extras so two weeks after he hits Los Angeles he's on the Murphy Brown show <laughs> call him he says what's going on <clears throat> what's this all about he needed to expand into his own arena. And all my job is is to provide him with the necessary tools, whether it be a step work, a book, people, an environment, the tools so he can explore that environment. Now, he hated God. Got him into acting school. They think he's great. He really is good. His first stage play in Los Angeles Guess what part he got? He was an evangelistic preacher. <laughs> and they tell me he kicked ass and took names. <laughs> so how do you measure your effectiveness? Tom wanted some interaction. Let's talk about that. How do you know when you've been effective? What what's your your guide? Yeah. Somebody. Um, and maybe it's because I'm new to the program. Everyone else seems so articulate, and everybody I think can be down in black and white, what they think, or what they feel, is so difficult for me to, to verbalize. Did you all have trouble with that? Okay. Was there trouble verbalizing how you feel instead of being articulate about how you think? Yes, because at the beginning, all the feelings felt the same. Panic. <laughs> I don't know whether I feel good or bad. I do know I feel panic. And how do you discuss, I mean, I feel panic? Well, you come to me and you say, I feel panic. I'm terrified. And I can share with you, yeah, some mornings I feel the same way. Here's what I do about it. We, we discuss it. You can't describe your feelings, nor is it even important. What you do is describe, I'm feeling something. What a surprise. Okay? To be able to finally sort out. We, we reach a place where we can't tell the difference between the true and the false. Yeah, panic. I'm starting to feel something. And I don't know what to do with it. What do I do with my feelings? Feel them. <laughs> you don't have to do anything. Okay. Process them. Please don't process them. <laughs> just, just feel them. And if you got to cry, go cry. If you want to scream, go somewhere else. <laughs> go scream. Uh, does that help any, Tom? Would you add to that? 
the only thing that uh, I know I, I had the feeling when I came in that I that I was the dumbest guy in every room I sat in <laughs> because I'd hear people who sounded so brilliant and healed that that uh, I mean I felt light years away from where they were and uh, the guy who spoke at my fifth meeting of AA was the first person I had ever heard put words to how I felt and uh, I really really valued that because it sort of helped me start framing a language that I could talk about the thing with. Because before that, all I felt was awful yeah. and guilty and, and, and uh, deeply ashamed and all that. But I didn't know how to describe those things. So it, it was helpful to me that I started hearing people put some language to it that started to make sense. You know, I always sat in meetings. You're braver than me because I always sat in meetings burning with a desire to ask questions, but I felt like it sounded so stupid. <laughs> and then I finally learned that what I, what I wanted to ask, probably the person in the next chair wanted to ask the same thing. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, but I, I very much identify with, uh, with that, that whole business of, of total ignorance about the condition. Uh, some people have been some, through so much treatment that they sound like a medical dictionary when they come in and got a lot of language, but it may not have much to do with the condition. You know, it's just a whole bunch of language that clutters up life. You know, and getting to a point where I can realistically understand what it is I'm dealing with. It's where inventory starts really putting stuff together, uh, making it have some real purpose, some real value in my life. But I think it is important to me. I went to my first sponsor early on and said, Bruce, I feel so guilty. He said, you should. <laughs> Look at what you've done. Yeah. Now, here's what we can do to straighten that up. Mm -hmm. But it, you, know, you should. Yeah. I'm so ashamed. You should be. Do you just let the chucks of the world spew their hate for six weeks, ten years? Not ten years, but you know. Say it again. Do you just let the chucks of the world spew their hate for six or eight weeks or whatever it takes? Oh, okay. I do, yes. While they're with me in a, in a separate space, I immediately begin to tell them, you don't want to do this with all these nice people. Okay? If that's how you feel, be quiet. We'll talk about it later. Don't disrupt these nice people. Okay? And, and they, if they don't get to do that, pretty soon they get tired of it too. But yes, I do. Because I know about that kind of hate. And uh, if everybody keeps this out, it just intensifies it. Pretty soon we can start laughing at it. We say things like, did you, did you hear what you just said? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Al, do you? How do you help uh, a new person kind of on the other end uh, get past uh, over-intellectualizing How do you help a new person get over intellectualizing and analyzing everything? Lobotomy is not a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> Which means, Al, I've never figured that one out. <laughs> Duct tape helps. <laughs> I tell you, no, focus. It, it's an awfully good defense. Yeah. You know, the people can talk you to death, and uh, it's a very good defense to keep from listening to anything. Uh, like, I, I have a fairly standard rule of thumb. Now, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, there are not any standards for the thing, but a fairly standard rule of thumb. When I'm sponsoring somebody, I, d I don't like to get let anybody get up in front of a group and talk till they got about nine months, you know, making a talk. If they, if they are people who can communicate readily, it's a year. <laughs> and, and, and the reasoning is obvious. It's just that. You know, people who are, who are, who are handy with communication uh, are not, uh, often are not handy with listening. And, and it's a great way to keep from getting involved with just a, a verbal barrage uh, same with comedy. You know, that, that comedy very often has very little to do with humor. So, they, anyway, that I know that's the way, it, in a general kind of way, I, I deal with folk like that. It is tough 
with, with people who are, are highly knowledgeable about conditions but don't have them connected to the light. And uh, i tell you, my, my least favorite person to work with is the guy who is religiously intact. But his life is screwed up like Hogan's goat. <laughs> and uh, trying to get through that cloud of righteousness <coughs> to a real life connection with the Spirit is a big, big battle. And uh, any day I'll take somebody that, that, that is absolutely on fire with hate for, for the, the whole business over somebody who sees themselves religiously intact. And, and it's just, I know that sounds like kind of scary ground to get into, but, but folk who have caught in, into this kind of delusional notion that they're okay there, but their life's falling apart. The real deal is how do you get a real power connected to a real life killer illness? And uh, so it's a challenge, a huge, huge challenge. Technique-wise, you know, because of the way I do it, meaning you come to my house, we sit down, I read the book out loud, and we, we go from there. It helps with the focus. Because I'll let you intellectualize for a couple meetings, and I have to remind you, you came here to learn something, and so did I. How are you going to learn anything if you talk 50 minutes out of the hour? And so we have a way to get back into it. And even if the information doesn't click, the new way of doing things does, and eventually the information clicks. But it, it becomes a tool. Uh, I'm like Tom. It was a year before I was allowed to talk, except in the 12 step study school. Couldn't chair a meeting, couldn't get up there to podium. Uh, does that help? No, no real answer, but there's some yeah. things. Yeah. yeah. It's really a tough issue. It, it, it really is. That, there, we sometimes we, we really get injurious and in talk you know like saying things like nobody's too dumb to get sober but some are too smart. That's kind of an injurious kind of way to, to, to treat folk who happen to be handicapped with a lot of education. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's kind of insulting that way. Your folks can't help that. That's what they got. Them. You know, and so in in dealing with it, very important to not write them off as being you know so it's kind of a, a wandering idiot just because they happen to be smart, and, and and I think that thing of letting the book handle it, you know, letting the process handle it, is a is is, is really the bottom line deal, on on deal with the concept that's laid out here, and not what you brought to the table, yeah. You know. And, and it'll do it. You know, the program will take us through it. I don't care what the barriers are if we'll open up and let it happen. You know? uh, but that is, you hit, a, you hit a real sensitive area, deep, deep, as you usually do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my, my sponsor hit, hit me with that at the very beginning. He says, we've been talking, because there were three of them. We don't even think the truth's going to work for you. Because you take the truth in and your ego catches it. And by the time you use it, it's all warped. So he said, what we suggest for you is that we suggest you forget everything you think you know about anything, particularly spiritual matters. If any of it worked, you wouldn't be here. And I fought a little bit. I said, come on, I must have learned some truth somewhere along the way. He says, it's doubtful, but it is possible. <laughs> he says, I'll grant that it's possible. But anything that really is truth will be truth when we're all through, too. And the rest of it's all garbage. Just lay it down. And that really helped. The focus right back on up. If I'm willing to argue with you about it, it's my opinion. The truth never has to be defended. It just is. I still like to argue. There's nothing like a good game of Zorro <laughs> with an intellectual idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I heard what you said, too, and I really like this meeting. People at the level of their understanding. Yeah. Two years ago, an old timer in Denver, 33 years sober at that time, came to me to go through the steps because he'd never done it. 
and nobody else would talk to him. 33 years of not doing anything about untreated alcoholism makes you a pain in the ass. <laughs> we went through weeks where most of the sessions we were in was me helping to unlearn him so we could get down to this. Got to the third step, had a wonderful third step experience together just prior to Christmas two years ago. Sent him home to make a list. And I haven't seen him since. <laughs> Called me once and said, I got busy and haven't got the list done. And I said, one name counts as a list, you know. And I haven't seen him since. Sometimes you just give it your shot. I'm still here. <laughs> Let me tell you a, a quick one I just had. That uh, I, I'll tell you about the good ones. I won't, I won't tell you about all the bad ones. But <laughs> I, was, I was in California a week or so ago, and, and uh, there was a fellow that came up to me that he, he introduced himself like he was showing his merit badges by how many chips he picked up. You know, with, that, that he was, he, he said, I'm a professional newcomer. And uh, so I just decided to just sort of take him on just a little bit. And, I, I, I said, and he, was, he was trying to get me to respond to that and add to his merit badges or something. And I said, well, let me, let me just suggest one thing to you. Why don't you quit being a professional newcomer and become a real newcomer? And, uh, and it took a while. But this guy had a cliche for everything. You know, he'd been he'd been around the program so much that his mind was just filled with meaningless platitudes and cliches for every situation. And so what I did with him was was head off every one. You know, every time he come, I said, "No, no, don't don't put that on." Yeah. And it took I, it took a long time to get through that riddle of stuff that was in his mind and get down to a real contact with who he was and what he was about. Uh, because his mind was filled with all that stuff. And uh, now I know he didn't like the conversation, but he engaged in the conversation. If he had not, have quit. But he engaged in the conversation. And he came to a point where I knew that he had heard it and connected with it. The next morning, the guy came to me, not that day, but the next morning the guy came to me and said, man, you'll never know how much I appreciate that. Yeah. Because it, it's, that's what it took was to get past that litany of stuff to where he was a real human being connecting with a real program of recovery. And, and see, so he was so caught up in that kind of mess of stuff that he couldn't even hear what was going on around him. Now, he, he may be like that guy. Who knows what will happen? But he left that day, and he went out and did some stuff, and he came back to, the next morning and really pleased with what he was doing. And I, I think that's part of our effectiveness is, 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 is how do you cut through that stuff and get down to real issues. And it does. It takes some, some, some hard-nosed confrontation sometimes. But whatever it takes, you know, it's a real deal. Let me mention just a couple of real anecdotes he reminded me of that uh, maybe set the stage for what we'll come back to. That, and plus, I, I just wanted to share this thing about Effectiveness really does have to do with, with where you are and how you engage it. I, I had some, I never did go to Russia, but I had some Russians over here one time and I, I was visiting someplace and they had a contingent of Russian folks that were going around the country trying to learn stuff, I guess. And they said, Would you go over and, and meet them? And I said, Yeah, sure, I'd love to meet them. And so I went over there and they introduced me uh, to the Russians and gave me a lot of names I couldn't pronounce. And, uh, <laughs> Then they said, would you just speak to them a little bit? And I said, well, sure. So I proceeded to lay a real heavy sermon on them for about five minutes. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and so, you know, in a conversation, you kind of pause and look for a response. And so I got to the appropriate point, and I paused, and there was two, two women in the front row. One of them pointed at the other one and said, psychologist. <laughs> well, okay. They didn't speak English. You know? <laughs> They had stood and nodded and grinning the whole time. I just assumed that everybody in the world spoke English. But they didn't know that, you know. So, so that was probably not effective. They knew I was a very charming, friendly fella. But <laughs> not a clue about that. 
And, and the other thing I say about this, this business about about the accepting people where they are, you know, and, and having meaningful kind of relationship, like your, your Russian buddy you were talking about with the exchange about family. I was a guy, he's a, he's a researcher fellow, not, he's not an alcoholic, but he's a world-class, eminent researcher. And some people kind of engineered us to get together because they knew we were polar opposites on some beliefs about stuff. And, and we had a wonderful time in, in a good debate, I mean, a really good debate. And this guy really and truly, his name's Wexler, and he's an eminent researcher. And he, he'd done some studies about alcoholism, and, and he was just profoundly uh, unimpressed with AA. And so he, he, he said, I will never understand. I go into those meetings, and I listen to them, and none of it makes sense. It's disorder and chaos and, and, and junk. And, and so we were participating in a program, and he was lecturing about substance abuse. Jesus, I, I mean, just the thought of that term just makes me want to gag. I, I, and, and so I listened to him patiently, and, and uh, about midweek, we were going to be there a week. About midweek, I said, man, I had enough of this stuff. And they had, po- they had planned a big dinner. <laughs> and I found a few other drunks, and I said, let's go to a meeting. Man, i got to get out of here. And so we went. Next morning... I ran into the fella, and he said, where were you last night? I was counting on continuing our discussion over dinner. And I said, well, let me tell you where I was. I said, I got a few other drunks, and we loaded up in the car. We rode over to this next city. We went to the worst part of town, drove up to an old frame house that had probably been condemned in urban renewal, had a sofa sitting on the front porch, springs hanging out of it, walked in, Got a cup of coffee, and the stuff was old. It was green. And uh, walked into a room, and a bunch of people in there fat-mouthing and talking and cussing. And we sat down around a table, and the room was blue with smoke. And I sat in the middle of that, and I said, Man, I am in the solution. (laughs) He he said, I'll never understand you people. (laughs) I said, that's fine. But we respected each other. It was a, a healthy respect. I respect what he was doing. He didn't have to agree with me. But we were both people who were committed to our endeavors, and we had respect for each other. And, and I think some of that is, is, is about this whole business of how am I going to be infected. And if I've got to write everybody off who doesn't agree with me, I'm not going to be very effective. <laughs> um, very briefly, because I've got one incident, Al, that's a direct answer to your question. Briefly, don't discount the intuitive. Start to rely on it. You've cleared away the stuff, you can do that. A year and a half ago, I quit my job, got me a new guy the next morning, three weeks sober, treatment center counselor. Knew way too much, just kept drinking. And he was telling me all the stuff he knew in those first early sessions. And I said to him, you're right. You probably know more about alcoholism than I even want to know. But everything you know still allowed you to drink three weeks ago. And he got it. That was I didn't want to say your stuff is crap because it isn't. But everything he knew still let him drink. And that worked. And that was intuitive. I'm not smart enough to think of that. And I don't use that as a rule now to tell everybody that that one did work. Yeah. When we come back, I think what we're going to do is nudge a little bit. I, I, I am, and I know Donald would like to go there, is a nudge a little bit into the sponsorship function itself, you know, and, and, and talk about that a little bit in, re, in relation to effectiveness. And, uh, and this business about, uh, about how the example needs to incorporate how we live. And that's the next section in this thing that we'll get into. So uh, have a good lunch. Sure, what y'all. time do we come back? My name is Don, and I'm an alcoholic. Um, and uh, this here fellow, Tom Ivester, an alcoholic. <laughs> We're both members of Alcoholics Anonymous. In good standing today, we haven't had a drink. Uh, 
fix that. <laughs> <laughs> of alcohol. <laughs> We've never done this before. Tom and I have never done this before. So we're in for an interesting day. Uh, we hope that you will also find something useful here, but we really don't much give a damn. We're in for an interesting day. <laughs> uh, Tom hit on it a little bit last night. I want to just lay a little bit of groundwork. Because there is a tendency in any organization, and that includes this one, that once you find a method or a way, you lock in, and everybody else is wrong. And, and we don't mean to do that, but that's just the way the human condition presents things. At our noblest, they're not wrong, but I'll give them the right to be wrong. They're not quite right yet either. <laughs> I'm probably closer to this man than I am my own brother. In so many ways, it's hard to describe. We're just, we're kin. Uh, we have worked together both in AA and professionally. Our approaches are different, but they're the same. Uh, the easiest way I, I've been able to put it is that I came to the fellowship through the big book. Tom came to the big book through the fellowship but it's the same thing the same place and uh, one of the concerns I personally have with me doing this over and over is that it's wonderful while I'm here and you hear what I say but you never hear what I say <laughs> and I come back and you tell me what I said I didn't say that at all <laughs> so and it's the same thing with, with individual sponsorship. We're all clear when we're in the room. But when one of us goes home, there's a shift on it. And that's just natural and normal and correct. One of the things that I would like to do this time, how many of you have been here in a room like this with me sitting in a chair right in my mouth before? <laughs> Haven't you heard me yet? <laughs> it's like a favorite song, Yeah, I know. Yeah. See, I almost stopped doing these. I've been doing this for 30 years because this is what God called me to do. I, I have an ability to open my mouth and stuff comes out and people say, oh, that was wonderful. And I wonder, what the hell did I say? And if they don't say it's wonderful, at least they stay. <laughs> the only time I know it's effect, that I'm being effective, there's two ways I can measure my effectiveness. Somebody gets up and leaves. Or somebody goes to sleep. And if I can accomplish that, we'll have a good day. But let's say it, uh, I don't know any more than you already know. Please know that. Probably less than some of you know. I have to keep going over it and over and over it. And this is rigorous. Uh, I got up at 3.30 yesterday morning and got on an airplane and went through the stuff you go through now with security. Uh, my, I caught the fact that my ticket said I was going to Washington, D.C., which is where my luggage went. And that's as far as it got. I managed to get here. Uh, there are some rigors involved. And then there's the rigorousness of sitting here. I know what I have to do. Tom knows what he has to do. You know what you have to do. So all of this compounds, and then I get tired of hearing the same thing. I only have one story. I have different approaches and different pieces of it. He and I have been around so long, there's a six-hour talk in each one of us, and that's just the beginning. So I've been living in, with a sense of where I am God is for 34 years. And that means every day of my life, something incredible has occurred. And I'm going to tell you about all of it. We just don't have that much time. Anyway, I was doing one of these things in New York probably seven years ago or so. And, and I'm a believer of being right out front. 
There's no levels here. We're peers. So I will tell the new person exactly the same thing I'll tell him. And if he isn't around, you're going to get it. So, uh, And I was talking to my little, one of my spiritual daughters, Ruth. I told her I th- I, I'm getting ready to quit doing this. Uh, I was also just finishing up interferon treatment for hepatitis. That makes you tired. Uh, I just want it out. I'm a private person. My greatest joy is to just be by myself in my little room looking at all the stuff I've got hanging on the wall and listening to Mozart. Uh, I like it. Anyway, I told Ruth, I really am thinking of not doing this anymore. She said, oh, don't stop. When you come, we all get together, and it's like having a grandpa or an uncle show up and tell us stories. And that's why I'm here this weekend. As long as that's all I have to do, we're going to be okay. In fact, I catch hell, and I know you do, for not telling some of the stories. Why don't you talk about that one? <laughs> True. I come from a family, an intact, functional family. I'm sorry, but I do. I'm the only alcoholic in it. Uh, we now have five generations in my family living on this planet. And there's no sign that my mother's giving up. She's finally gotten a cane. But my sister says that isn't so much for walking, it's that she's getting cranky. <laughs> so be careful when she's got her cane in her hand. <laughs> she has attitude. She has to wear hearing aids, and if she's sick of listening to you, she just turns them off. <laughs> That's functional. <laughs> but I never fit in that family. There's always that sense of alienation. I look like them, but that's because the space people who dropped me off were good modelers. Okay. I didn't feel like them. Didn't act like him. Good morning, Shelly. You all know Shelly? <laughs> now you do. She's from the old Denver Young People's Group. We were front pew sitters. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Tom talked about process last night. Part of the process is becoming a member of the family. Now, I see AA as a big family. But as in any family, there's kissing cousins and there's immediate family. And it's the same here in this spiritual family of ours. Uh, Immediate family are those folks that you kind of do the same things with. My brother's a professor of music at the University of Colorado and one of the foremost synthesizer musicians in the world just got back from Russia they take him over there every year to teach in the summer Uh, and I love him dearly and I'm proud of him and we're close but we don't do much together Uh, he has in, in our talk when we put our lives back together when I was making amends he pointed out that he and I do the same thing <clears throat> Our goals are the same. We are trying to touch people at a depth that is so deep that when we leave, they have been changed. That's what we're supposed to do here, you know. This isn't about just chatting with each other. This is about profound changes in people's lives that are so profound they don't even know they've been struck for three or four weeks. He says he makes his music the way he makes his music and I make mine the way I make mine but we're both just singing our song Uh, we're co-owners of a cabin in the high country I never go that isn't how I do high country that's how he does high country but one of the ways I had to make amends is that he wanted that cabin so bad he could taste it and I'm one of the three of the siblings we all chipped in and got the cabin 
Okay, I can use it any time I want. I've got people I fish with, and I've got people I bowl with. And I need to pay close attention that I don't take my bowling partner fishing. It just doesn't work. <laughs> we had, uh, Jackie and I love Epcot. We go every couple of years. We're part of a group of people circulating a petition to ban children. <laughs> <laughs> they got their own place next door. <laughs> So a couple years ago, we had occasion to make a big mistake and didn't know it at the time. Her sister and her husband and Jackie and I and some dear, dear friends from Lafayette, Louisiana and some very close friends from Houston, Texas. The four of us went as couples down there. You know, you can get a villa for a thousand a week and when you split that up among four people, it's nothing. And we almost destroyed the friendships. Our rhythms are different. We like one another. But when I'm at Epcot, I don't want to be fooling around. <laughs> I'm on a mission. <laughs> and those damn Cajuns were just way too laid back for me. And I was just way too... Anyway, you hear what I'm trying to say? So our recovery process has some, some basis and truth in that. There are different ways of doing the same thing. Uh, and I must be, I'm, I'm a big book person because that, I came to AA, they put me immediately into the big book. We did the steps and then they immediately took me out of the big book and put me to work. In five weeks we had completed the step work out of the big book. I personally had a series of spiritual awakenings. Not everybody in my same group did. I caught the fever. In the sixth week, they gave me the next group of people, and it was my job to sit there and do the same thing that had been done with me. And that's still how I do things. But let me read a piece from this, because it's kind of where I'd like to go with some of this this weekend. Uh... I use this book because it's a guide. These are people who did certain things, made some bad mistakes and killed some folks, did some things right and other people lived, just like me. <laughs> <clears throat> but in it they describe not my personality, not my style, but what do I look like? I get a guide here for doing the work. And please understand, I don't think working steps is doing the work. That's preparation for doing the work. The work here is to help others. So on page 18, and I looked it up. I don't memorize this. He tried to ask me if I was sure that was the page, and I'm sure because I looked at it yesterday. Uh, there's a description of when I'm through here, or if you're approaching me as a new person, this is kind of how I should look. The ex-problem drinker, that's me, who has found this solution, I have, who is properly armed with facts about himself, I am. See, I can check this off before I go trying to kill you. <laughs> can generally win the entire confidence of another alcoholic in a few hours. Until such an understanding is reached, little or nothing can be accomplished. Tom hit on that last night. The process of finally identifying... I am an alcoholic. I am one of these. It can take a day or it can take months. And I have a young fellow that I'll tell you about that it took over a year before he felt this identification. So this is what I'm supposed to bring to the table. But the man who's making the approach has had the same difficulty, not been the same place. My first sponsor was doing a natural life sentence for a double murder he'd committed when he was 17 years old in a jewelry store robbery. That's high drama. I'm a sneak thief. I didn't do that. There's no way I could identify with that. Don't give me a gun. I know something about guns. If I have one and you have one, I might get shot. Okay. Me? No, I'll throw up on you. I won't <laughs> 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 I 
But he described the morning that that occurred. He told me what was going on in his head and in his, in his emotional state. He said he woke up with the feeling that nobody cared whether he lived or died. And the pain of that was so great that he started drinking to kill the pain. You can't live with that pain. Only this morning it didn't kill the pain, it intensified the pain. And there's only one honest emotional response to feeling alienated and set apart. That's outrage. My spirit knows that as good as you are and as bad as I am, I'm as good as you are as bad as I am. I belong here, and I know that. So I get outraged. I create the loneliness, by the way. It doesn't look that way for me in here, but that's where. And in that rage, he decided to hell with it. I'm going to go get mine. And he went down and robbed a jewelry store, and in a shootout with the police, killed some people on the street. 17 years old. So I could identify with, I've had the same difficulty. The drama doesn't define the alcoholism. Uh, I've met people in the penitentiary doing life sentences who are not alcoholic. They're just bad behaviors. Uh, <laughs> to do, I've, I've met people who did crimes and weren't even drinking. <laughs> In fact, I challenge you with this. I came in here thinking at one point I did what I did because I was drinking. No, most of the time I was drinking so I could go do what I did. <laughs> because in my sickness, I'm a moral coward, a lazy moral coward. I lived by principles all of my life, and my principles were screw you. That's a principle. Get yours first, otherwise you won't get it. Well, what I did to do that, of course, was get yours. I thought yours was mine. Anyway, that's good. The man who's making the approach has had the same difficulty. I listened closely to this man. Did you listen closely? He kept coming back because of the spirit that was there. But the movement to where he's sitting here this morning came as a result of finally understanding, oh, you had the same difficulty. I may be weird, but so are you. <laughs> Thank God. Same difficulty. Now, what are some of those difficulties? Drinking is not a difficulty for me. It's a way of life. Something I will do. It's natural. From the first drink, it's natural. What are the difficulties that we have to face? How about getting out of bed in the morning? Tough one. Tough one. Because the minute I come out of the dream state, which is where I'd rather spend my time because I went in there. <laughs> my mind go my mind never ever stops, ever. I got a, I've got a hunch with my mind that three weeks after I'm dead, it's still going to be working. <laughs> Trying to figure out, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> so I wake up in the morning, and as I'm waking up, I realize I'm in trouble I have to go to work oh. and I don't want to go to work because I don't like my job it's beneath me or I don't know how to do it or I won't look good any number of a hundred reasons shows up I don't want to go And if I do go, I'm going to be in trouble anyway. Because I'm going to be late. <laughs> that damn old car of mine. 
I'm going to have trouble with it, and then the <coughs> traffic's going to be, I'm going to be late. And my boss is going to give me hell early in the morning. I don't like him anyway. <laughs> And I know me pretty good. I'm going to say something dumb <laughs> and get fired. So why get out of bed? <laughs> it sounds funny, but you're laughing because you've all done something. <laughs> what are some of the other difficulties? I want to be a good father. I had one. Good one. Didn't always like him. In fact, a good part of my life I didn't like him. Uh, Which is kind of a shame because he was a good man. He went through changes. My dad and grandpa back in the late 20s and early 30s were the head of the Colorado Ku Klux Klan. So we had some kind of funky ideas in the house for a while. They both had spiritual awakenings and put the robes aside and spent the rest of their lives undoing some of that. I never took the robes off of them. That was part of the problem. That was the separation. I never took the robes off of them after they did. We do that to people. So I missed a good deal. But one of the things I remember about my dad, mostly, was that he was there. I didn't always like that, but he was there. I have a model of what I would like to be. I would like to be there for my kids and for my family. And what's my difficulty? I'm so obsessed with me, I can't be there. Even when I'm in a room with you, I'm somewhere else. And so you, as children do, you want my attention. You become an aggravation to me. I'm busy doing something else, sitting quietly in this chair, doing something else. That's a difficulty. How do I overcome that? Well, first I have to identify with it. And we could go on and on. The man has the same difficulty, big difficulty that's the same. When I start drinking, I can't seem to quit. I had to work around the idea that if when you want to stop entirely you can't, it never occurred to me to ever stop entirely. I didn't even know I was alcoholic when I got here. One of the reasons I think God put me where he did is because immediately upon entering AA, I was taken to the description of what alcoholism is because I was certified as a sociopath type 2, bad stuff. Don't know what for sure what it is, but you don't want it. <laughs> Federal man said I was a psychopath, and the doctor said I was a manic depressive drug addict. Because I had learned what keeps folks back. And that'll do it. You getting a little cramped because there's too many people around you? Throw a couple little mood swings. I'll back up. You got to get good at it. If you do it too much or too loudly, they'll put you in an institution. And if you don't do it quite enough, they just invite you to the parties because you're the entertainer. <laughs> Same difficulty. I'm self centered. I'm spending all my life in here. And this is what they're talking to me about so I can identify. And if I take a drink, I can't not take another drink. As, as we began to describe that, I found out why I went to the penitentiary when I was 19 years old. I took a drink in Long Beach, California on a 24 hour liberty. And what's described in this book as a phenomenon of craving, which is just a big word for I can't quit, the next drink becomes paramount to all other... Okay? 
And what a relief that was, because my sponsor helped me understand that it doesn't mean you don't love your children or your family or yourself or any of that. It's just they are now second. Your body is craving something and your mind is craving something. Uh, David Huff, God bless him, fought that. I went in to have a couple beers. I just changed my mind. And we just let him keep saying it until he finally heard what he said. I changed my mind. My mind got changed. And he got it. And I could begin to identify with that. I'd missed some appointments because of the alcohol. Over, the, over a 14-year period, I also used a lot of speed and acid, but I'm not a drug addict, so we won't go into that. I'll just look at my alcoholism. Long before any drugs entered my life, it was five years of just drinking. The main reason I started using amphetamines is because it made drinking easier and impossible again. See, drinking wore out for me. Uh, same difficulty. I want to be like him. The human condition is a wonderful thing. When you find a newfound friend or a peer, you want to be just like him. What are you laughing at, Marcy? (laughs) (laughs) The problem is, we all have clay feet. (laughs) I had good sponsors. He didn't want me to be like him. He wanted to be like me. He wanted me to be like me. Anyway, we made some identification with a number of people. There were three of them that I stayed close with, and I began to recognize something even then. There's some fakes in AA. Did you know that? Yeah. There's some people who sound really, really good. But if you watch how they live, you wonder, this doesn't quite match up. And I bitched about that once. I I come from a line of sponsorship that says, if you don't like it, bitch about it. To me. So I can set you straight. (laughs) He said, dummy. That was my name. Well, before I met you, I was 38.984. That's a pretty good leap up. Dummy. He says, it doesn't make the slightest bit of difference what anyone else is doing. What are you doing? That's clear. I'm bitching. Well, quit it. (laughs) If I bring a new person to a meeting who's already confused and frightened, and who's looking for something new. And it comes from an environment where the F word is every other word, and where complaining about the state of life is is the conversation piece, and hate is the motivator, and fear is the motivator. And if I bring them to a meeting and all you're doing is bitching and cussing, complaining about everybody else, why the hell would he stay? I wouldn't. I wouldn't. And I have to create that arena where that will occur only minimally. It's bound to occur. There's days when I've earned the right to bitch. In fact, I've reached an age, Tom, where I think I'm going to become cranky. <laughs> and and I'm not even going to have to work very at it. Very lonely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I tried it for about two weeks, and you're right. <laughs> but he obviously knows what he's talking about. I've been continuously sober since December 26th of 1967. That statement should tell you something. I know what I'm talking about when I say simply, if you're alcoholic, you don't ever have to drink again. I can show you a way in which you can live a life that will make sense to you without alcohol. And I know what I'm talking about. And I hang around with guys who are 45. And Yale's 51 now. And, you know, if you want to see some examples, we know what we're talking about. Shelly, you're, what, 34, 33, yeah. Well, we come from the old Denver Young People's Group. 
we were something to behold. About 15 of us. We uh, had a meeting on Tuesday night that was ours. You were welcome to come if you could stand the heat. <laughs> you know, young people have confrontation meetings and work steps like their lives depended on it. And on Sunday night, we sponsored a meeting where the whole town was there at York Street. It was a call-up speaker meeting. Nobody knew who was going to cheer until they walked in the door. And nobody knew who was going to speak until they got there. We thought that was pretty nifty, and it really was. Nobody had time to figure out what the hell they were going to talk about. <laughs> and the rest of the week, we went other places. We came to your meeting. We went to Greeley and Fort Collins and the north side of Denver and hospitals. We were a very busy, involved group. We met in homes back then, too. I, I can remember it clearly. We had an old dog, a big old black dog. And we'd meet in our home. And the dog would just lay there. And the minute we started the Lord's Prayer, the tail would start. <laughs> uh, we did things together. We know what we're talking about. Can I meet that? Yeah, I can meet that. Not from here, but in my heart, I can tell you, I've been married to the same woman for 25 years. Living in the same house. I know what I'm talking about. Don't come to me with your relationship problems. I've never figured out how to help a healthy, sick relationship. So I can't do you any good. But if you don't know how to have a healthy relationship, I can show you how to have a relationship with God, and that will translate into everything. Anyway. But his whole deportment shouts to the new, pro to the new prospect that he's a man with a real answer. People don't listen much to what we say. Words are good carriers, but because words in the English language, words mean so much, they don't mean much. So in order to overcome that, we have developed a storytelling way of presenting our message. I can show you a technique till it's running out your ears. I won't. I save that for the really sick ones that come to my house. Because it keeps them busy while we try to figure out how we're going to keep them alive for one more week. <laughs> <laughs> my deportment, that means how I conduct myself. If I sponsor you, you will show up at my house at 6 in the morning. Although there's a couple of guys since I've retired have pushed me to seven, but I like six. A couple of reasons. When I was working, that was the only time I really had available. But mainly, I want you to see how a recovered alcoholic and his family prepares for the day. It's the toughest time in any alcoholic's life. We think it's the afternoon. No, it isn't. In the afternoon, we're getting ready to drink. That's the easy time. It's this early morning stuff. And uh, that's what was done for me. And I came out of the prison and had a little hotel room, and then I moved into a little apartment with the toilet down the hall, and then I finally got one that had the toilet in the same room again. Well, it had its own door, but it was in the same, <laughs> same room. And, uh, and I wanted to be a family man, so I picked a man to sponsor. He not only had an answer technically, he had a family. And I just got in Gary's back pocket. And watched how he did that. And he wasn't very good at it. But he was better at it than I was. <laughs> at least his kids talked to him. <laughs> Had a job. Let me tell you real wisdom from a sponsor, a big book fanatic, gave me this. Gave me two things. First of all, he said, are you tired of being arrested? And 
I said, yeah. He said, then quit going where there's cops. <laughs> oh. Okay. Profound. He said, do you want money? I said, yeah. He said, well, get a job. Then once you've got it, show up for it. Kind of regularly. And on time, if possible. And while you're there, you might even consider doing some work. <laughs> He's a smart mouth. And at the end of a given period of time, they'll give you money. And it'll never be enough. But it'll always be enough. Now, that'd be smart, Alec, if I hadn't been watching him. He had a job. Even in the penitentiary, he had a job. And he did that job. And he had another job, which was liaison with the administration so we could have our meetings. And he had another job, which was wandering the tears, talking to noodles like me. In fact, that's one of the things that brought me a step further in the process. When I was locked down at night, because... This is an environment where if you're not doing something, they put you back in your cage. So they don't have to worry about you. And uh, when I was in my cage, he would come by and visit with me. And I realized one day, he can't do that. Inmates are not allowed to wander the tears. You're either on your job or you're in your cage. I want what he has. He's getting out of his cell whenever he wants to. I want what he has. And I finally got it. That was his main job, was going around talking to the people who were coming along in the process. In the school, we did this. The rest of the time, it was by example. His deportment, he was clean. You got two kinds of people in the prison in terms of dress. There's the ones that just have the clothes that go to the laundry and come back, and they look kind of shabby. We don't have very many tailors there. So. And then there's the players. And their clothes are always needle-sharp pressed. Avoid them. If, you have, if you're not through drinking here, you'll end up in a penitentiary. Remember that one. Stay away from tightly pressed clothes people. <laughs> <laughs> he exhibited the same thing I'd seen in my dad. He was there. So I began by watching examples to understand one of the things that I must develop in me is to be there. My dad gave me a little piece of wisdom. Didn't come out of here, I'm sorry. Uh, it's in here, but it, you won't find it in these words. He said, Don, all a man needs is two things to live a good life. Honor and wisdom. You need enough honor to keep every promise you ever make despite the personal consequences and enough wisdom not to make too many promises like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a principle that suits me. It comes right out of here. If I get rid of all the self-interest and all those things that are going on in my head and I keep making promises I can't keep because it makes you feel better and you'll I, you know, it's the old con game. If I get rid of all that, I can just show up. I don't have to go through all that stuff in my head about am I pleasing you or not. Don't much care. I know I won't do anything to displease you if I can help it. But if it does displease you, well, okay, talk to me about it then. And then get the hell away from me. I don't think so. <laughs> he was always there. Not at my beck and call, but he was always there. Somehow he showed up just when he needed to show up. He was always there. And he was available. That's another aspect of being there. He was available. Folks who know me know that I'm very easy to reach if you need me. There's an awful lot of people who say they can never reach me. Well, it's because they don't need me. Okay. Is that esoteric, Tom? <laughs> Probably emotional. <laughs> yeah. 
So I'm watching. I'm beginning to develop, I guess you could call them skills, to develop internal, they're not even principles, they're not intellectual things, ways of being. If I give you my word, I will keep it. Know that. That's where I stand. Don't ask me for my word unless you intend for me to keep it. Because I will. If you don't really want it, we got conflict. But he has no attitude of holier than thou. Today that concerns me, I must tell you the truth. Lots and lots of places I go have a holier than thou attitude. Some of it comes from people who use the big book, and some of it comes from the action folks, and some of it comes from the who cares folks. Holier than thou. My effectiveness is the fact that I know I am you and you are me. That was my big spiritual awakening. How can I be holier than you are? Sit around and listen to the war stories. And it's not the high drama stuff. It's the really chicken shit stuff like stealing the kid's piggy bank because you need a drink. And I know that and I can project that. And I don't come down to your level and I don't raise you to my level. We meet where we are. And that's good enough for me. I expect the very best out of everybody I meet. I also know that whatever you brought to the table today, that's your very best. Okay. I'm not going to make any judgments on that. Nothing whatever except the sincere desire to be helpful. <clears throat> Can I fit that? Or do I have an agenda? If I decided that you should be in your fourth step in your sixth week, if I have, I'm not matching this. Uh, you need to tell me how to work the steps. I don't need to tell you. The pacing is different for everybody. And I need to be... And talk quickly about Chuck. Chuck softened me. I, I was a big book fanatic of the kind that got rigid for a while. If you weren't doing it exactly this way, you weren't doing it right. And, uh, oh, God. I cherish those days. I don't want to ever return to them. I, oh, horse's ass. And God sent me Chuck. Five foot two, mean as a snake, dangerous. So dangerous when he walked in the room, didn't even have to say anything. People just backed up. It was clear this one would eat you alive if you said the wrong thing. And not even use a toothpick afterwards. Just bad to the bone. He'd been sober eight years, worked at Hazleton and drank. Had several two-year periods of sobriety, and then he drank. And he was done... He was trying to drink himself to death and couldn't, and that made him even madder. So they sent him over to our group uh, in Denver. When you got one that you just can't do anything with, send him to us. Uh, I, I think it's probably revenge. <laughs> anyway, Chuck got right up in my face. He'd been told to talk to me. Got right up in my face. Just dared me to say anything meaningful. He said, and don't give me any of that big book crap. I've tried that and it didn't work. What am I going to say? He tried it. It didn't work. Okay. And I love that because then I, I pray, which means I get into a state where I understand I don't know what to say to this guy. Either put some words in my mouth or get me the hell out of here. <laughs> And I heard it come on. I said, well, Chuck, what do you think of God? Oh, I hate the son of a bitch. I understand that someday we each get a couple minutes with him and I can't wait for my turn. Tell him what I think of this shitty deal. And I'm going to hell with my friends. And I thought, good. He believes. <laughs> we have an attitude problem. But he believes. This man was so deeply wounded by life and by alcoholism. And by life, I mean he came up in a family. He was wounded. This was a wounded animal. And I knew that there's no way I can do anything 
except nurse this guy if you if you'll let me. And I did the only thing he needed. He needed a friend first. He needed to feel somebody on this planet cares about me, even though I hate everybody. So I just had him come by my house every day, and I was in a business that I traveled around town, and he just rode around with me, spewing hate. <laughs> I don't care. He didn't, that just goes right on through. There's nothing to worry about there. Uh, almost a year before we could do anything except ride around. Uh, The change occurred in Chuck because of my wife, not me. We stopped by the house one day and she'd made chocolate chip cookies. And she gave us each one. They're really good, by the way. (laughs) And Chuck ate his and said, that was good. Which to a cookie maker means, well, here, have a bag. <laughs> and we got back in the car and he broke my heart because he, he described his condition to me. He said, why would she give me a bag of cookies? I was able to say, it's because she thinks you're a member of the family, Chuck. And I watched the change take place. Then we could get into clearing it away. Okay. There's no fees to pay. I'm going to challenge you on that one. I'm sorry. I go to a lot of meetings where right in the middle of somebody's talk, which is very rude, somebody starts passing a basket with no explanation whatsoever. And I got into a new guy's head one day watching that happen. I thought, wait a minute now. I'm new here. I'm still shaking. I've got 57 cents in my pocket. Some other idiot has told me to make 90 meetings in 90 days. That's a setup. I'm sorry, I don't believe in that. You should make far more than that. <laughs> <laughs> don't put a number on people who can't show up anyway, for God's sake. And that becomes a target. Anyway, I'm listening to you and I'm watching you because I'm suspicious. I've tried a lot of stuff and nothing's working. I've probably tried this four or five times and it didn't work either. And right in the middle of someone sharing something, they start this basket around. No explanation. And I'm watching the people go into their pockets and come up with a buck and throw it in the basket. I got 57 cents. And I'm going to be here for 90 days. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that this thing's going to cost me 90 bucks. And I got 57 cents in my pocket. And I might not eat tonight. I probably won't come back here. So maybe a little explanation would be appropriate after the person finishes sharing. No fees to pay. Our our Denver Young People's Group, we used to tell them, if you're new, don't put anything in that basket. You're not a member yet. We used to tell them to take it if they need it. Yeah, we quit that, though. No access to grind. I'm sorry, I try to live up to that one, and I just don't do well. <laughs> Grinding axes is one of the few pleasures I have left. But I'll, I'll try not. I, I'm not going to grind them with new people. No people to please. If I sponsor you, you do not have to please me. You don't have to do a damn thing, I say. If you don't, you won't get the results that you came to me for. You don't have to please me. You do have to show up on time, regularly. If you don't, then you don't have that time anymore. I just assume you don't want it. That's all. I, I don't fire people. Uh, I get fired a lot. And that's good because it clears the deck for somebody new. But you don't have to please me. You don't have to dress a certain way. You don't even have to clean your mouth up to please me. I will suggest you may want to do that if you want to make any friends. Uh, Somewhere along the way. Uh, well, they did that for us. They, it was suggested by my sponsor that I learn to speak English instead of street. Uh, and if you're getting into corrections work, please don't try to talk contact. 
You don't know right off the bat you're fake. And they're not going to listen to the thing you say. And you're not very good at it. <laughs> they are. Uh, we get tested a lot. I know that one. No lectures to be endured. Oh, God, save me from that. I love lecturing. Uh, one of the ways that I finally gained the trust of my children is that I stopped raising them. I think raising children the way most of us do it is a criminal activity. It's, it's an imposition of my values on you, and you will, by God, reflect well on me. <laughs> okay. And you do that by lecturing. Remember when you were a kid and all the lectures you got? I don't remember any of the lectures. I just remember all those I got. Because the minute you start that, click. <laughs> These are the conditions we found most effective. And there was a second piece that I was to become effective in my life. I just tripped through. <clears throat> Most alcoholics have that. We really want to be effective. I want to know that somewhere along the way, my being on this planet counted for something. That I wasn't just another number that went through here. That somewhere somebody can say, don't remember exactly who it was, but this happened and my life changed a little bit. It got better. I think we all want that. I've got to be effective, not right. That was the way it was put to me. Learn to be effective, not right. Get you out of the debating society. None of us makes a sole vocation of this work, nor do we think its effectiveness would be increased if we did. That kept me out of the treatment business for a lot of years. I got back into it, but in a different role. I applied for a job three years sober with Joe Wright out at... Uh, Fort Logan, his house father. We practiced as amateurs, and I was going to be a pro. She said, honey, you can do this job very easily, but if you do, you'll lose some of what you've got. So I did not take the job. I want to be effective. Effective as a parent. What does that mean? What is an effective parent? I'm not going to define it for you. I just want you to think about it. I can see the results of effective parenting. When my two-year-old grandson comes in the house, he gets a big grin and he runs at me and almost knocks me over. I've done something effective. He trusts me. Yeah. Uh, anyway, we feel that elimination of our drinking is but a beginning. A much more important demonstration of our principles lies before us in our various, in our respective homes, occupations, and affairs. The implication is that I will have each of those things. A home, an occupation, and affairs. I just have to be careful not to have more <coughs> affairs than I have principles. This is, I'm, I'm going to let Tom talk now. This was just the introduction. So that it took so long. A much more important demonstration of our principles lies before us in our various respective occupations, homes, and affairs. How can I take what's in here out here? Because if it stays in here and I stay in here with it, I'm useless. I'm of no use to anybody. How can I take this out so even people whose methods may be different, whose style may be different, we can work in brotherly and harmonious action? That's what this is really all about. How do you do it on the job? I've got some stories later about how that plays out. The spiritual lives are very real right now on the street. Let's get with it, life. Uh, meditation is important. Inventory is important. A business that takes no regular inventory will soon go broke. A business that stays in inventory all the time is also going to go broke. you got to be open for business every now and then. Notice I didn't pass the basket while you were talking. <laughs> I appreciate that. 
<laughs> if you'll excuse me, I'm, I'm not running out on you. Yes, you are. But I'm old. I don't know, old people have duties. <laughs> uh, it's 10 o'clock. We, let me get logistically solid here. We, 9 o'clock, what time do we break to eat those sandwiches you made? Eat at 10.30? No, just a break. Like a yeah, I mean the lunch deal. Oh, that's at 12. 12, 12 o'clock. Noon o'clock. 12 to 1.30. Okay. Um, that sounds like a square deal. <clears throat> so we break by 10.30. All right, good. Yeah, I like to do that. Yeah, I like to sort of puts me at ease. Well, it also helps me know what I'm doing. But <laughs> sometimes people just turn you loose and say, do whatever you want, just be wonderful, you know. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> The uh, let me let me just I won't rehash it all, but let me just piggyback a little bit what uh, what Don was talking about. Yeah, you know, this this chapter there is a solution is, is, is what we're about, and it you know it, it is about how we make this solution come alive. How, how do we make the solution really be a solution and be effective? And uh, you know a lot of a lot of times when I first looked at the uh, at the uh, at the big book. It, it, it looked like just jumble to me. You know, it just looked like a whole bunch of philosophical stuff. And but, but what I find when I get into it is that it's about as detailed a manual as you'll ever see uh, in terms of laying out in specific kinds of terms, uh, you know, how we make these things happen. And and that very much is, is true to me. Uh, uh, I appreciate what what Don was sharing. That I, I, I was thinking that. I think probably the most uncomfortable I have ever been trying to talk to an AA group. A guy asked me to speak in Charlotte, and uh, he was a lawyer. I mean, I, that doesn't excuse everything, but it explains a lot. <laughs> <laughs> he, and, the, and the guy had gotten hold of my professional resume from somewhere. And he introduced me to an AA group by my professional resume. And I swear to God, I have never felt more awkward in a meeting in my life. Uh, how do you get from that to what we're about? And uh, I bet you it took me 10 minutes to get reoriented and reintroduced to a way that we're on the same sheet of music. And, 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 and what that does, it came to mind when he was talking about this, that, that unless we get those essential ingredients for making the solution come alive in place, it doesn't happen. You, you ever go to a, a meeting and somebody lectures to you, somebody just makes a, a speech? That, is, that has to be a classic demonstration of how to turn off somebody. I mean, drunks won't listen to that. They absolutely won't listen. I don't care how good it is. It just doesn't have the ingredients that, that earn the confidence of an alcoholic. We had a really wonderful person come speak at our group a while back. And they spent the first 30 minutes just launching in to, a, to an abstract presentation of history. History is interesting if it's coming from a drunk. But if it's a history lesson, uh, you can thump it up. And so for 30 minutes, everybody was kind of restlessly shifting around and politely listening. And then, half hour into it, they got drunk and started talking about drinking and wrestling and throwing up and rowdy behavior. And my God, the crowd just became electric, you know. <laughs> and some of that, when that's not in place, it just doesn't work. And uh, so it's how you, we get some brain dead sometimes listening to drunk stories. But thank God for them, because they're the heart and soul of the Henry, you need this. Don't you go too far away. <laughs> and so, I guess this. It, they're the heart and soul of this thing of what it is that earns the trust and confidence. Because if you hadn't been there, I don't particularly want to hear the philosophy unless you're coming from the same place that I'm coming from. And so, yeah, to me, that's awfully important, this, this, this ex-problem drinker, that if I can establish the fact that that's who I am, 
you know, that, that I'm a guy who has had this problem, then everything I offer is valid. You know, and the same with you. If you're telling me something and I know where you're coming from. Now, I learned a long time ago that you know, alcoholics don't invest real trust very readily. It's got to be on the basis of a proven relationship, a trusting relationship. But once it happen, happens, it never stops. It never quits. Uh, because it's a lifetime deal. Uh, I'm constantly amazed at, at how many people I have called me that I worked with 20 or 25 years ago. And there's something about that connection that occurs that just becomes almost like a sacred trust. And when you start getting shaky and unsure, you want to reach back to something that you trust. You want to get something that you know you can hold on to. And so I think it's an awfully vital thing about the solution that it's not enough just to have a lot of glib words, words that describe something. Very important to, to, for me to understand that it's based on my experience. The, 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 this thing of one alcoholic honestly sharing their experience with another alcoholic has had effectiveness like nothing this world has ever known. And that's why, you know, kind of share, share with Don this, this notion that we, if we start moving it into a technology and we get too studious in it, we lose the spirit of, of what this dude's about. So tremendously important to me to, to, to always keep in, in, uh, in good, sharp focus that, that my experience is what's valuable, not my wisdom or wit or, or, or all that stuff, but it's the experience. And... Um, first and foremost, and then who's found a solution, um, pretty important to be able to have a valid story of recovery and not just a drunk story. Um, so pretty, pretty sharp criteria for that. Armed with facts about himself, not about the illness, about the sociology of alcoholics and honor, but armed with facts about himself. And then it comes from a good, solid, confident kind of place. Um, can earn the entire confidence in just a few hours. The other thing I just wanted to, to mention a, a, a little bit that it's the thing about the holier than now, and that that is a kind of a, a sneaky thing to, um, to in subtle things kind of make that happen. It, it's the thing of you know, I see us sort of collectively doing it sometimes. Well, let me go back to a, to a prison thing and then branch that out just a little bit. Um, some people, when they do institutional work, get into sort of group thinking, you know, group thinking, put everybody in one box. And, and one of the things that I used to, to, to really dislike in those early days were people who would come in and talk about you guys, like there's, that there's one monolithic set of people sitting in these, these chairs. And my God, it's all different people. You know, they're, they're totally different people. But it's sort of looking at folks as a class. And I don't know of a, of a less engaging thing that you can do because there's no connection. That's just sort of a, a kind of a, a class action stuff, I guess. <laughs> but it happens. And, and folks will tend... To, to, to sort of lecture and advise people that they see as a as a same group. And so it, it, it really works against this business of earning trust and confidence in me. When, when, I, when I can't get away from this kind of separation of seeing myself in one category and seeing you in another. Very important for me to recognize it, that us, we is us. I, I see it also in... Uh, in some of the ways we deal with people who come into our meetings who are, are sort of, sort of uh, like, for example, people who come in with a court paper. And, and we'll tend to deal with those people as if they were one thing and sort of write them off as people who are in a different category because they happen to have a different hook in them. Yeah. And, and we'll tend to just sort of routinize how we deal with them 
and miss the opportunity to really relate to them as individuals. You know, one of the real challenges that that I've been trying to work on and been trying to enlist others into doing it too is is how we deal with people who come into AA. And I think it, it comes under that holier thou, even though we may not be thinking that way consciously. Like if people come in to meetings from a facility. I was speaking somewhere the other day and uh, three people got up and left at a, at a certain time. Well, I mean, I'd, I'd been around long enough to recognize the behavior. I knew they were reporting somewhere because it wasn't, you know, like random acts of desertion. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> this was like somebody rung a bell, you know. <laughs> So I kind of leaned over to the guy beside me. I said, where are they going? He said, oh, they come over from the jail, and they have to be back. Yeah. But see, it, it was it was they. It was compartmentalized thinking. Yeah. And those people, folks came in as a unit, sat as a unit, left as a unit, and never really shared the experience <coughs> the same way those of us did who were sitting there. And so thinking of that, whether you're thinking holier than now, or just that these folks are different. Absolutely block the <coughs> thing of, of connecting and earning the confidence and trust of people. Treatment centers, same thing. The, uh, I don't know about here, but a lot of our treatment centers have, have, have uh, waned and uh, not, not, not as evident. But people from halfway houses and treatment centers has always it's been a, a real perplexing concern for me that they tend to operate like, I guarantee you I could go to, to a jaywalkers and if people were coming in from a facility, I could spot them. And so could you. Because you, you watch them, they'll move like they're in a cube. You know, they'll, they'll, come in, they'll come in sort of cubed up on a bus or a van or something and then they'll march like soldiers into the, to the meeting and then they'll sit together. And some of it is regimentation. Some of it is just the thing that that's where they feel safe, I guess, or something other. Like but I've seen people, I've watched them walk into the meeting, in the cube, sit in the cube, move into whatever group they're going as a cube, get back on the bus as a cube, and never interact with the folk in the meeting. You know, they're subtle things, but there are ways that we display this kind of, of, of sort of Put it under holier than now, this thing of, of not breaking through those barriers in the ways that we can. And, and if we don't get past that and get it to a personal level, I'll give you one other example of the thing I ran into. And part of what got me troubled about court papers, uh, I was in a city out in the Midwest a while back, and there was a meeting that I don't go to a lot of daytime meetings, but they had a noon meeting at this particular place, and I said, well, shoot, I think I'm going to catch that. So I went in, and I was, I was kind of like the psychiatrist at the burlesque show. I was watching the <laughs> audience, you know. I and mean, the meeting was fine, but I, I, I got interested because they had a deal there where the secretary of the meeting sat on a raised platform at a desk and sort of ran the show, <laughs> for the, for the thought she was, and uh, nobody paid attention to her. But I, I started watching the people who came in with papers where somebody had mandated them to be there and get a signature. And they had a ritual. When you came in, you went up to that desk and you put the paper in the, in the inbox on, on the desk and sit down. So I picked a guy just to sort of see what happened. I picked a guy who walked in, random, random selection, <coughs> came in, put his paper there, just like he was trained to do it. I don't know if they teach it on the street or what, but he just came right in, put the paper in, went down, sat down about in the middle of the crowd. The meeting was on step five, and I kind of watched him the whole meeting. And he was, you know, I didn't disrupt anything, he was just properly attentive. Got through with the meeting, got up, walked up to the desk, got his piece of paper, walked out, never interacted with one human. Now, I, we would put him under the heading of having been to AA. Has he ever been to AA? No. He came in and observed a meeting. He didn't engage in a meeting. 
and got into no fellowship, got into no conversation, not got into no personal interaction with a single human. And to me, that's, that's that thing that happens when, when we start thinking collectively of people that we just kind of write off a whole class. And we don't use it, we don't want to be ugly with that, but it's just something we do. And, and uh, so, uh, just, just mention that thing, that, that thing of thinking collectively of people. I'll I tell you one thing I, I ran into when, uh, I don't know, time goes so fast when I'm talking. <laughs> <laughs> I got, I, I got time for this one, this one little war story that, that, uh, that kind, of, kind of makes the example. That at, when I got out of the institution and went back to Michigan on my first trip, I was going to the state convention in, in Lansing, Michigan. And I, and I had a lot of buddies. I hadn't been back since I'd left up there. And I had a lot of dear friends that I wanted to see. I started in the hotel, and there was a real nice-looking guy standing there with his name tag on well-dressed fellow and, and uh, looked like a Wall Street guy. But he had the name tag. So I knew he was a name. He went over, chatted with him for a minute, and then I asked for a guy, and uh, he recognized the guy that I mentioned as doing a lot of work down at the, the institution I was in. And he said, uh, oh, oh, you must uh, you must have met Pete. Were you around Jackson? I, I said, yeah, I was there. He said, well, Pete does an awful lot of good work down there. He speaks you fellows' language. Well, now I know that that was a mild, innocuous statement. But it's also the kind of statement that can drive you out of here. And I said, could I ask you what language is that? (laughs) He said, oh, you know what I mean. I said, yeah, I do know what you mean. But I hope you know what I mean because I speak the same language you do. I don't speak a foreign language because I happen to be in a different setting. You know, they're simple things, you know. And, and I wasn't being being scornful of the guy, but it's very important because that attitude can be the barrier to somebody coming here. So when we're looking at things about what makes the solution come alive, what makes it effective, I think that's why the book points out this kind of thing is that those little attitudes can make the difference. You know, if you have that kind of feeling about somebody, you don't need to tell the new guy. I guarantee you his feelings are out there sharply enough that he'll pick it up. You can't hide it. And so I think it's awfully important that, 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 that in doing that, it's kind of like Don said, it's not so much how much I know or how glib I am or anything like that. It's about how well I can present myself to the person and earn that trust and confidence. If I don't, the rest of it's an exercise of futility. How long do we break? <laughs> about, t- about 10 minutes. I noticed the way she said it. 10 minutes never means 10 minutes, we call it. Uh, we just had a group conscience consisting of two incredible alcoholic minds. We're going to have a three-hour meditation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no doubt what will come out of that. We want to take just a minute before we get rolling and uh, pose a little little question to you. you know, everybody is here for a reason. You know, everybody came here either to get in out of the sun or whatever. But, but, but folks have got a reason for being here and something they're looking for. We've gone through some stuff this morning that, uh, that I really enjoyed visiting. But part of our purpose is to, to, to try to help everybody here get what they're looking for the best we can. And so we're at a point, you've sort of seen that we make it up as we go. And, and so absolutely no way to get this train off track. Uh, it just stays there, you know, and, then it, <laughs> and it winds up getting on track in the, in the process. Uh, real quick, give us some, uh, some feedback, if you would, in terms of, of what you'd like to, to see visited before we get out of here at quitting time today. And we'll see, we'll see how well we can respond to that. Anybody? You started yeah. to talk about how effectiveness, how you know whether you're going to be effective or not. Mm-hmm. Yes, a little more depth on effectiveness. Okay. I can tell you yeah. in one brief sentence. When we broke here, 
and you were all standing out in the parking lot talking to each other, we have been incredibly affected. <laughs> That's the marker. Or else made you hungry. <laughs> <laughs> at, at meetings, a good meeting, people hang out. They came early, they stay late, and they go do other things. That's what it's really about. If everybody breaks and goes home, there's something missing out of that. There's no spirit. Alan mentioned a couple of things that I'll just throw out, if uh, if it may, is in the general area of sponsorship. Uh, and I kind of alluded to that before we broke. A, a couple of real issues that are that are that are that are weighty for us and, and to have to do with effective relationships is when do you discontinue a relationship and sponsorship if you just believe it's run its course? And how do you deal with that? Uh, some people use a crude word like firing, but it's not necessarily that. It's just recognizing. The other thing is how you deal with people who are under medication, and it poses some real challenges in terms of, of, uh, of discerning when you can do effective work, how to responsibly deal with it. Is that covered uh, adequately, Al? Okay. All right, those are good points too. That yeah. I just would like to hear your experience with the steps. With steps. You know, maybe the fourth step or you know eighth step. Yeah. That when all else fails, go to the steps. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good job. Anybody else? Pardon? Dealing with really resistant people, but they keep showing up. I need guidance. Uh -huh. <laughs> Hard cases, <laughs> but persistent cases. <laughs> okay, yeah, how you deal with resistant, resistant people. Uh, yeah, <laughs> my mind just takes off with that. But. Anybody else? Yeah, yeah, Will? Dealing with remorse. Remorse. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, all right. Yeah, got gotcha. you. I do have sponsors that are really struggling with just functioning in life. You know, they're, they're depressed. They're, you know, the, the devils. Can't mm -hmm. seem to get a job. Can't seem to mm -hmm. get together. All dressed up with nowhere to go. <laughs> 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 okay, yeah. Good deal. It could have been a contender. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Of course, you know either one of those could go for a week. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm more about your experience emotional and spiritual, emotional sobriety, spiritual growth, and um, living this in and out of the rooms in all areas of your life. Mm hmm. That's an excellent thing, uh, how, how you get it from the concept stage in the rooms into real <coughs> stuff where we live. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah, one more. It, uh, like we didn't have enough to do. Mm -hmm. uh, you remember all that, Don. Self-supporting for your own contributions. I'm sorry? Self-supporting for your own Did you follow that? Yeah, and I'm going home. <laughs> <laughs> Help me just one thing. You said being self-supported through your own contributions. And then I couldn't quite follow that, that second part. I couldn't hear it quite. Um, grounding your ideals in a power greater than No, I heard it then. I'm just not incredibly brilliant. I, I have trouble following sometimes. The uh, I'm having trouble connecting to self-supporting and that, uh, that 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 spiritual connection. Yeah, you've got a connection in there, but I, I'm... okay. Okay. You also you all obviously know that if we try to address those. We're going to be here till sometime in the middle of next week. Yeah. However, if you allow us to tell some stories, we can illustrate each one of them, sometimes a couple of them, 
from our own experience, if, if that's suitable. Uh, I left my lecture notes at home, uh, and I left my addressing this notes at home. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. We've got personal experiences. You're talking about the application of spiritual principles in the real world, is the essence of what I heard coming out of here. How do you do that? Well, let me address remorse first. We'll get that, that done, because I know about that. Guilt is one I have been caught violating one of your rules or laws or principles, and I feel guilty. Very easy to deal with. I'll wait for you to tell me what kind of time I have to do. <coughs> Just to pay back. Then I do that, and as soon as that's done, or shortly before it's done, I just go my merry way. That's easy. Remorse and shame is when I have caught myself violating one of my principles, one of my true beliefs, violating who I am, and there is no payoff. I'm going to tell you a little story. This one hurts, but I'd like to keep it fresh because you've all got one of these. <coughs> we all have an ace in the hole, father, mother, uncle. We've got a place where when all else fails, I can go back and rest for a few days. And my dad was that. And during the last part of my sickness, I was part of a subculture. I'm one of the freaks that came out of Berkeley. Screaming out where there's dope, there's hope burned down City Hall. <laughs> and we lived underground. There's a real culture out there. Anyway, we were resting, and Albert called me from Albuquerque. Albert was one of the snakes I ran with. And Albert said, uh, We got 30 kilos of good marijuana as far as Juarez, and our driver got busted. We need somebody to go get it. Now, get the whole picture. At the time, I'm a single parent to two little boys. One uh, six and one four. I'm trying to be a parent, but we're on the road. Don't want to get too dramatic with it. Albert says, we need somebody to get it. Would you do it? And I said, of course, Albert. Now, that should give you some dimension of where I'm at trying to keep these kids safe and I just accept the job of smuggling 30 kilos of marijuana out of Juarez, Mexico. And I didn't do it for the money. I did it for prestige. I was the only one in the United States they could think of to call. <laughs> to go into old Mexico <laughs> get the job done. The truth was Albert had been told to call me. They said call Prince because he's crazy. So anyway, we, <clears throat> we took the job. I stopped drinking and put on a little bit of weight. Did the math, got my head clear. Uh, the math was necessary. How much volume is there in 30 kilos of marijuana the way it was packed then? I needed to know what kind of box can I put this in? I'm sane now. It will. <laughs> I'm functioning. <clears throat> Clean the boys up, clean me up. Sport coat, young American, Teresa Father. That's the role we're going to play. Had them run a VW van in somebody else's name and had them get us a place to stay. At this point, I have nothing to do with the deal. If it falls apart before I get there, I'm not in it. I'm not stupid. I'm just insane. We got into Juarez. I got the van and got us into Juarez. I didn't pick the stuff up. It was laying in a motel. They picked it up and then transferred to me. The hotel they picked for us, of course, is just a whorehouse motel in Juarez. Uh, we immediately moved into the Holiday Inn style place uptown. Teresa. That volume fits perfectly in a single air mattress. So I opened the end up and stuffed the mattress, then resealed it put air in it. That cuts the smell down. Then on top of that, I put dirty diapers. <laughs> and on top of that, I put my two little boys. So when we hit the border crossing, 
I turned to the children and right out of nowhere screamed at them. Scared them so they'd be crying. Because they don't mess with you when you got crying kids in dirty diapers. That's remorse. Forever. Broke the bond between my, my kids. That's regret. That's remorse. There is no payback for that except the one I found here. In the fourth step, there is a promise that is so profound, face and be rid of. I didn't come here to just get fixed. I came here to be changed into the kind of person who's not capable of committing that act ever again. That's the only thing I know to do with it, Will. The change is so profound that I'm no longer that person. Now, I still have to deal with the fact that I've got to clean that up to the kids. They're scarred. And will always be scarred. Uh, but I can create an arena where they can get better from it. So the answer has changed so profoundly you could never do that again. Total surrender. As long as I'm capable of committing that kind of an act, I cannot live with myself. I can't. You can't deal with it. How can you deal with that kind of thing? You just have to be different. Okay? And that's what I did find here. That's precisely what occurred. Then the next job is to tell you that so you can get off your own back. Because like it or not, that's the best I could do. That's pretty shabby. I'd rather die than be that ever again. But you don't have to die. You get to be something even better. Let me mention two, two, two different levels of remorse that I think about, Will. One <coughs> is... Uh, that remorse comes when I fail to follow my hunches. That and, and what I'm talking about, and I'm talking about a, you know, a different level of it, of the day-to-day -day things that building up remorse. Because what I found is that when I listen to my hunches and I do what I feel the urge to do, uh, if I don't do it, I always regret it. Because it's a real message. You know, if I've got a friend sick in the hospital, and I have a, a hunch that I ought to go see him. If I don't, uh, deep, deep remorse. Because, and I think that's the signals, you know, about being in tune with the, the call it voices, if you will, but the things that I feel spiritually driven to do, and those hunches. And if I take over and impose my judgment, I'll nearly always have remorse about that. What I've what I've learned is that <laughs> that. My first hunch, even, you know, whether it's a spiritual signal or not, but my first impression about something is usually the most, the most correct one I'll ever have. And if I follow that up with a whole bunch of thinking, all I do is screw it up. And after a certain amount of, of a whole bunch of turmoil and confusion, I wind up right back where I started. But I'm often too late. So that's one level. The other that I think, uh, like the kind Don's talking about, our, our program is designed to provide the surgery for the soul, you know, that, that, you know, from deep remorse like that. And, uh, and I have some. I think we sort of visit steps a little bit with this thing. You know, I, I believe that what starts to emerge in the fourth step and then gets crystallized in the, in the eighth and ninth are the surgery of the soul, you know, where I start getting, rooting out those causes and conditions and, and the, the enormous damage that has come from my defects of character. And, and my belief is, whether it's true or not, it's certainly my belief, is that every time, whether it's gravity like, like he's talking about, or gravity like in my case where I took human life, you know, all, of the, all of these things have an enormous weight. And so do, so do those far lesser things that make up an immense list. And my belief is that I will never have the freedom that this program promises until I take that surgical procedure and give it my best to make right those wrongs. And, and so it, it's one thing to recognize it and deal with it. 
But if I don't have to figure it out and deal with it, what I have to do is take the steps and let it happen. And uh, if we don't, I think we pay an awful price because those things become the anchors that we drag through life. And I won't be free till I'm able to turn them loose. And just kidding myself that it wasn't all that bad is not enough. Just having somebody try to placate me and say, oh, you weren't that bad is not enough. You know, what I have to do is root out those things that, that eat me up. And uh, so, yeah, I, I think the steps d d directly put us through at whatever level uh, so that we can find peace. Uh, this kind of thing is about being shabby. I described the high intensity, high drama peace. The children were in no real danger. Don't mistake that. Had we been caught, they'd have been better off because they'd have gone to at least a decent foster home. What I did to my children is that for no reason whatsoever, I broke the spiritual bond between us. I harmed them to accomplish my own ends. Totally self-serving. And that's what inventory brings me to every case. It's shabby. <clears throat> it's about me wanting a little prestige. It's about me wanting this or that, a little money or whatever. And that's the one that's hard to face. That on my own, I am nothing. It's very clear. Left to my own devices. At my very best, if there's ten people in the room, at my very, very best, I can help nine of them. Somebody's going to get screwed. In God's hands, <clears throat> I have found that even the onlookers benefit. Mm. <laughs> Nobody gets messed with it. Even people just crossing the street. Two little pieces for the prayer that goes along with this. This whole thing is about me getting conscious of the relationship with God. We asked for guidance and direction. Well, there was an old Assembly of God preacher who used to come into the penitentiary. And I discovered that I like spiritual people. I don't care what they call themselves. <laughs> and I love singing hymns. We shall gather at the river still brings tears to you sing in the garden, oh, I'm dead meat. <laughs> <laughs> and this guy, was, I had this illusion that spiritual people were perfect, and, and he was one. And yet he said he had difficulties sometimes and temptations sometimes. We asked him, what do you do? He said, well, when I'm tempted with something and I'm not sure... See, I know the difference between right and wrong. It's the gray area that I get in trouble. If I'm not sure, he said, I take the master by a hand and say, if I go do this, will you go with me? And I got my guide. Okay. Today's guide is a little different. It's a little more personal. If what I'm about to do, would it be all right if my mother, my wife, my daughter, my granddaughter saw me do it? The answer isn't absolutely yes. I'm not doing it. It just gets real simple and basic that way. And the temptations are even harder as you get rid of your defenses against your temptations. <laughs> okay. It gets really tough. Well, I won't really hurt anybody. <laughs> but that, in, in relating to that, clearing away self puts me in... See, the spiritual life is a very practical life to me. Anything that separates me from the children of God separates me from God. And since the whole idea of God is bigger than I can even begin to comprehend, the mercy of AA is that it deals with it on this level. Okay? One of the old masters says, treat people like they want to be treated. Because what goes around does come around. And uh, but that, those are some of the guys. I must engage in this thing. I've got a lovely guy, sober several years now. Never talks a meeting, never does nothing, and he's just miserable. He's in deep depression. Of course he is. If he'd get up and sing for a minute, he'd be over. But he doesn't know how to sing. Or doesn't want to sing, or whatever. Anyway, did, did, does that help a little bit? There are no pat answers for this. I must behave as if God were at hand because where I am, God is. And if 
he wants me to run my head into the wall, or if I want to run my head into the wall, he just stands by and lets me. Keeps the bandages handy. If I don't want to run my head into the wall, all I gotta do is ask for the strength to do the right thing. And when I ask, will you go with me? If I get a strong yes, I go. And that's the toughest one of all. That's the hard one. Because I know it's gonna, I'm gonna be doing something that's extraordinary if I say yes to that and go. If I get a no, I don't go. If I don't get either one, I don't go. That's the grave. That's where the doubts are. If you're not sure you ought to do it, don't. Don't. I don't know why you're in doubt. I might have missed it, but your your temptations get harder as you as you lose your defense against your temptations. I am more vulnerable to drinking today than I ever was before because I don't see alcohol. Yeah. It's not part of my mind. The mental obsession with alcohol is gone. I don't even see it. Fifteen or so years ago, I was flying home. <clears throat> uh, I, I think those of us who are sober a while are in far more danger of drinking because of the truth than we are lies. you got to all work real hard to come up with enough lies to convince me it's okay for me to drink. I know better. But I'm flying home, and this was a perfect evening. I'd given a talk that didn't hurt anybody. Uh, they even drove me back to the airport. They didn't make me walk. Uh, I fly United a lot, and on this particular evening, because of that, they moved me into first class. I used to think that's because I had some special thing going on. It's because they can't sell that seat, but they can sell mine back here. They just moved me up. <laughs> That's an ego deflator. <laughs> but it's nice up in first class. Uh, real food, real plates. It's an evening flight. I'm in fit spiritual condition. I'm going home to the family I adore. I've got a book I've been waiting to read for several weeks. The lights in the first class cabin were just wonderful. And I'm, I'm okay. And I noticed the other side of my corner of my eye flight attendant pouring this burgundy red stuff into my seatmate's glass. That's all it was. And I looked over at it because the light was hitting it. And my mind said, that really looks good. Well, that's the truth. It really did. It's not wine. It's that. Then my mind said, I bet that's going to taste good. Of course it would. That's why she's giving it to him. I'm still not thinking alcohol. Then my mind said, I bet that's going to make his whole dinner taste better. That's the main function of wine, you know. It cuts the grease from the last course and just when you can taste it. Okay. Then a prayer began in me. I don't know how to describe this to you. I just know that I absolutely trust this inner resource, the spiritual resource, to protect me when I don't even know I need protection. When I'm in the gray zone. There's a sense that comes over me. And I immediately turned and went in and just got quiet and realized my very next thought would have been, I probably ought to have one of those without ever thinking alcohol. That's how vulnerable I am today. The temptations are much more. Whew, I've got to really stay fit. Okay? We're out on the road a lot. There's a lot of danger out here. I don't know if you know that or not. There's grave ego danger. There's grave physical danger. There's grave emotional danger. And it's real easy to cave into that. After 50 people tell you you're just wonderful, you begin to think, maybe they're right. <laughs> that means that I have special privilege. And that's where my ego goes with it. And no, I don't. Does that help a little yeah, bit? Yeah. yeah, okay. Pardon me, I'm a storyteller. I, you got to get it all because I don't know anything. I tell you, the, the part of, the part of uh, temptation, and, and I want to kind of lead this around and talk about that, uh, that uh, <coughs> emotional recovery thing a little bit too. The, uh, with me, the, the, more, the more critical kinds of temptation stuff are, are matters of principle things. You know, like, you know, the, like now, I'm not cured, but it's been many years since I've had a real crisis in terms of drinking. 
that doesn't mean I'm cured uh, because I, I know what causes that to be so. But where I run into to difficulties now is that as my life has changed and I've become a, a participant in life and, and a responsible person, I have to make a lot of ethical, principle-based decisions that are sometimes tough to make. And uh, with most older members, that's where I see the real crisis coming. It's about values and, and what you stand for. And, and so I, f I find a lot more threatening stuff that I have to be diligent about in terms of cutting corners, of not of not being scrupulous about the way I do business. Uh, so, you know, the, the ones where it becomes the glaring thing of, of the burgundy, yeah, I, I can deal with that. But the more subtle ones that kind of take away my integrity are the ones that I really have to watch out for. You know, trouble with booze to me is always at least six months ahead of the crisis, at least. And it, and it has to do with starting to lose that sort of sharp focus and clear kind of, 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 of plug into the program. Uh, you know, it's a strange thing. But you, you, can, you can watch somebody headed for trouble. Probably, probably everybody here has seen somebody or may know somebody right now that's headed for trouble and you know it. Everybody recognizes it, but everybody is equally baffled about how to deal with it. Now, how do you do it? You know, and and you know, how you charge in? Sometimes you can charge in and do far more harm than good. Um, but you see it. You start seeing it in behavior. You start seeing it in that squishy thing called attitude. You start seeing it in performance at meetings and stuff like that. Uh, but how to, to step in and intervene is a real deal. My group spent four hours recently in a workshop on working with people, and that was one of the things we talked about. What we, what we wound up saying, the consensus of that group, was something I was talking about this morning. It depends on the level of trust. The person who can most, most, is most apt to be able to step in is the one with the greatest level of trust. If you have that trust, there is absolutely no limit to what you can do with an alcoholic. There's no limit to what you can say. If you don't have it, it's a pretty narrow limit to what you can do. And and so it's a, to me, it, those are where we tend, and it, and it is about emotional recovery. It's about being sound and solid. And somebody asked me a while back, a good while back, to do a workshop on emotional recovery. Now, I'm a kind of a, a down-to-earth type of fellow. And my first reaction, even though I know that it's a legitimate term, my first reaction was, hell, well, I don't want to do a workshop on some touchy-feely stuff like that. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought, well, there's no real set agenda. I can do what I want to do. That's what they said. Kind of like we're doing here today. <laughs> I didn't know till lunch what the program was. <laughs> well, but I'm looking at this thing of emotional recovery and how we're going to tackle it. And, and so I, I sat down and in 20 minutes I did what anybody in this room could do. I thought about what is it that, that, that destroys emotional, what is it that, that, that tears up emotional recovery? You know, I mean, it's one thing to talk about the wonderful nirvana of, of sound emotional recovery but what is it that eats it up and, and, and you could do the same thing I did I sat down and in 20 minutes I listed 28 things just in a brainstorming style of, you know here's stuff that happened first one I put on the list was expectations and my god and no wonder I put it first because I don't know of anything in the world that'll pull me off good sound emotional recovery than putting on expectations on other people all I've got to do to destroy my peace of mind is put expectations because what I do is let them have free space in my head. And I am absolutely done for because I've turned it over to somebody else. And just, just little things you'd think about. Uh, getting overcommitted. Feeling like you're carrying the world on your shoulders. Uh, worry. The thing he mentioned this morning that sounds really innocuous 
a little thing called change your mind. Change your mind. If you think about what we have, we have a, a real, we have a spiritual hold on a new way of life. And all I have to do to lose it is change my mind. And that sucker can be gone in a heartbeat. And so that thing of keeping spiritually sound and keeping emotionally sound is tremendously important. And, and, and we had a good time doing, doing that thing on, on emotional recovery. And, and, and so to me, that's the imminent danger is when I start eroding that sound spiritual ground at a stand on. And no matter what I sell it out to, uh, and you can make your own list of, of things that take that down. And so what, what deals with it? I'll, I'll let you in on a little secret. It goes a little bit to steps. That uh, I'm not somebody who works on problems. I literally don't. And the reason I don't is because when I work on them, they, honest to God, get worse. <laughs> <laughs> they really do. If, if I'm trying to fix remorse, like we were talking about, if I'm trying to fix guilt or trying to work on relationships or whatever, you know, I'll guarantee you I'll make it worse. And and, and, and and what I found is that the way the way that 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 I work on the problems of my life is by trying to do what the, the program lays out. That that little th- little thing in the twelve and twelve that I have come to really appreciate where it describes what the steps are. It says Almost exactly this. I, I know I screwed up a little bit, but you, you recognize is it says our steps are a set of principles spiritual in their nature. You tell me what my tools are. Which if practiced as a way of life, if that thing about you working the steps, doing the steps, writing the steps, seminar in the steps, you know, to me they're off the subject. You know, you know, those are nice activities. But what the real key to the steps is, is in practice them as a way of life. And, and what I've found, and it's absolutely been my experience, that in 45 years, I have never consciously solved one single problem in Alcoholics Anonymous. Not a single one. I have never sat in a meeting or sat with a sponsor and said, Eureka, I finally got it. It, it has never happened. You know, what I find is that as I practice this set of principles as a way of life. Amazing stuff happens. Emotional sobriety happens. Remorse gets dealt with. You know, all of the things that constitute my alcoholism get addressed. And, and, and so to me that whole business about you know, if there is an emotional recovery, there's not any recovery. You know, <laughs> that whole business is how to be free of those those devils that drove me. And, and, and so that's the way I like to go at this kind of stuff. I, I, I don't like to just set little goals and do stuff and do mechanical actions. You know that What I like to do is give myself to this program. When I've got trouble, I never pursue the trouble. What I do, we were talking about it a little bit last night, that what I do is, is I get focused like a laser on what I'm doing. You know, I get focused like a laser. I go to meetings and I listen at that meeting like it's a sermon on the mount. Now I don't care if guys teaching you how to throw up. I'll listen. To, I'll listen like I've never heard, you know, because I want to get locked in. You know, I want to get really geared in, and, and and so that's how I go about dealing with problems. I don't try to fix them out yonder somewhere. I try to fix them by getting solidly tuned in to who I am, to what I'm about, I'm about, what my spiritual life is so that I get solidly connected. And then when I get like that, I, I'm about as strong as they come. And when I try to fix it out yonder somewhere, I'm about as weak as can be. And so that's not just frothy philosophical stuff. You know, that is truly what I believe happens. And it's certainly been my experience that if I practice this as a way of life, stuff just happens. And, and those problems that eat me alive, one day I take a look and he ain't there. I don't go looking for him because I know how to find them. All I had to do is just quit doing what keeps them out there, and they'll be back. Uh, yeah, that's a 
How uh, hilarious. A yeah. practical story about what he just said. How do I apply this on the street? That's why I have to keep looking for it. I was working in community corrections in Denver. You have to understand the correction system itself is designed to fail. If you're going to work in it, you need to know that so that you, you don't. So I've got a probation officer here. I was treatment services supervisor, so I'm here. And I've got my boss here and a couple other department heads here. Now, she sends me a piece of paper. I do something with it. I send it to them so they can get it to here, so they can get back to them through me back to her. That's designed to fail. Somewhere it gets bogged down. She's under pressure, and she's yelling at me. And for a couple weeks, okay. Then she starts yelling at my boss, and he starts yelling at me. Now I've got two of them yelling at me. And it wasn't okay anymore. Now I know something. One of the basic principles of this thing is if I'm disturbed, it's me, not you. Me, I got to deal with me. So I sat down and did inventory the way I've been taught to do it. Because I, I caught myself, I listened to myself. I heard myself tell one of my staff about the bitch. <laughs> right now I know I am completely out of whack. Her name is Stephanie, not the bitch. And, and so that immediately triggers me to lock my office door. <laughs> Don't talk to anybody else. I'm starting to mess with my own staff. Stupid thing to do. Anyway, <clears throat> I, I got it pulled in and discovered what was going on. First of all, I want my boss to quit yelling at me. I don't care if she yells at me. But I do care if he yells at me because he pays my check. And he and I have an agreement. If he yells too much, he gets this. That's <laughs> the guy I work with. And I wasn't ready to do that. So I looked at what was going on. It's all about her yelling at me because this paperwork that she had a timeline on wasn't back here yet, and that's because these people hadn't done theirs yet. Blah, blah, blah. The, the monster in the case was the fax machine. I get the paperwork and I go to fax it to her, and there's an hour wait to get the fax to work. Either hers is busy, mine's busy. That whole thing is jammed up. You have taught me the basic principle here is one-to-one, -one, eyeball to eyeball, not telephones, not fax machines. We're going to talk together. Her office was about 10 minutes away. So I took the paperwork and drove over there. And she was shocked to see me. Gave her her paperwork. And I asked her, do you have any for me? She was shocked at that and got confused. After a week of that, the problem was solved. And in 25 minutes, instead of an hour, waiting for the facts, the problem was solved. She's no longer a threat to me. My boss is no longer a threat to me. I didn't try, I'm like you, I don't try to solve that problem. What's wrong with me? What can I bring to the situation that will make it better? The recognition that she's under the same pressure I am, she got somebody yelling at her. No wonder she's uptight. It worked, by the way. Last time I saw her, she came clear across the room and put a hug on me. Uh, which was not what I had in mind, but it worked. I don't mind that. <laughs> this goes to the street. Prayer is an activity, as well as a, an in-the-head thing. It's an activity. How can I bring about unity in my whole life? Well, that's how. Emotional sobriety means I recognize when I ain't. Okay. Right off the bat, I recognize I'm out of whack here. The bitch just called. <laughs> let me let me tell you one little war story. That you know, sometimes it is, when I first heard people talking about the spiritual life and uh, how you had to live it, and and uh, like this morning he's talking about, the, I see about it, but. It, it actually was my image when I would hear people talking about the spiritual life and how it worked. You're talking about how you found that parking place, you know, just driving around, he's in the right place at the right time, and there's the parking place. When I heard people tell this stuff like that, I thought, gee, what kind of witchcraft is this? 
that yeah, it sounded like they just prayed and somebody's car blew up or something. You know, and they just made the world turn around for them. I thought, gee, that is just a queer jump. And, uh, and then now I talk that way. But it makes sense when I talk that way. <laughs> but it's the same message, you know. But if, if you're not tuned into that, it really sounds goofy. And, and, and what, I, what I found is that the spiritual life, just, just like that, it, it's not just some sort of squishy, do-good, grinning, Dalai Lama stuff. It, it really is about how to function effectively in life. And it works. I, I'll tell you one, one of a thousand stories. Um, I, I was heading a pretty large organization, that, and, uh, and I had something done that was really malicious and underhanded and, and, and injurious to people that work for me. Uh, you remind me of that with, with that story. And you know, I think as a supervisor, you're not only responsible for getting workouts, you're also responsible for looking after the welfare of the folk. And so I had 41 people whose careers were going to be destroyed over a decision that was made, and I'm the boss, and they hadn't even consulted me, <coughs> you know. Well, I mean, I was mad. I, I was mad. I was mad on behalf of the 41 people, and I was about equally mad over the, the total disregard and insult to walking past me to screw my people. And and so, I mean, I was fit to be tied. And uh, so I, I, I said, well, I demanded an audience. I demanded an audience of the head of the system. And... Uh, I guess I had enough rank that they respected the demand, and so they gave me an audience. Now, if you picture this, and this is absolutely true, exactly the way it happened, and, and why the spiritual life is not a wimpy thing. I'm mad, and I'm, I've got in my mind that I'm going to handle this sucker street level. You know, I'm going to go in there and flat stick it in their ear. And, and so I'm going to meet with seven people. And most of the seven had directly benefited from the action that had been taken. So I got to go meet with my enemies in my mind that had done me in and profited in the process. And I'm going to go in there. So all I can think about is I'm going to flat put them down. And uh, I'm driving to the meeting, spoiling for the fight. And on the way up there, thank God it was a long drive. And on the way, I got to thinking about who I am and where I'm going. And I thought, my God, is this the way I take care of business, that the only thing I can think of is to resort to the old street behavior and go up there and try to, to bang up on somebody or whatever? And then I thought about what, what, what our program says, is, is, to, is to pray for those folk. Yeah. And so what I did, driving up US-1, was I put the face of each person visually in my mind. I knew them all well. And so I put each one of them right there, and then I prayed directly with that face in, 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 in my mind. Virtual reality was there. And, uh, and I gave them the benefit of the doubt. I said, well, maybe these folk are wrong, but they're probably doing what they believe is right. Now, I did that seven times because uh, picturing those people. When I got through, I was no longer angry. I was still resolute, but I was not angry. And we went into the meeting, and I sat down with those folks. Now, it took a long time because I had to go through 41 decisions and present my case for why that was a bad decision. At the end of the first day, I hadn't lost a round. I mean, I had won everything that came up. and But I couldn't lose. You see, I mean, when I went in there, there was no way I could lose. If, I'd, if, if it had all gone the wrong way, I was at peace. But I was determined that I was right, that I was trying to do the right thing, that I was not trying to be right. I was trying to do what was right. And at the end of that day, I was really on the roll. Man, I'd won everything. And the boss said, Tom, we're going to have to uh, call a break. And... Uh, and I, I didn't want to break. I'm on a roll. You, why, why am I going to quit? <laughs> and I said, no, 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 let's don't do that, man. i got to drive 75 miles. No. And he said, you've got us beat numb. <laughs> 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 I said, all right, fine, I did have it short. Came back the next day, and it hadn't even changed. I mean, it picked up again. Out of 41 major issues, 
I lost one. I think I could have won that one, but I just didn't want to rub their nose at it. <laughs> but, but you see what I'm, ta- I'm talking about? If I had gone in there using the old Ivester strategies, they would eat me alive. I would have walked out of there with no gains and more losses if I'd have done it my way. And that, that's why I say you know, I don't have to do this stuff if I let the power of the program take care of giving me what I need. I'm a pretty doggone worthy adversary. But if you let me try to do it on out-slicking or out-toughing or out-smarting people, shoot, I'm going to lose a lot more than I win. And, and so to me, that's what this thing is. is, is it's about not some doormat approach to life. It's about being able to take a good, responsible position in trying to do something according to principles, you know, so that it don't get lost and weak in the process. And, and just truly amazing things happen. And that's literally one of, of hundreds of cases that I could tell you where that, that genuinely works for me. I, I'll tell you one more that it's just, it's a shorter one, but it, it's uh, just as effective to me. I, I got a call one day to go make a presentation on behalf of an agency. And I thought we were just going to go sit around a coffee table somewhere. So I, I mean, I was, I was off duty, and so I just went up casually, dressed in an old golf shirt, you know, and I sat down. Well, I didn't know it, but we had a Madison Avenue presentation schedule. And I walk into a real ritzy conference room with, and I've got people sitting there who are my competitors who had productions that were produced in Hollywood, I think. Man, they had videos and computers, and I had a legal pad. You know, I walk there looking like a real doofus, you know, with my legal pad and some crawl notes. I go, what am I going to do, man? I am absolutely outclassed. I mean, I was a hick in Las Vegas. And, and uh, 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 totally blindsided. Well, what do you do? When all else fails, try praying. And so I stepped out, went down to the bathroom where I do my best praying. And, and I asked God to help me do what I was there to do and try to get done what was right. And so I walked in with my little old legal pad, made my presentation, and guess who walked out with it? See what I'm talking about? And, and it wasn't a matter, I think I had the best deal, but I surely had the ugliest presentation. <laughs> but, but when I'm trying to do the right thing, and I am genuinely trying to carry out God's will and do what's right for folks, uh, it's hard to lose, awfully hard to lose. And so it's amazing how, how, how this thing works out, this, this spiritual life. And why I don't get into the fix-it business. You know, I just sort of practice things, let it gear me up to engage in life, and man, it's, it, it, it works strong. Emotional sobriety does not mean that I'm going to feel good all the time. That's insane. <laughs> Absolutely insane. I live on a planet with temperature ranges of four or 5,000 degrees. I can handle 10 of them. I'm going to either put something on or take something off or whine. Uh, I'm a person who, by nature, needs to be loved and adored by everybody. That's dumb. There are people who don't like me just because I'm here. They don't even know me. In fact, I think real sanity is the day I recognize that there are people who like me no matter what I do, and there are people that don't like me no matter what I do. But of more importance, there are millions of people that don't even know I exist. (laughs) (laughs) And wouldn't care if they did. (laughs) So, I'm not going to feel good all the time. My 16-year-old nephew died. We knew he was going to die from the day he was born. We were prepared for it. It still devastated me. I didn't feel good that day or for several days after. I had to do his funeral service. So what do you do? I cried all the way through my talk. That's what I did. That's honest. I just have to feel it. I I have chronic physical pain. What do you do? You say, hi, Flanagan. You know Flanagan? Mm-hmm. Very dangerous, man. <laughs> he had on clothes last time I saw him. <laughs> <clears throat> so that doesn't feel good. 
If I get concerned with not feeling good about not feeling good, then I'm in trouble. Mm -hmm. So the prayer is, God, don't let me get depressed about being depressed. Don't let me feel bad about feeling bad. Get up off your ass and go do something. Well, I don't want to. Well, who cares? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, during the time of, of the worst time, and I won't go into the whole thing, I was struck almost to death with hepatitis C and some complications. In fact, he saved my life by putting me to work and making me useful in the worst of it. But uh, some idiot came by to visit me. He said if I'd have been spiritually fit, that wouldn't have happened. Now, I bought into that for about 10 minutes and then threw him out. Uh, that's crap. But during that period of time, I started looking at my heroes. You see, I want to be better than I am. So I don't want to look down here. I want to look out of here. And almost without exception, the people that I consider heroic had severe physical problems, and they just got above them, that's all. They just went and did it anyway. And then I bumped into the little thing that Sister Teresa talked about as to how she came to her ministry. You know how that is? It's wonderful. She's on a train going across Germany during Hitler's time. Was reading about that and the horrors of that and realized that deep within her was the same capacity for evil that was being demonstrated by him. And it touched her so deeply she decided she needed to give her entire life to just the opposite of that so that would never emerge. Uh, okay. By recognizing the evil within me, now I can do some real good. Because if I'm busy over here, this isn't coming up. But I have to always know that deep within me, I'm a lazy whiner who's interested in, where's mine? <laughs> <laughs> we ought to take a little break. Which thing? Are we, are we heading in the directions you want to go? No. Okay. Fifteen minutes? Question for you guys. Well, not the, the, the microphone here, but you, you ready? We're getting ready to head for the home stretch. The uh, it seemed like there was one other area that, but one one we want to get into and make sure we spend a little bit of time on is that that whole business of, of sponsorship. Uh, I'll kick this off and then get Don to uh, to to pick up in, in the whole area of sponsorship. Two things that that that. Uh, that are pretty clear that, that, that need to be talked about a little bit, uh, and, and probably more than that, but one is just that whole general thing about effective sponsorship, uh, you know, how we do it, and then and then how you start start knowing when to move away, how to move away, that kind of stuff. And, uh, and then the, the thing about the medication, which is an increasing, uh, in, increasingly troubling kind of thing in this whole business of, of how we deal with people. Uh, I think sometimes think that uh, depression has become a, an attachment to alcoholism. You know, that you, you, these days and time, you almost don't have it without some depression being hooked to it. Uh, of course, it does have a little something to do with getting insurance payment for going into treatment, but nonetheless, you know, it is a very, very common kind of a problem to deal with. Let me, let me just sort of make some some uh, general remarks to start with about about sponsorship. I, mean, I believe it is a vital thing. Uh, I've never been without one except for that first little period when I came in to the program and didn't, didn't even know how to spell it, much less find one. <laughs> and then then I got one, and I've never been without one since. And and uh, I've had three, and uh, still got my third one. And I'm very, very grateful. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a really lucky guy in a lot of ways. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how you how you weigh it, but I've got to have one of the longest and, and strongest sponsorship lines I know anything about. I'm 45 years sober, and I've got a sponsor sober longer than me, and he has a sponsor longer than him. And uh, I mean, that, that's unbelievable of, of having that kind of – and what a great feeling – to know that I got two old relics like that above me. 
And uh, I, I tell you, an interesting thing happens that you can look forward to if you're not already there. As you get older in the program, finding sponsorship becomes more and more of a challenge. Uh, you know, like I'm right now, I'm, as I mentioned earlier, I'm the oldest uh, male member in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in North Carolina. And uh, you know, I sort of have a, I sort of have a, not a job description, but I kind of have a, a criteria for what I look for in a sponsor. This is just me. But I want a sponsor that's senior than me, for, for one thing. It's not absolutely vital, but it's, it's vital to me. I want one that's senior just because it just feels good, just feels right. Uh, I want one that's active in all legacies of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I'm somebody who believes that you can get locked up in the steps so tightly that you get almost as isolated in recovery as you were in the, in the alcoholism. And so I think you can really get into that kind of staring at your navel, checking your emotional pulse every 30 minutes. And uh, so, so I want somebody that's active in all legacies, you know, that, that certainly recovery is the heart and soul. But if I don't learn unity so that I can connect with my fellow members and with the world around me, you know, I'm still in a heap of trouble. And then service. You know, I believe any, any, any recovery that does not involve a healthy, vigorous service life is a recovery that's shortchanged and misses a lot of where the real joy comes from. So, so I want somebody who, who, who embodies that kind of stuff in the way they, they function. Uh, I want somebody that, that I like. I've never had a sponsor I didn't like. Some people say if you don't hate him, you got the wrong one. I couldn't disagree more. I've never had a sponsor that I didn't like, that I didn't like to hang out with, that I didn't respect. <clears throat> he used the term heroes. My sponsor has always been kind of heroes to me. They're folk that I really look up to. And um, so I, I, I've sort of got that general criteria for, for what, I'm, what I'm looking for in one. I, I've got a way, and I'll give you this just sort of background so that it goes into this thing of how you function in sponsorship. If it isn't a, a well-developed marriage, so to speak, uh, it's not going to have a lot of value. You know? And so I've got a, a, a certain thing that I work out with, 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 I don't have much experience, but I, I make this standard in, 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 in when I set up a sponsorship with somebody, either somebody I'm sponsoring or with my sponsor. There's three things that I want understood with, with my sponsor, and I've got it understood with the fellow who has that job today. One, my sponsor is the only person on this planet, the only one who's invited into my life unannounced. Nobody else has that permission. But he's somebody, it's his job. I've asked him to step into my life anytime about anything. Absolutely no hold part. And he's the person that I will listen to no matter what he's got to say. I won't interrupt him. Uh, now I might argue with him later. But, <laughs> but I'm going to hear him first. And, uh, and, the, uh, and I won't always do what he said, but I will hear what he says. That's, that's what I want him to tell me. Uh, and he's the only one I've got. I mean, he's the person I'll call when the chips are down. I may talk to a thousand other people, but when the chips are down, there is no question where I'm going. And so that's sort of a, a fix I have on a job description for a, cha for a, for a, for a, a sponsor. Yeah, you know, I, I, you know, I sometimes think that that we uh, that we do a disservice to the to the sponsor by by making a a too great expectation on what it ought to be. It sounds sometimes like we get to thinking that the sponsor ought to be a combination of of Adolf Hitler and Sigmund Freud. You know, that, <laughs> that, that, that you got to be a real kind of rock 'em sock 'em jump on you guy, and then have tremendous insight and understanding, be able to respond to any problem no matter what. And that's a little unrealistic. You know. A sponsor to me is a fairly practical thing. It's somebody 
that fits that description that I trust, who is somebody I can talk with about where I'm going, can share their experience with me. And, and so I don't put those kind of real, uh, uh, real glaring kinds of expectations on the guy. I, I want it to be that kind of a sound, solid, functioning relationship. Um, the, uh, you know, when, I, when I set up sponsorship, and I do this with people I sponsor as, as well as when I sponsor, I always make it a very serious transaction. You know, I always have a private meeting, a scheduled meeting, so that we go in and usually meet for an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, and basically what we want to do is solidify that relationship, agree on what it is that we're looking for, what the expectations are, you know, so that there is no surprise in how we do business. If we're going to meet with uh, with regularity, or like at six o'clock in the morning, the cruelty that he imposes on people. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it is, we make an agreement, and then that's the agreement, and they become the terms under which we operate. And and so, I, I like for sponsorship to have a real kind of a sound a business-like thing. You know. It, it's what I'm dealing with is my life, and I don't want to be frivolous and casual about something that may be my lifeline at times, and I want it to be sound. I want it to be solid. I don't want it to be up for grabs. Uh, so the way, I, the way I look at it, so I need to keep it with that realistic expectations, uh, based somewhat on that stuff I was talking about earlier when I was trying to help start AA in town, my job, my job as a sponsor is to help the new person that I'm working with know that there's a solution. Clearly know that there's a solution. And just as clearly know that I'm not it. That I'm not it. And that came somewhat from watching people drop like flies when I left the town. See, I had not let them know that there was a solution. All they knew is that I was a wonderful person. And, and that's not enough. Yeah, that's not enough. This illness is far too deadly for that kind of a, of a little, little lightweight approach. And so when, when I, it sounds real simple to say that, but knowing that there's a solution doesn't mean just throwing some words at them. It means having them to have enough understanding that they know how to put that in motion. Sometimes it takes a, a, a short time. Sometimes it takes a long time. Um, I, I just say one more th one, one more thing about this uh, generally about this thing of of, of of discontinuing sponsorship. I don't like the term fired. I, I, it's just a, that's just not a good term for disrupting a spiritual relationship. It, it just doesn't fit <clears throat> because that's. I mean, we're not employing somebody. I mean, it's just something we agree in good good faith to try to carry out, and sometimes it just doesn't work. I I don't. I don't commonly make it a practice to discontinue until I'm absolutely convinced that it no longer has utility. And, uh, and, and sometimes the, the kind of thing that I look at in, in discontinuing is, like, well, I'll give you one, one example of a guy I had that, um, I, he's, a, he's a wonderful fellow, he's sober 20 years, well, he's dry 20 years. And, and he was a guy that, that he, was, he was one of the first people that I, that I stopped for therapeutic reasons. <laughs> Lack of therapy, I think, was probably. I worked with this guy, and, and he was a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a real verbal kind of guy who really believes that he can make a living doing nothing. I mean, he just thinks he can skim the world forever. And horrendous background. Loves to do fourth and fifth steps. If you ever want to do a seminar on fourth and fifth steps, I'll be glad to send him up here and, and do it. <laughs> but that guy is absolutely fabulous and just loves to talk about his last operation. He'll, he'll beat you to death with that. And loves to do fifth steps. But when it comes to six and seven where you start thinking about change, it becomes a different issue. And I worked with this dude for nine years, and I listened to more fifth steps than I had patience to endure. And, uh, 
and never saw one ounce of any effort at at recovery, you know, at trying to do anything about it. And he came to me one day, I'd been beating on him about a men's, came to me one day, he said, man, you're going to be proud of me. I said, thank God. What happened? He said, he said, I made some amends. Well, I knew every amend he owed from all those fifth steps. I said, for God's sakes, tell me what he did. And so he told me it was about something he jumped on to college. And, and so I said, well, tell me how it came about. Literally what happened, two policemen armed came to his door to get the money. <laughs> I said, man, man, that ain't even close, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 he, and he aggravated that with one thing that uh, I, I try not to be a terribly arbitrary guy and to set up just harsh judgments, but there's one thing that I will not sponsor, and that's somebody who jumps newcomers. I'm just not going to do it. <laughs> because I, honest to God, don't know of anything more cruel <coughs> excuse me, than taking a wounded newcomer and depriving him of the right to recover. He said, I just won't, I won't deal with that. And so this guy aggravated the case. I was going to stop anyway, but that made it a lot easier. And I stopped sponsoring that guy. I gave him several months' notice because he's not a handsome beast. I, I knew he was going to have a hard time. I said, buddy, you're going to have to find you somebody. Gave him a date certain. And uh, on date certain, he still hadn't found anybody. But I was out of here. you know. And so, and now he's 11 years later. He's 20 years sober. He's, he still called me once in a while. And he tells me a lot of wonderful stuff. And I pay absolutely no attention to it because none of it has any connection to reality. And so I listen to it like the wind blowing. And I'm cordial with him. And I hang up. And uh, wait for him to call me again. And, and so sometimes, you know, in, 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 a, in a case like that, that was because I saw the lack of, 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 you know, the guy just not willing to do the stuff. And in a case like that, I have no, you know, I mean, I don't like doing that. But it was, what I'm doing is perpetuating a myth when I continue to allow sponsorship to be used to describe a relationship. That's a myth. There is no sponsorship. And so I'm not willing to condone you know, something where there's nothing going on. There are other times when, when the, 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 the relationship just becomes dysfunctional, where people uh, just won't follow the agreements and get more and more lax and slack about maintaining contact and maintaining viable dialogue. And so in a case like that, uh, when there's no response to repeated warnings, I'll just say, you know, I think it's gone far enough. And I'm not mad at you. I'll be your friend, but I'm not going to call it sponsorship. Because I think there is a viable dialogue that has to occur for that to have meaning. And and so I, those kinds of things I put on, on their standards. But we'll come and get Don talk about this a little bit, and then we'll come back on, on the thing about dealing with it in, in the heading of that uh, medication stuff. But that is a big issue and it's one that is well worth talking about a little bit. Uh, but let me let me get Don to talk about that a little bit. <clears throat> and uh, you don't want to work past quitting time. Even though we stole 45 minutes on breaks. <laughs> <laughs> I've been sorting through this one of late because I've come to dislike the word sponsor. Because it doesn't mean anything anymore. It means too much. And I had, a, I had an experience to set it off, and then I'll tell you what I think about sponsorship. <coughs> it's part of my battle with ritual, by the way. I was at a little conference in uh, Ohio last year. I'm a host was a young fellow about a year. From a sponsorship line that says... Call me before you go to the bathroom in the morning. Total taking over your life. And uh, nice enough people, but that was where he came from. I was 33 years sober, and as we began to inter interact during the weekend, it became clear to him the 
but I'm do something a little different. And so he asked me, because part of the part of the ritual that this group goes through is, I have a sponsor whose name is, whose name is, whose name is, and all the scalps are taken off the wall and put out there for you to look at. And the implication, the way it's done, if you're not doing it this way, you're not doing it right. Get away from me. I hate to say it, but that goes on. In <coughs> So he asked me, do I have a sponsor? And I had to honestly say, please describe to me what you mean by that so I can answer the question. And when he was finished describing it, I said, by what you described, no, I don't. And I watched his face. It truly disturbed me. Because I was a living lie. You can't stay sober this long unless you do it this way. But I had. And I don't want to ever be put in that spot again. So I started investigating, what, what the hell does that really mean? <clears throat> All I know about it is the way I was sponsored. Now my experience is a little different because we only had one meeting a week, and we weren't even allowed to go, go to that one until we have been through the steps. And we weren't fit for that meeting. They had real people come in from the outside. And until we had something to say, which goes back to where sponsorship came from. You know, it's not in this book. It's described, but it's not mentioned as a word. A sponsor in any organization is the guy who says, guys who are already members, old Tom here would like to become a member. And the guys say, well, we're not too sure about him. <laughs> Tell you what we'll do. If you will be responsible for him for a little while, until he learns how we operate, so when he shows up in the meeting, he don't screw it all up. You teach him what it is we do. And then we'll all get together and let him do it and see if he got it, and then you're off the hook. That's kind of the way it is in the elks and the moose and, and the way it was here, too. Okay? So that's one, one piece of sponsorship that I looked at as a word, one description of it. I am responsible to the new person to show them what it is we do here. Now, I'm having difficulty these days because instead of showing them what we do, I'm teaching them our lingo instead. So in three or four weeks, they've got the lingo, and when you talk to them, they sound all right, and they're dying. But they sound all right. We got the lingo. We didn't show them what it all we did. I came from a group that showed me, well, let me describe sponsorship in here. And then I'll get on with it. Because it is described here pretty clearly. Mm -hmm. In the forward of the first edition, it's described. We of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from the seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. To show other alcoholics precisely how we've recovered is the main purpose of this book. That describes it. My job as a sponsor, as was done with me, they showed me precisely how they had recovered. Didn't lie to me. It was a strange thing that I saw. My life was more important to them than anything else, but they didn't care if I died. Now, it's one of the first <laughs> apparent conflicts in the CNAA. Your life matters more to me than mine, but I don't care if you die. Man, yeah, live with it. Show me precisely what they had done. Now, we were in a limited environment. They couldn't do a whole lot. There were restrictions on your time and your movement. But part of what they did do was begin immediately working with others. Immediately. As I go through this book, I see the same thing. Everything about AA is immediate. As soon as you have some information that may save her life, go tell her. You don't have to wait until you've done everything by the number. She might die between now and then. In fact, quite often, the person with three weeks of sobriety is more effective on a call than I am because they can't believe me. They can't even hear me. And besides, I talk kind of fluffy. <laughs> Except on a 12-step call. Talk loud, buddy. Talk, talk loud. loud. Yeah, talk loud. <laughs> <laughs> Bill uses the word protege in the book. And that's my understanding of the sponsorship relationship. A mentor and a protege. 
protege of somebody new who wants to do what this person is doing, and the mentor takes time out of their otherwise busy life to walk gently with a new person and show them what it is we do and how we do it, to befriend them. But it's a, it's a, a relationship of equals. From the very beginning, it's a relationship of equals. Now, taking that background, the way I sponsor today and have for years in the free world is very simple. There are instructions in here about what to do when somebody asks you if you'll work with them. There's some hoops to jump through, first of all. Let's say you've heard me and decide you want what I have. So you come to me after the meeting and say, will you be my sponsor? My response is, my home group meets on Friday morning at 6 o'clock at St. Joseph's Hospital in the Aspen room right next to the cafeteria. Why don't you meet me there and we'll talk about it. I want to know, first of all, if you really mean business. And if you show up at my group at 6 in the morning on Friday, you mean business. I don't have to question you or interrogate you. If you don't, we can't talk about it. So I'll just wait. Now, when we talk about it, I'm like Tom. I, there are certain things we need to know. What's going to go on here? Well, I'm going to show you precisely how I recovered through this book, which means we have to find a time and a place that we both agree on, and it has to be regular. The first lesson that I got was be regular. Now, you can come once a week. You can come once a month. You can come every day. I don't care as long as we establish that. As long as you understand what we're going to do here is go through this. We're also going to do other things, but during this period of time, be quiet. If you knew anything, you wouldn't be here. Okay. Bissy, I'm going to read this to you and then share with you how it is that I was brought to this, and then we'll talk about it. And then you'll get assignments like I did. And they're not other people's assignments. They come right out of here. This damn thing understands us completely. We're too dumb to even know when to pray, so it tells us when. <laughs> and it tells us how. And it tells us when not to pray. When you get off your ass and go do something. It tells you what question to ask and when to ask it. I mean, they're really very clear. I'm left to my own devices. I'll screw it up. So we will do that. Now, I believe that I'm responsible for exposing you to the wholeness of AA. I have been influenced deeply by people that I could not put the word sponsor on that have had effect on my life so profound it changed me. Bob White was one. He was one. Well, Wes Parrish. There were some old timers in this operation when I got here that were giants. We don't need giants anymore, by the way. Any social movement that's getting started needs giants to break down the barriers. But we just need leaders now. <clears throat> but anyway, I'm going to expose you at the proper time to my mentors. I have them all on tape. You'll get to hear their voices. I love reading Chuck's book. But I'd much rather listen to the talk he gave that the book came from. There's something about Chuck's hee hee hee. <laughs> Just give it to me. <laughs> so I will expose you to that. And at the proper time, and you don't know when it is. I do, because I've been practicing this a while. One of my favorite things, because I get asked to talk locally from time to time, in the fifth step one time. Bill and I were fist stepping, and I had to talk at the treatment center. And he was ultra sick, so it took a long time. And we went through when it was time to go. And he didn't know how I operate. We fist stepped all the way out. We got to the place. And I informed him then that he was the 10 minute speaker. Right in the middle of fist step. It's time you got involved. And what better time than when you're all cranked up? <laughs> You're, you're temporarily telling the truth. <laughs> Get him, <'em>, kid. <laughs> and 
as a sponsor, I am to be not only a mentor, but a guide. I've been over this trail. I'm, I know the difference between a snake and a stick. And on this path, there really are no snakes. There's only sticks. But some of them have thorns in them. Example. I got a kid that's been in and out. Finally got him through some inventory. And a good part of the inventory, because he's young, was the way he mistreated women. Okay. And we got some very specific amends to make. But the biggest one is he's got to change how he treats women. And when we went into the inventory, he had spotted a little filly that intrigued him. And I said, well, perhaps you ought to leave that alone until we're through here. And he took that direction. And as soon as we finished the fist up, he says, can I call her now? <laughs> I said, well, if you think you can have a date with her and not hurt her, yeah. But you got to ask yourself, can you call her and have a date and not hurt her? Called me back just before I came down here and says, I'm having difficulty. How in the world am I going to have a date if I have to worry all the time about whether I'm hurting her or not? I said, well, it isn't time then, is it? Okay. I don't tell them you can't. I suggest until you're straight with the thing. Because if you continue to harm people, you're surely going to wreck again. A change has to take place. Amend doesn't mean I'm sorry. It means change. I changed what I did here, and I changed what I do from here on. Uh, I want you to meet and interact with my family. I don't know whether you're going to have a family or not, but you might as well find out what they're about. I get the psychopaths, by the way. <laughs> well, I do, because I know who they are. They're just frightened. Uh, and my children, because we communicate in my house, know that's who's sitting on the couch. <laughs> they also know they're perfectly safe, because I'm there. And there's no question about it. I cannot psycho anybody that comes into my house. Uh, don't pull your bluff on me. <laughs> 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 Mainly, I absolutely adore them. I just love them like sick babies, and so they're and they respect my home. Never have I had any trouble, and I've had some bad people in that house. Never any trouble. We start, and again, it's because of the way I was. I've got a special room. Some of you've been in it. Uh, it's a very private place. And this is where we're going to do our work. But first, we're going to start on the couch near the front door and the stairs that come down for a couple reasons. You're not bringing your shitty attitude into my room, first of all. <laughs> okay, it's a spiritual place. You ain't messing with it. You haven't earned the right to go into my room yet. Sorry, but that's the truth. More importantly, I want you to see how me and my family get ready for the day. Uh, this one particular time was wonderful. I've got two daughters that then were in their early teens. And if you think it's hard getting out of bed when you're alone, try to get out of bed and get ready when you got two teenage girls and a wife in the house getting ready for work. Uh, just sit down and wait. <laughs> Might as well have somebody come over because I can't get in the bathroom until after seven. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, the lunatic and I are sitting there. This is one who later threatened him on driveway to kill me. He got distressed because it's on the truth. He, he didn't, obviously, but, but we're sitting there, and my 13 year old comes tipping down the stairs, and I've raised a mouthy one. One who has attitude and writes letters to the editor and gets right in your face. And I encourage that. Her sister's a wimp, but I love her anyway. <laughs> she comes tripping down the stairs and she said, <clears throat> Excuse me with attitude. And I'm reading the book. We're involved in life and death here. And uh, shocked me. And I said, well, What do you want? I was surprised she would interrupt this meaningful thing going on here. She says, you know, I live here too, and you haven't introduced me to this person. <laughs> we both got a lesson. And 
human behavior than in rudeness. So I introduced her, and she says, okay, bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> I want to expose you. If you have come to me to ask me to sponsor you, I want to expose you to the things that, that I made me what I am. Every now and then, one of the guys that come with me on one of these deals or to a conference, I never ask them to. If they ever ask me, I'll see to it they get to go. I try to get them to pay for their own ticket. They should be self-supporting through their own contributions. If they can't do that, i got plenty of frequent flyer miles. And uh, they don't belong to me. They belong to my family, and they're part of the family, so off we go. <laughs> They get their own room. I'm not sleeping with no lunatics. <laughs> <laughs> Unless the conference is paying for it, <laughs> put us where you want. Just make sure there's two beds. <laughs> now, that's the regimented part. I believe this firmly. When new people come to me, they're incapable of surrendering to God. They either hate him, don't believe in him, or confused about it. But surrender is the absolute bottom line requirement for movement forward. You've got to surrender the old way entirely. So I let them surrender to me. Six o'clock, my house, make it a sacrifice. This is me. Until the first time we meet. Then they surrender to process. And in the process, they're able then, in time, to surrender to God, and now that's when I let them go. We still continue on with my exposing, but from here on, you can't count on me. And the way that works out, because that may happen at the third step, it may not be until the fifth or sixth step. I watch for it. We have had a rigid schedule. You must be there every Tuesday at six. That's the deal. Once we finish the fifth, sixth, and seventh step, you no longer have an appointment. In fact, back at the fourth step, you no longer have an appointment. You go home and you make a list. As soon as your list is done, call me, and I will make time for you. But I'm not putting any restraints on this thing because this has to come from within, not from me. And if it takes you a long time making your list, when you call, I will remind you that you've accessed spiritual power here because everything from the third step to the seventh step is all part of one prayer. It's one spiritual activity. Don't wait too long. So that's kind of how I do that. And then once that's all done, take this inventory list, make a new list. I'm a listing person. All the people here, you owe men to. Make that list. Then add anybody you can think of, because if you met with them, you messed with them. That's what my sponsor told me. Okay. Then I was given an exercise that I will give you. Go back to your private place. Take this list and look at it. Close your eyes and picture each one of these people in your mind. And see if you can feel a willingness in your heart to look them right in the eye and say to them, I've been wrong and I've harmed you. Would you please tell me what I have to do to get the books to balance? I got free locked up in a penitentiary cell doing that. Lift, literally lifted from my chair and set free. Willingness is the demonstrable sign of the presence of God. It is so powerful that the very instant I'm willing to be changed, I have already been changed. It's just instant. Then I kind of go over that list with him. My sponsor did with me. He had me, because I couldn't get out and make amends. They wouldn't let me out and they wouldn't let you in. <laughs> he said, well, some of them we can deal with by mail, and some of them you're going to have to go see. And I learned a very important thing. I get to live with what I did, sometimes for a long period of time. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not guilty or ashamed about it. But I have some pain in my heart over some of the things that I did. And I should have. It keeps me from getting arrogant. It helps me to understand. I made a guy so mad the other day, Tom. He said, what do I get at the end of this? I said, compassion. 
<laughs> I said, you son of a bitch. Can <laughs> I get something better than that? No. <laughs> Compassion. <laughs> okay. But bring me your list, whether you do it on cards or yellow paper or toilet paper. I don't care. Bring me who you harmed, how you harmed them, and what you think you can do to make that right. It's part of this process now that I'm free is to help the people that I harmed get free too. If I harmed you, I put you in a bad emotional state. I need to give you the opportunity to smack me down or forgive me or whatever you need to do. And all most people ever want is for me to come and say, I was wrong. I've been waiting for years to hear me just say that. Then you're pretty much on your own. Get on about it. If you wish, I will show you how I do the 10th step, but so does this. The 10th, 11th, and 12th step kind of overlap, particularly the 10th and 11th. I do not spend a whole lot of time showing people how to meditate. You really don't want to try what I do today. It's different than what I did last month. Uh, it's been different all along the way. I will share that with you if you wish. But you're kind of on your own now as far as this program goes. Now you and I together will go out seeking. I take one of the guys I sponsor to a prison meeting that I'm committed to. Third Tuesday of every month. We drive for two hours, talk with the lunatics for an hour, and drive two hours back home. He's getting exposed to that. I take them to assemblies. I talk to them. We have a traditions and concepts meeting at my house every Wednesday night at 530. Well, we're going to go through that. They need to see the whole scope of the deal. Uh, <clears throat> I've become what's known as an elder statesman in service. I think I'm just a cranky elder statesman. <laughs> my voice is heard to the people that I sponsor the very nature of the fact that I became a trustee and did all this public stuff, whether well, I didn't get any prestige from it, but you all think I did. And the people at the assembly think I'm all knowing. So we got a problem. When I show up in assembly, there's a group of people who believe if I say it, it's gospel. There's another group of people who believe if I say it, it's got to be bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> so I found out how to be really effective is to send ten people that I've been working with there and my voice is heard ten times and nobody knows I said it it's hurting uh, not that I don't go to assemblies but not much anymore uh, I'm still very active in general service if I sponsor you, you must know that. I will expose you to it. You may not fit in general service. You may fit in other, some other kind of service. I don't like Tom. Service is where the rich part of recovery comes. I know what I'm supposed to do here now today with you guys. My real responsibility, my real job, is to make sure that after I'm dead and gone, 50 years from now, that whoever comes through that door gets the same shot I did. That means I have to stay actively involved in serving the fellowship as a whole beyond anything that I want. I just finished taking on general service. People I love dearly. Some of them are really mad at me, and I don't care. This fourth edition big book has a statement in it that's so outrageous I could not sit home and not say something about it. In the foreword to the fourth edition big book, there's a statement that says, Fundamentally, the only difference between an electronic meeting and a home group around the corner is one of format. How many people are going to get killed by that one? So don't worry about it. It's been taken out. Five people. That's all it took was five people to write a letter saying, this is outrageous. Put this on the agenda. And let's let the conference see this. I don't think they're going to like it. And they didn't. <laughs> Right or wrong, as a sponsor and as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, I don't care how it goes. The end result really truly doesn't matter. What matters is that we keep talking about things. This fellowship will survive only as long as we're all talking about things. And the longer we talk, the better chance we have of surviving. If you 
you need to vote, you haven't talked long enough. <laughs> okay. And the stuff we did in, in the 80s that solved all the problems are brand new problems again. We're trying to solve them all over again. That's as it should be. Each new group of people needs to resolve the problems. We don't want solutions, we want resolutions. Constantly bring them in. Our group inventory covers that. The group I belong to had a closed meeting. I frankly think it should be an open meeting. So at every group inventory, I brought up, let's open it up. And one of the guys that sponsored said, no, let's keep it closed. And we engaged in the battle. Because the new people who had come during that period of time weren't part of the decision. They need to be part of the decision. You become part of my family, if you wish. You know my wife, you know my children. We get together in my backyard. You don't have to clean up dog crap, because we don't have a dog. <laughs> <laughs> but we get together, and we become part of Alcoholics Anonymous in our respective occupations, homes, and affairs. But this is where it really happens gather in the backyard. Some of you know about our Fellowship of the Spirit conference every year. It's held up right around 10,000 feet. It starts on Thursday. So on Wednesday night, we hold a potluck. Both so you can all get together, mainly so you can stay at 5,000 feet for a while. So when you get to 10,000, you're not going to get oxygen. You're pushing sick. And we get the benefit. The main thing sponsorship does is for me, I'm constantly addressing my own alcoholism. I'm never very far away from it. I'm explaining to you what happened to me back in 1953 and in 66 and in 67, and it's fresh to me. I challenge every week, I challenge maybe I'm not an alcoholic. Because that's one of those rocks that, that there's a worm under in everybody's head. It's wonderful because I get to go through this thing over and over and over and have made a host of friends. It's an embarrassment where I go. When we take a vacation, we can't tell people where we're going. Everybody gets hurt because they want us to come stay at their house. I love you, but I don't want to stay at your house. That's why I bought that van. I'm going to go camping. <laughs> Except for Broussards. I like Broussards. Got a lake out back and we go fishing in the morning at 6. Yeah. Catch soccer lake perch and have them for breakfast. I'll stay with Bobby. Yeah. Mentor and protege more defines it. Now, if we can understand that's what I mean by sponsorship, then we can use the word. And it's that way with many things in Alcoholics Anonymous today. The words that have no meanings because they have too many meanings. I was at a meeting probably 15 years ago when it first hit me and I started my little personal thing about not becoming ritualized. A lady was sharing in a meeting, and it was a good sharing. She came to a place, she said, I had this particular problem, I did a quick tent, and it's over. It's gone, and moved on. I said, whoa, wait a minute, what'd she just say? She did a quick tent. What the hell is a quick tent? Now, I've been around a while, I know she meant she had done a 10-step inventory. What the hell does that mean? Did she do it the way the big book shows, the way Hazleton shows, the way some weird way? And if I'm a new person, what the hell's a quick tenth? And I began to try not to get into the lingo, but to describe the experience. Because you had to convince me. I didn't trust anybody. I stayed here because I watched these three guys after the school that talked so good and sounded so good. I watched them on the yard. And I watched them on the tears. And I watched them as they moved through that penitentiary. I watched unselfish courage demonstrated by my sponsor. They were messing with our school one time. And this was a shocker. This guy was cool. He was spiritual and never got upset by anything he was doing life. And all of a sudden, the administration <laughs> decides they're going to mess with our study school. And he freaked out. That's what He got mad. That's what he did. Said, I'm going to go see Wilson, who was the associate warden of treatment. And he stomped down the stairs and headed for the warden's office. And I know 
He's at it for the whole tour. He's at it. <laughs> you don't go stomping into the warden's office raising hell when you got a number on your chest. He's going to the hole. <laughs> Some period of time passed, and he came back, and he was happy, and they quit messing with us. And somehow I understood I had just seen true courage in action. It would have been so much easier for him to just say, let it go, then he wouldn't have to tie up Saturday and Sunday anymore. He didn't need that thing for himself. He did this for us. He became a spokesman for those who had no voice and risked going to the hole and having all his privileges taken away for us. That's the kind of courage I want. That's the kind of courage that I must have because I'm going to be asked along the way to go places that are really scary like church basements <laughs> and Masonic halls. <laughs> <laughs> Safest place I've ever been in town was at Harnett. I was in the middle of a, it, it's kind of a maximum, minimum, maximum security prison. The, the fences are all over the damn place. They don't want anybody out. And I'm in the center of it at night. And my mother and I have been talking. My mother gets nervous because I do a lot of prison work. I have to remind her mom, the time to get nervous is when I was one, not now. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm standing surrounded by the bad guys in the middle of the night. And a feeling came over me that I was in the safest place I have ever been in the world. Nothing could happen to me there. So uh, I, I want people to experience what I've experienced. I don't want you to have my experience, but I want to expose you to my experience. Uh, what else? That, that kind of covers it. As you are where you are, that's all I'll take you. And whatever you want to do, do it. I actually have people come to me after I've shown them how to write inventory, and they didn't write it that way. And I listen to them anyway. Man, do I care? This is the best way. They'll get back to this eventually. The big thing is they made an effort. Who the hell am I to diminish that effort? So I'll listen. I'll listen. I've got nothing else to do. I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> the reason that I've been able to do what I've been able to do is because of sponsorship. When I was trustee, I was gone 50 weekends a month, many times during the week. 50 weekends a month? Or 50 weekends a year. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I've got by the <laughs> No, I've never been so busy in my life. <laughs> and at that time, all of a sudden, I have no less than five people I'm taking through the big book. I'm thinking, this is an overload, God. What the hell are you doing to me? Until I realized the reason I was able to do this other stuff was because I did this every morning. I shared my experience with a new person and helped them along the way. And that's why this other job could be done. Without that, it's nothing. I get very disturbed when I hear service people say, well, I'm getting ready to rotate, so I think I'll go back to my group and make coffee. If you have to go back to your group, you're in trouble. And uh, they don't let me make coffee. I make Navy coffee. <laughs> Even spoons won't stand up. With I don't want to see the hair just spurt out of your head. <laughs> Anyhow, that, I don't want to just wander on. This is important. What do you mean by what you just said? You have to go back to your group. If you're in service and you leave your group to do service, you let service replace your group activity, you're in trouble. Yeah. You need to be a member of your group and then serve from there, not the other way around. I've seen people who let service become their recovery. And they're really hard to be around. <laughs> For me, it depends Repeat on which aspect. <coughs> Long distance sponsorship. This sponsor lives in Pennsylvania. <clears throat> How do I look on that rather than one to one? It's very difficult, for one thing. If the piece of sponsorship is me taking you through the step work, we have to do that one-to-one. -one. That 
can't be done long distance effectively. If the sponsorship relationship was one of two peers who are needing a mentor or, uh, I mean, I've gone some places you haven't gone, you're getting ready to go, we can do that on the telephone. Uh, I can sponsor people when we're talking about principles on the telephone. But the step work has to be done face to face for me. It just doesn't work any other way. The rest of it, yeah, there's no problem with that. I have mentors too, by the way. I had a lot of different kinds of sponsors I've had. When I came out of the penitentiary, a little guy named Harry, I asked him to sponsor me. For one reason, Harry was elegant. Harry knew how to behave in one <coughs> society. And I'm not stupid, and I wasn't raised in a hut somewhere. But in addition to, to his program, Harry took me to plays, to the symphony. He took me to the Broadmoor, where there's more silverware than anybody could ever use. <laughs> Taught me how to behave in that environment. And gave me that really simple thing. How do you know which one to use? Well, you start from here, and then work your way in. Geez, that's fun. Harry died of an overdose because Harry didn't like to use the program, but he was very good for me. He taught me some things. Uh, one of my other sponsors, he and I became such close friends within two weeks that I fired him as my sponsor, and we've been co-sponsoring each other for years. Uh, Let me mention one thing about the, 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 the geographic thing. I, I mentioned earlier that... Uh, as you get older in the program, finding somebody that fits the criteria becomes a real challenge. And uh, yeah, when, the last time I needed a, needed a sponsor when my my, uh, my my guy developed Alzheimer's and I had a little bit of lead time, I just started drawing circles about who was in catchment areas. I hit pay dirt 3,000 miles away. And uh, I would prefer having somebody in my home group but it's a matter of what are you going to compromise, and uh, and so in in those cases, you know, you certainly there are times when I sponsor people in many parts of the country. I make it I make it a point to avoid people in early recovery, like I was talking about, because it is tremendously important to have immediate access, to have that accountable relationship, the the tight thing. I wouldn't begin to take on somebody in early recovery. But it's one of those things that becomes a necessity. Like right now, you know, my sponsor is probably going to outlive me, but he may not. And I already know who my next one will be if I have to. Now, he doesn't know it. <laughs> Nobody knows it. But I know it because I don't want to be with that one. It's not called I'm hanging off a cliff. It's just a part of what makes me a whole member. And so when you get to this point, you, you have to think that way. Uh, otherwise, you're going to be compromising something that's not compromised. Let me mention one other thing for, for, uh, for, for, uh, for what it's worth. The thing that Don just described is a, is a, is a wonderful, ideal way to, to, to work with somebody going through the program. Um, for a long time, I was really frustrated <laughs> with the revolving door in AA, which was just watching people come through here and not even get touched much and just going back out. And so I was really hunting for some ways to more effectively grab folk and work with them. I was looking for anything. Now I've done, I've done taking people through steps a lot of ways. One-on-one, -on -one, do it 14 weeks, you, know, just, just, you name it, and I've, I've, I've tried it. All of them work to some extent. And then one day, in fact, Don and I, were, uh, he kept telling me about something he was doing that made sense, but I'm a kind of a visual person. I said, why don't you show me what you're talking about? And we sat down, literally sat down in the corridor of a hotel and grabbed four or five other uh, outstanding alcoholics and pulled them in. And, and uh, <laughs> I know you remember, he just opened the book. And he said, well, here's what we do. And uh, opened the book, read a sentence, and I had to break up the meeting because we just got going with the thing. It was that simple. And at, at that point, that made sense to me, you know, uh, that, that you could take a group of people 
and do what he's talking about, and you could do it in a group setting. And so I started, uh, he was my mentor then. And, and so I, I didn't have a clue about what you did other than hotel quarter. And so when I, when I had something I wanted to discuss, I'd get on the phone and say, now what do you do about this? And he'd tell me and we'd do it. Well, I've been doing that for several years now. I, I'm not a magic bullet thinker. I, I know better than that. But in all the years that we've been doing that, we've never had a single person who's gone through the whole experience who's drunk again. Now, I'm not a magic bullet guy, but I do believe that it's almost impossible to get drunk if I follow this thing the way it's laid out and practice it. Uh, so I think it's a powerful kind of a thing. One, one reason, that, uh, two reasons I've just mentioned that I really like about that. One is that uh, I'm a pretty heavily committed guy, too. I've got an awful lot of things that I'm involved in, all of which are important. And the, so I, I have to fight for how to deal with the people I want to deal with. And, and so this group approach really makes something realistic for me that otherwise wouldn't be. Uh, I just can't afford the time at this point to do the one-on-one. -on -one. And in all honesty... If I had the luxury of time, I would not do it one-on-one. Uh, 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 -on -one. I'd do it in a group. Because what I find is that the group magnifies the power. And that, that you never know whose experience is going to be really meaningful. So periodically, uh, I just finished one, lasted a year and a half. And, uh, and, and, and so I just periodically do it with people I'm sponsoring and others that might want to join in. The last one, a year and a half, we finished with 30 people. And that's just incredible to me that, that, uh, that gee whiz, you couldn't think drunk could stand still that long, you know, much less make that kind of commitment. So there are a lot of ways to do stuff, and, and, uh, and I'll always be, be grateful for that one because they've, they've made a tremendous difference with a lot of people. Uh, we you know where that came from? Where? Max Sheeter. Oh, yeah, yeah. Who was that's sponsored right. by exactly. his sponsor. Yeah, and it's right. all it's all here anyway. It's a small family. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's spend just a yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, we get inundated with requests for temporary sponsorship. Uh, comment on that. I just make a real brief comment. I don't dismiss anything. The uh, that sponsorship, like Don was saying, covers a multitude of sins. And it doesn't mean, you know, that they're all variations of sponsorship. Certainly the kind we've been talking about, classic sponsorship, where it's that one-on-one -on -one with Mr. Wonderful, is, uh, that's, that's the Cadillac. But in this day and time, we get an awful lot of people that almost overwhelm the resource. And so I think temporary sponsorship can serve a purpose. In our group, we do it. We make it available. What we encourage is that we do it for a set period of time, 60 days. And the function during that 60 days is to help the person get prepared to engage in sponsorship sooner the better. And at the end of 60 days, it concludes either with, with permanent sponsorship or movement toward that. And in the course of it, what we do is just the obvious stuff. We show them how to get to meetings, give them access to somebody they can comfortably call. So I, I think there's utility for it. We changed the words on the mic because we looked at that as an area. Because this is coming out of prisons and treatment. And the sponsorship relationship is almost a holy thing. It's a spiritual thing. It's not fit temporary. So we changed the word to temporary contact, and the function is the same. You get a contact, then you get exposed to the fellowship in your area, then you find a sponsor. But this contact will be your guide for a while. I think that, that eliminates that confusion that yeah. I'm being sponsored when I'm not. Good yeah. point. Let me read a couple quick things here and then back to Tom. <clears throat> These are descriptions of sponsoring. Shift it. When you get through it, go into that medication thing a little bit. Okay. <clears throat> we search our acquaintance for a closed mouth, understanding friend. I'm on page 74, but I'm skipping. You're not going to keep up with me. <laughs> it is important that he be able to keep a confidence, that he fully understand and approve of what we're driving at, and he will not try to change our plan. 
there are some of the descriptive elements of sponsorship. Close mouth, keep a confidence. I lost a sponsor once <clears throat> because I came to him in the midst of a genuine crisis. I told him some things. He saved my life because after telling him about it, he says, that's insane. Go back and rescue your children. So I did. <clears throat> in absolute confidence. It's something I talked about from the podium today. But at that time, it was necessary that it not be. I, anyway, I got back to town and I heard all about it. What he has done has made it impossible for me to ever tell him anything that I think needs to be kept in confidence. And that changes. But at the moment, I must be very careful not to pass on what you tell me in confidence. And it may seem silly to me that you need to have that quiet, but I don't care. I'm not going to talk about it. The medication thing is, uh, oh, God. <coughs> Some people need certain kinds of medication. <clears throat> True manic depressive people, from my own experience in, in, in the field and in knowing some of it, some of them are helped by lithium, which is something that your body produces, and if it doesn't, then you need to take it. We've got a lot of old time members who need that. It's a chemical imbalance. The doctor I learned about it from said if you need it, it works. If you don't, you get toxic within days. And that's how they find out whether you need it or not. <laughs> In fact, that's how doctors find out whether you need anything or not. Today's new medications <laughs> need adjusted on a regular basis. My only pro I'll put it this way. My problem with people taking medication, particularly for depression, is that I can't work with them. Not, not that I won't. I can't. My experience is they can't show up. Even if they show up in the room, they can't show up. The feelings are deadened. That's what the stuff is all about. And so we don't go anywhere. And I'm more than willing. I have dear close friends who have to take certain kinds of medication. It almost always comes back to lithium. I personally believe, this is just my belief from watching over the years and from listening to my wife who is a 30 year nurse Prozac is one of the most dangerous drugs any alcoholic can take period I've watched nothing but devastation with that I won't say get off of it I think we're in bad shape if we tell people to get off of medication we've killed some people here doing that they need it they need it but if you're taking it I will tell you this the day is going to come if you're here or you will need to make that decision. <coughs> the one case that I love the most about it, and God works nicely with me. He softens me and gives me views. Little Monica up in Minnesota took on a little 18 year old girl as a newcomer. And it wasn't very long till we discovered that this girl had 102 personalities. <laughs> She had been raised in a satanic cult. And fragmented. She was on some really heavy duty psychotropics and antidepressives and all kinds of stuff. And we just worked. One of the things Monica did was teach her how to have group conscious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious, it, it helped. The psychiatrist is trying to get her integrated. Monica just told her how to do it. Let everybody talk. This is so real that one of the 14-year-olds who comes out burns himself with cigarettes when he's out. When he goes back in, the burn goes away. This is some real stuff. Anyway, this girl came to God is either everything or nothing. In a long process that it took, Eight of the personalities are alcoholic, by the way, so far. Came to God as everything or nothing. Did her own praying, her own inner searching. Went to her psychiatrist and said, I'm through. No more psychiatry, no more medication. Scared all of us. Because no withdrawal either. She functions in a, is a very fine member of her community today. She's in her 20s. Does really well. 
is is fully the the personality shifts are still there, but she is not distressed by them anymore. She knows who she is, and she knows who each of them are, and slowly she's getting better and better and better. But she got off her medication because it came from inside, and whatever that process was, I don't know, but it worked. The scariest time of all was when one of the personalities didn't know for sure whether they were alcoholic and wanted to take the test. <laughs> we know she's alcoholic, and we know seven of the others are too. So what are you going to do there? This okay? She had group conscience. <laughs> All eight of the alcoholics said, we understand. We're going away while you take the test. It wouldn't be good for us. You take it. And and I don't understand any of this. I'm just reporting to you what happened. This particular personality did some controlled drinking, and it worked just fine. And when it was all over, the rest of them came home. And I don't know how that works, but all I can tell you is... uh, Regarding the medication, she survived it. We had a kid on uh, methadone one time, 100 milligram methadone. This is an eight or 10 week withdrawal if you're lucky. He made the same choice. This is all or nothing. I'll take whatever heat there is. We had a friend out on a, that had a farm, a dog farm, out in the country. We figured that's a good place because when he screams and yells, the dogs won't care. Three days of mild discomfort is all we had. And it was over. Had another kid on the same dosage that took 10 years. Could not get past that fifth and sixth day. Couldn't do it. So I'm watching this, and I want to be careful not to diagnose, but I'm very, very suspicious. I work with a psychiatrist, and he said the main problem that he sees, and he's an alcoholic, any competent psychiatrist dealing with alcoholics in their first six months of sobriety would have to necessarily label them as manic depressive. In our meetings, we just call them mood swings. Okay. And if they're competent, that's how they'd have to do it. He said the problem is we as psychiatrists immediately begin to throw drugs at it so they don't get to finish it up. So he's working hard now in the field to say, let's let this stretch a little bit before we put them on medication. They may need it later. Some people do. But let's just don't automatically medicate them. The ones I have trouble with are the ones who are self-medicating. I don't feel good, so I'm going to find a doctor who will tell me what I want to hear and start taking these things. And the only trouble I have with that is I can't work with them. They don't show up. That's my own experience with it, Tom. We, we've dealt with a lot of it. We're finding a new thing you might want to watch. We found it in corrections particularly, a large increase of amphetamine abusers. And in tracking their histories back, we found that they were once children on Ritalin. And then it took them off of Ritalin, and now these kids are self-medicating. Because Ritalin is a an upper it takes hyperactive kids and slows them down. These guys don't get screamy, goofy on amphetamines. It calms them down. Watch for them. You're going to run into them. Let me, let me just mention a couple of things that... Uh, that um, well, one, if you, if you really want to get a hold of some information that I think is sound and solid from the professional field but fits an AA perspective... There's a guy by the name of Stanley Gitlow, G-I-T-L-O-W. And uh, he's an internist from New York, and Ross uh, probably, I don't, I don't know if he has some tapes by him. He has a number of tapes that are out. Stanley Gitlow, do you have anything by him? Um, if, you, if you know how to get in touch with Dicobi, he can tell you how to get in touch with Dicobi. They've got Gitlow tapes. And... Uh, this guy does as fine a job as anybody I've ever seen of, of, of discerning that thing Don was talking about, about the sort of the, the false diagnosis stuff. 
He, he, what is, one thing he says in uh, his talk about that is that he will not make a secondary diagnosis. You know, like it's so common now when somebody goes to treatment, they get a, a barrel full of diagnosis when they walk in. He says he wouldn't even consider a second diagnosis until two years of sobriety because the false <coughs> effects of, 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 of what's happening are so misleading that you get these diagnoses that a guy has to live with for a long time. So Gitlo is a, a really good source if you want some outside objective information. Best I've seen uh, from an AA standpoint. Uh, the other thing that, that to me is awfully important is for us to remember who we are. And, and there is a lot of tricky ground in this whole business of dealing with folk with medication. Uh, and it's, and it's, it's just as Don said, it can be tremendously dangerous to start yanking around something in an area where it may be life-threatening uh, to, to a person. So I think it's awfully important to remember who we are. Um, if, there are two things that I would point out that are, that are kind of important for me to think about. When I'm working with somebody, I want to know, or from my just layman standpoint, about the function, the, the level of disability. You know, if I'm working with somebody, what I want to see is whether they can actually track what we're doing. And if they can't track what I'm do, what we're doing, what's the point? And if you if you were there last night at the meeting, and I told that kind of wild story, a very true story about the guy who came in and was so wild and, 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 and nervous and, and I put him to painting, to painting the wall. Because if I had tried to talk with that guy or sit him down and get into any kind of stuff, what a waste of time. So I started with him where he was and let him work out his sort of, sort of wild and crazy gyrations. And then he settled in and became a solid AA member. 25 years later, the guy's still sober. So it doesn't mean that he was a hopeless case just because he came in zonked out of his mind. You know, sort of helping him work through that thing, get rid of that, and then he could go to work. Um, and I, I think that's kind of important to keep in mind. If somebody is clearly out to lunch, you know, I need to wait till there's somebody home before I start beating on the door, you know. <laughs> So, now that's just plain old common sense. And, and the other thing is how to deal with it. What I do with my guys that I'm working with, when I know that they've got a, a, a Medica, prescribed medication, I set up a deal with them to negotiate with their doc about how to come off of it. If they can. Some people can't. But if they can, that's between the patient and the doc. And if I start messing around in it, what I'll do is mess it up big time. And it's extremely, extremely dangerous ground. Uh, so I, there's I, one reason I think that's such an important <coughs> issue. Their places, like he's talking about, we get around a little bit. And there are places in this country where there's a kind of local ethic in place that if somebody's on medication, the sponsor tells them that they have to get a new sobriety date well that may not be mandating what to do about the thing but think what pressure that puts on somebody yeah. if you got somebody that's hanging on by an eyelash and you give them something like that that's a dangerous place to be <coughs> and so I think there's some real real reason for concern some real reason for being realistic about who we are we're fellow alcoholics and what we can help somebody do better than anybody in the world is to find recovery when they're in shape to be able to engage in the process. And and sometimes we have to step back and let them get through with whatever critical care they're, they're undergoing before we can really start working with them. Doesn't mean that we can't, you know, do the best we can with them, but we just don't need to start trying to get down to some nitty gritty work and doing uh, four steps and all that. You know, you gotta, gotta wait a while for that. So it, it is a, a tremendously tremendously important area that can uh, I have I have personally uh, didn't observe the suicide but I have personally uh, been associated with cases where this kind of stuff got out of hand and there were actual suicides because of some kind of a sloppy intrusion in something where we had no business so it, it's not it's not nickel and dime stuff it's it, it, it's about people's lives 
and I think we have to take it very seriously. Sometimes all we can do for long periods of time, like with Chuck, just love him and accept him. Yeah. I'm going to set a standard. One last story about medication. Last October, I had some surgery. And uh, I know for a fact that when you go into the hospital, you're at the mercy of well-meaning doctors. I didn't pray to be protected because I know I am protected. <coughs> went in, the surgery went fine. It was pretty weird. I had a spinal block. And uh, I was awake, and then I was asleep, and then I was awake. And uh, I went to sleep with my legs like this, and I'm back in recovery. My legs are like this. I know they're there because I can see them, but in my head they're like this. And the doc says, that's because the last time you were in touch with them, that's where they were. Until you feel them again, that's where they're going to stay. <laughs> went home. It was so successful, I went on home. 2.30 in the morning, they had to rush me back. I'm in bad shape. I started clotting and bleeding. We're back in the ER. And they're doing extraordinary procedures. And all of a sudden, my head went, I said, what'd you do? She said, well, I just gave you a shot of morphine. Oh. So I threw up. That's appropriate. <laughs> <coughs> they go back to extraordinary procedures. And uh, about 20 minutes later, I said, did you just give me another shot of morphine? She said, yes. I said, well, you can stop. It isn't going to do any good. All it's doing is, so I'm not a drug addict. It's not going to have any effect. Quit. The nurse is apologizing. The one I remember most, and they were all lovely people. I learned about kindness. The one I remember most, though, is the one who was hurting me the worst, saying, sweetie, I'm sorry I'm torturing you. I want her to say, Sweetie, shit. <laughs> Call me, sweetie. <laughs> what I remember the most, the thing that did me the most good, was this. When people are in crisis, and people who are taking by cold drink. My little hoot nanny done here, real quick, but I'm sure glad you got here. <laughs> We'd have never made it without you. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll just sort of get us opened up. And uh, if what we'll do this morning is uh, Don, since he's going to have to fly away to, to the Golden West, we'll, uh, <clears throat> he'll pretty much do the first, the first half of the work. And uh, then we'll take a break. And so that's going to be somewhere around 10. Well, uh, you, I, mean, I know there's no point in telling this group what time we're going to do something. It'll, it'll be it'll be roughly around, uh, or even telling him why we're going to do something. But somewhere in the neighborhood of ten or 15, ten, 10 or ten fifteen, as dictated by the airline, we'll take a break, and uh, and then we'll shoot for a fifteen minute break, and, and uh, if, if we can if we stay fairly close to that, then we'll shoot to, to finish up around eleven thirty. So we take a little, little. So, so I can take a little bit of a break, and then uh, we're going to go over and do corrections workshop and uh, at uh, somewhere in Richmond <laughs> at uh, at one thirty. So uh, why don't we, let's open with serenity prayer. God, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can and wisdom to know the difference. It is good to everybody welcome our buddies, the back row gang from uh, North Carolina. I, I guess everybody knows. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're the honesty committee from North Carolina. <laughs> Check it out. And Steve, if you haven't met them, it's Steve on the left, on, on our left, you're, you're right, and, uh, the and one. Paige and then Jerry. Pretty one. Pretty good. God. Well, did you notice he's got a, he's, he must have gotten married. His shirt's pressed. <laughs> That's a very discerning eye. I'll tell you that. Yeah, it's great to have home folk here to help us get out of town. And, uh, uh, 
as a welcome, guys. <coughs> we've had a, a good we've had a good weekend. I had the chance to work with my buddy, and uh, uh, it was just a neat experience. He said we ought to keep on dancing like this, so a good chance we might. And uh, so, Donald, uh, we, uh, what, what we're going to basically do is is going to we're going to start out with the, the immense stuff, sort of look at how that gets us back into the community, and then in the, the latter half. We're going to try to pick up that notion of effectiveness and how those last three steps kind of put us into some effective things with some recognition that our world has to get a little bigger than just me and mine. And so generally that's the kind of direction we're going to try to go for it. So Donald, we're putty in your hands. There are three people that can get away with that. <laughs> no. What did I call you? Donald. Donald? Oh, no. That's what you said. Jesus, that was Freudian, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> the one that bothers me is Donnie. Oh. I still have an aunt that calls me Donnie, and she's the only one left. <laughs> <laughs> God, now there we are. <coughs> so through the nature of alcoholism and my own strenuous effort, I managed to become completely alone. I worked my way down to where I even gave away my name and became a number in a single cell maximum security penitentiary. There is no more alone than that one. But all that is is a reflection of the alone I had become out here. Alone in the crowd. Who the hell am I? Relying on you to tell me that. And then having learned not to get in crowds, because if you tell me who you want me to be, I can be that very quickly. And then you tell me, and I can be that. But if there's two or three of you, I get confused. So I have to <laughs> be alone. The ego sense that I'm the only one on the planet is what I'm talking about. And one of the reasons I didn't get along with folks is you didn't really exist for me. It was me and who I needed you to be so I could get what I wanted. And then when I was through with that, you disappeared. Either I moved or you threw me out. But in one way or the other, you just disappeared. And there really wasn't a whole lot of regret about that. It's just a lot of confusion. On the other side of that is this spirit that is within each one of us, I think, that knows the truth. I am you, and you are me. We are truly kin. In any way you can imagine it, we all come from the same place. We all want the same things. I need a little appreciation, a little warmth, a little food, a little sex, a little applause, a little comfort, a little recognition. We all need a little of that. Bill was very clear about that in the 12 and 12. I, I don't use the 12 and 12 much, but that his understanding and ability to communicate that these are our basic instincts. These are our basic character traits. My character defects are just natural traits that I have that are defective. I want a little applause. No, I want the entire world to give me a standing ovation. <laughs> Regularly. Regularly. <laughs> and I want that to happen before I've done anything. <laughs> this is when I come on stage. My genes tell me, as a young male, that my main job on this planet is to repopulate it. That's a genetic imperative. It's not a joke. And uh, there's a process of selection. I don't want to get all clear about that, but I didn't meet the criteria. Uh, I just had the urges. <laughs> By the way, one of the blessings of getting older is I know that's no longer my job. Wow! 
It's his job. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> One of the needs of a human being, a person in a human condition, is for continuity and regularity. The sense of belonging that comes from knowing that we get it here because we have an 8 o'clock meeting. We know that's when we're going to be able to gather with people of our own, own kind. There will be a comfort period here. Uh, we establish that. That's good natural and normal. As an alcoholic, I tend to either over-establish it or ignore it completely. Uh, everything is done on my time. So anyway, I end up alone. Through the process we've been talking about, I wake up. I'm not alone. Someone comes and talks to me, and they were telling me their story, and all of a sudden, that's me. How do you know that? I had a wonderful experience with a kid in a meeting one time. I'm sitting next to him, and he's calm, cool, and collected. And uh, in the course of a light conversation, he's also just three days sober. And I got a chance to look in his eyes. And I need to make contact, because he's way too calm, cool, and collected. All of his energy is being devoted to staying in that chair. And he's not going to hear a thing. So I leaned over and I said, you know, I bet inside you feel like you got 10 million needles all pointed out and any second they're going to go. Pow. He came up out of the chair. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you know that? Well, I know that because I have had that. And I recognize the look in his eye. Now he and I have made contact. Scared the hell out of him. But all of a sudden he's not alone. The uh, great master used to walk the world. And the stories they tell of him, one of the things that he would do, he'd come upon some guy who was sitting by the, leaned up against the wall, all crippled and covered with sores and blind. And uh, <clears throat> the master did some interesting things, very simple stuff, that I watch happen in AA. That's why I know I'm in the right place. The very first thing he did was this. Didn't say a word. I don't care if you want to be alone. You can't be when that happens. You can hate it. You can rebel against it. But you can't deny. Whoops. So he established contact. Then he knew something the guy on the wall didn't know. The guy on the wall thought he was alone because he was crippled and had sores and was blind. And so people didn't want to be around him. The master knew he was crippled and blind and had sores because he thought he was alone. So he touched him. Then he would say something like, is there anybody there? You don't have to do this anymore, you know. You don't have to. Whatever's wrong with you, you want to walk? And, well, yeah. Well, I'm going to give you the magic. Get up. Walk. And he, did, he was able to say that with such total conviction that the person on the other end heard it. And that's what they did for me. I stopped being alone in a fist step. My first fist step was a lie. Well, they usually are. Uh, I had gotten so desperate to become part of something that I was willing to risk even being a little bit honest. Uh, even though I was being guided by big book people, I jumped ahead, naturally, and went back to my cell and spent two hours writing down the worst things I'd ever done. I thought, that'll get me some status here. I will be accepted. Took it back to my sponsor, and he said, that's garbage. He wrote that to impress me. Get out of here. And uh, crushed me. But I, I'm resilient, and I have a will. And by God, I'd work two hours on this thing. Somebody's going to listen to it. <laughs> so I went and found me a guy. A guy named Leroy, who was a member of the AA group, but wasn't really a member of the AA group. He showed up for meetings. And I would tell Leroy, 
one of these things I'd done, and Leroy would say, well, that wasn't that bad. And I'd tell him another, and he'd say, well, that wasn't that bad. And I awoke, because some of it was that bad. And uh, what I awoke to was the fact that, once again, I had picked somebody who'd tell me what I wanted to hear, so I didn't have to do anything. And if I didn't stop that instantly, I would die a very ugly death. And I'm not afraid of death. I haven't been afraid of death for a long time. I've done it three times. It just it doesn't do anything. <laughs> you get reborn again right away, and shit, what a, what a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what I was afraid of is that to die an ugly death means that for some period of time, just prior to that, I'm going to have to live a very ugly life. And that's the one I can't stand. This gives a nice foundation to get away from the guilt of making amends and gives a real purpose. If I'm going to live a useful life and I'm stuck here, my genes indicate that I will probably be in the late 80s or mid 90s before I cash out. That's the way my family is. The shortest member, the shortest, the, the youngest member in the family cemetery that I saw was 65. And he died in a train wreck, so I don't think that one counts. The rest of them are 80, 90, Aunt Anna's 102. My mother's 91, and she hasn't even slowed down yet. <laughs> so I need to find a way to live with some peace. I've already identified that I'm no longer alone. I've been touched by someone. Now we've identified the stuff that's been separating me from you. See, the whole idea of God is too big for me to grasp. I, I can grasp that there probably is one. I can't grasp much else. So the mercy of this deal is that I get to work it out through you, the children of God. And anything that separates me from the children of God separates me from God. And my life depends on not being separated. Depends on it. Not my death. My life depends on it. My life will be in accordance with that relationship. It will be reflected in everything I do. So anyway, we got through all that, and now I've got a list of people that I have harmed. If I harm you, I separate us. And anything that separates us is not a good thing. I need to repair that. It's a very ancient principle. A did not invent it. And I really have come to dislike the word of man because... What it seems to mean is, I'm sorry, which is crap. I'm sorry he doesn't get it. My sponsor is very clear. He says, you never get to say I'm sorry again. You've been sorry your whole life. What you get to say is, I was wrong. Oh, shit. I have harmed you. I truly believe that this whole thing is based on willingness. I think willingness is the most demonstrable, observable, most powerful sign of the presence of God. It is so powerful that the instant I'm willing to be changed, I've already been changed. The making of amends does not set me free. The willingness to make amends is what set me free. Locked up for the night in a single cell penitentiary, my sponsor said, we know what you did to these people, but you're so insensitive you have no idea what it did to them. So you're going to go out there and make amends and screw it all up again. I want you to go back to your cell with this list. And go over the list, close your eyes, picture everybody in your mind, and see if you can have a willingness to say to each one of them, I have been wrong and I've harmed you. Would you please tell me what I have to do so we can get the books to balance? And in the process of doing that that evening, I was literally lifted. The sensation was I was lifted from that chair and set free. Now, they didn't know I was free. They kept me locked up for a while. <laughs> but not often. Remember I told you how Bruce used to come by and how astounded I was that he was walking the tears talking to us? Shortly after that occurred, they started letting me out of the cell to go talk to people. Because following his footsteps, I began working with the next group. And it was my job to go around not just in the school, but afterwards and be available to them because they were sitting against the wall still, crippled. And they needed somebody to come by and say, 
look at me. I'm out here. I mean, that's the message. I'm walking free. Follow me. Get up off your ass. Walk. But I had some direct demands to make. I'm free already. I'm being free now. I'm willing to, to truly make amends, which means to change. Amend means to change, to set right the wrongs I've done. And they wouldn't let me out to do it. So my experience is a little different than yours. Because I was ready. There's a great danger at this point in sponsoring people. They enter into their evangelistic stage and uh, start running amok. The danger is that I'm inclined to rein them in. Let them go. Keep guiding them, but let them go. Let them run amok. Uh, this thing needs a few evangelists. And, and the fellowship itself will cool them out. I don't have to cool them out. They'll run into somebody else's meeting. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be taken care of. How can I change what I have done? My mother, for instance, on Christmas Day, the last day of my sickness, we, my little boys and I went to my folks' house for, for Christmas. It would never occur to me not to go home. My dad met us at the door and said, Don, I'm sorry, but your mother says you can't come in here anymore because she can't stand watching you die. Now, how do I straighten that one up? To this day, I can't come up with any way to do that. I must set that straight. <clears throat> well, one of the things that I learned in that eight-step experience, reviewing the list, was that once I asked the question, what do I have to do? I'm supposed to shut up and listen while they tell me. Okay. I know roughly I know what I did. I know roughly what I can do to straighten it out, but my job now is to shut up while you tell me what I need to do. Months after I got out I was allowed to go see my mother and she was frankly quite reluctant. Chuck Chamberlain helped me through this. He said there is nothing I I single handedly through my own efforts, destroyed everything worthwhile in my life. And I have no right to ever expect anyone to even talk to me again. And with that attitude, I'm free. Whatever happens now is appropriate. You want to throw me out? You should. You want to forgive me? Good. But it doesn't matter. I'm just here to set it straight. Okay. So that's the attitude I approach life with. I don't have any rights. That's one you can think about at 2.30 in the morning when you can't sleep. But I don't. I gave them all up. Burned them out. So I got to my mother's house and we just had a, a little light chat. My dad, fortunately, was a very wise man and he helped guide me as to the timing of this visit. And in the, in the talk, I found a way to ask the question. You don't ask that bluntly always. What do I have to do to set this straight? But I found a way to ask the question. And her response was, Honey, all I have ever wanted for you is that you be happy. So, for 32 years now, I've been going by my mother's house on a regular basis, happy. And it worked. She said it was six years before she believed I was going to amount to anything. But that isn't why I was going. I dragged my happiness with me. My wife, my grandchildren, $2 bills, the fun stuff I get to do. My mother's a traveler, but it's getting a little harder on her. Uh, so I tell her about all the places I've been, and I tell her about you. And what I'm doing, she thinks I'm the president of AA. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I thought one time I really need to straighten her out on that. I heard her say that to one of her friends on the phone. I thought I better straighten her out on that. And then I realized, no. Yeah. After all the disappointments that she's had on me, let her think it. 
As long as you and I understand, I'm only the vice president. (laughs) After I have initially addressed the harm I did to you, now it's about changed behavior. I must be a different person, which means I will behave in a different way. And this is something I'm not powerful enough to do on my own. This is a spiritual deal. This comes out of the fact that I truly understand if I cause you pain, I cause me pain. And I can't stand any more pain. I think the spiritual life is one of enlightened self-interest. I still want mine. I just finally understand that the best way for me to get mine is to make sure you get yours. And mine just comes right along with it. But it's still there. There's no nobility in in spirituality. Nobility is one of the greatest dangers to spirituality that I know of. And yet we get busy doing things that are perceived as really quite noble. Just don't you believe it. (laughs) Let somebody else believe it because it will open some doors for you, but don't you believe it. The... uh, the change with my dad is very simple. I went to him with my list. I'm among list makers, so I have to mention lists. And he looked at it, and I can see in his eyes, he don't want to hear this shit. And I started out, we're supposed to be hard on ourselves and easy on others. That's a basic principle, not only in making amends, but in life itself. So I've been taught to prepare. I said, Dad, first of all, I need to straighten out some stuff I did in the past. Do you have some time? Yes. I lied to you. I stole from you. I cheated you. Blah, blah, blah. He said, please stop. I know all that. All you can do by telling me again is hurt me all over again. So I get to live with the the details of that. What he said was, you and I will just have to start from here. Wonderful thing. We started from there. And for 27 years, my dad and I built a relationship. It was both father and son, man to man, friend to friend. We built one day by day by day. I owed him some money. And he says, the whole thing's written off. Don't worry about it. I said, no, this is one i got to take care of, Pop. He said, all right, here's what we'll do. Uh, every now and then, you can buy and give me a little bit of money. And when you think it's done, it's done. But I don't want to be any part of your accounting system. Just to buy once in a while. Now, I believe that God uses whatever's at hand. And my dad and mom got along fine, but she was always a little bit testy about the fact that he kind of controlled the money. And when her mother died, she inherited some money. And that tiny little chink in her armor opened up, and she got it. She reported to the state that she inherited that money, and they cut both their pensions off. Now, he's totally dependent on her for the money. I saw the only mean streak I've ever seen in my mom. (laughs) Didn't last long, but... She got him. <laughs> and every now and then I'd, I'd come by with a $20 bill to repay my debt. And that became his pocket money. It's more than me just saying, I'm sorry. Now I'm to be of service all along the way. The big book's very clear. It says that while we're trying to get our lives in order, this is not an end in itself. Our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and those about us. This is how I get fit. I do these exercises and they make me fit to be around. And my transgressions then become tools by which the Spirit can work. It's wonderful. Uh, This makes me fit to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I have a hard time finding the words to describe my experience with it, but that 12-step study school we started in was partly because we were not fit to go to the regular meeting where there were real people. We weren't fit. doesn't mean we were bad people. We weren't fit. We hadn't done anything to become fit. We were part of AA, but we had to go through this orientation. Now, I don't subscribe to that out here. 
and yet I do. Okay. Old fellow named Bernie Riley one time. He was an old bank robber. You loved him. Uh, drunk bank robber. <laughs> <laughs> Robbed a bank in downtown Denver one time. Got thirty-five thousand dollars. Went up and rented most of the Brown Palace Hotel and had a hell of a party over the weekend. Was broke on Monday. <laughs> And the Brown Palace is only a couple blocks from the bank, and uh, he did a little time for that one. Uh, they just followed him to the party. <laughs> <laughs> Bernie only had one leg. Uh, they'd been amputating him for a while, and he had a nasty mouth and a nasty attitude. But he really loved people, and he kind of took me under his wing. I'd been on the street maybe five months when... Uh, he did when I was getting a car. It was my car because he couldn't drive, but getting a car. We're going to Brighton, he says, to the meeting up at Brighton. Dick and Mary Irvine's meeting. Fine. I got to this little church and we went down the stairs and these two older people just put themselves all over me. And I got to experience a dimension of love I hadn't encountered before. They didn't love me for any reason other than the fact I was there. There was no other reason. I got my standing ovation before I'd ever done anything. He had waited five months, I found out later, because we talked, to make sure that I was fit to go among those lovely people. He wasn't dragging no bum into that one. Uh, that's part of what I learned about this thing. And I, I passed that on. I take the people I sponsor a lot of places, but there's some places they don't get to go with me until I'm sure they're not going to screw this deal up. They're not going to tamper with these people. Uh, my room is one of them. Anyway, I began to get involved. Uh, i got to tell a story on my coming down to see you because it fits here. See, this is a lifetime process. When I, when I moved down to North Carolina and went to work with Tom, I figure I'm fairly safe. Now, I'm, I'm in the middle of my second or third month of interferon treatment for hepatitis C, and I don't feel good. And for whatever the reason, I'm being told by my spirit, leave home, leave your support system, leave your doctor, leave everything, and go down to North Carolina where they don't even speak English. <laughs> They speak Southern. <laughs> but I'm safe enough because I'm going to join Tom's group. But I am prone to spiritual arrogance from time to time, and I know how it's supposed to be done. <laughs> and they weren't doing it right. And this, is a, this was a lovely group. I had a little meeting ahead of time. Uh, where everybody got introduced and they had this thing called the chip system which I'd never seen before and then they broke up into four different meetings there was a beginners meeting step one through four I think it was and then step four through twelve and then a big book meeting uh, I thought this is cool until the chipmunk got up <laughs> and waved this silver token in the air and said this is how you join AA if you want one come down and get it and I think my god I've fallen into a bunch of Baptist revivals. <laughs> but I'm cool. I'm 25 years sober or so, and I'm cool. I don't say anything. Uh, then I go off to the, the step meeting. And there's no big book. They're reading out of the 12 and 12. And that's fine. It's just that I don't have a lot of experience with that. And uh, so one more little piece of discomfort shows up here. Uh, the next week, I go to the meeting on four through, or 5 through 12. Same thing. 12 and 12. And I don't have any experience. I don't feel right. And the way I translate when I don't feel right is they're not doing it right. Got to the big book meeting. And they were in the family afterward, and there was actually a big book there. In my arrogance, I'm thinking, ah, we're okay now. And the chairperson read a little from the family afterwards somebody mentioned dysfunctional family in the meeting went to hell <laughs> then that young girl can't remember her name 
19 years old, in an effort to make me feel part of the group, asked me if I would be the chipmunk. <laughs> Cindy. Cindy, yeah. And I lost it. They also, after the meeting, did a big book raffle. And, and I don't dig raffles. I don't think A needs to raise money. What I found out later is he set it up as a way to cheat and get books into the hands of new people. That's what that was about. <laughs> but I go off on this poor little girl and her boyfriend. There are two things I will not do in this group. I will not hand out those damn chips and I will not participate in that damn book raffle. And if you ever want to know why, I'll tell you. He said, I want to know why, so I told him. <laughs> and on the way home, my heart is breaking. I know I've been a jerk. So I did what I have been taught to do and found out why their behavior threatened me and went through all that stuff. And once again realized something I've known for years. Whether I feel like I belong here has nothing to do with whether you accept me or not. It has to do with whether I accept you or not. That's when I belong. So I was... I got it fist up. Was it you I fist up with, Jerry? Yeah. He's the only one I could trust to see what a jerk I was. I had to go back to the group the next week and go to Cindy and say, could I please have the privilege of being a jerk? I was wrong, I said. Completely wrong thanked her for her kindness and they let me be the chipmunk the next week <laughs> I did not say this is how you join AA I said this is a good marker of the night you decided to get sober It'd be a good token to have to remind you and if you like one of these come that night nobody got any chips and I was never asked to do it again I, I don't know whether I did it wrong or not but the thing was, I had to. That's the kind of stuff we have to straighten out. The high drama stuff is over. I need to belong somewhere, and I need to be part of it. And that means I have to accept you as you are. The book raffle got to be fun because I woke up to the fact that this happens after the meeting. Don't be such a millennial thinking, a hey, cop. <laughs> I still don't do raffles. So it got to be that I was the one who got to pick the number because he and I talked about it, and I was the only honest one in the room. I didn't have a ticket. And I began to understand what he was doing. He was making sure the books got into the hands of new people. In fact, there's times we cheated. There's an old carny trick. When you use a hat, you put the winning number in the, the band and drop the others here, and when you pick it up, you got the winner. We did that. Yeah. <laughs> It's a long way of saying what I just said. Whether I feel like I belong or not has nothing to do with whether you accept me, it's whether I accept you. <clears throat> and once I've cleared away the garbage in my head that you're doing something to me and understand no one has ever done anything to me, and if they have, I set myself up for it, then I can take you as you are. You took me as I was. So a man means to change. And there's some principles behind it that are critically important. One of them is being on time, being here now. And the way it translates out onto the street is if we have an appointment at 8, from my viewpoint, you need to know there's a 10-minute window on either side. If you come 20 minutes early, I'm not ready. I'm doing something else. My life is really full. And I move from one thing to another. And if you're too early, I'm not there. At 10 minutes till, if you're coming to my house, for instance, i got a chair out front. I just go sit in it and watch to see. Because I want you to experience something that I experienced. When you show up at my house, as you walk up toward the house, I open the door for you. Important. You don't have to knock. We translate that in, in groups by putting people at the door to welcome you in. They shake your hand as you come in. Very important stuff. 
it's a terrible thing, and I know Tom's run into it because we get around a lot, to go someplace to a meeting and nobody ever talks to you. They don't know whether you've been there a while or if you're brand new. The meeting goes on, nobody ever talks to you, and you go home. There are other meetings where you can't even get to the coffee pot. You've got to go through this gauntlet of people. I like them. <laughs> I love having some noodle 12-step me because he doesn't know better. I just let him do it. <laughs> you know, it's kind of fun to see how far they'll go before they ask you how long you've been sober. <laughs> and I like the enthusiastic. <laughs> and I would do it pretty good. <laughs> There was a period of time, let's see, I must have been five or six years sober. I went to work at the Colorado Reformatory, getting jobs for the guys as they came out, jobs and housing. We did some preliminary work so they didn't hit the street cold. They had something to go to. Uh, this is 120 miles from Denver. I had to come over once a week on Monday to check into the office and to catch my home group. Because the group in Buena Vista was me, another guy, and a continually drunk Mexican kid who came and went. And I need a little bit more than that. So I, I catch my home group and then I go back. And I've got these two boys who've been with me the last four and a half years on the road. So their experience of me is sometimes he gets back and sometimes he doesn't. And sometimes when he comes back, we move. It was a lack of continuity there. And the way I have to make amends to my children is to create an arena where they can heal. There has to be continuity. We call it home. And I, th I thought one time, you know, with that going on with the boys, when I leave every Sunday night and I don't get back until Tuesday morning, I wonder what that's doing to them. So I ask them. Ask people. You want to know what, what's going on with them? Ask them. They'll tell you. I said, boys, does it bother you that I go over to Denver once a week. And they said, no, we don't mind if you go, but please make sure you tell us when you're going to get back. See, the way I change that is from undependable to dependable. I stop being a surprise and start bringing surprises. But there's a need to know. Uh, I fly a lot, and my wife's afraid of a stepladder. She's never comfortable knowing that I'm in the air. The new behavior, the old behavior was, well, I'll see you when I get back. If I get back. <laughs> when I get back. No, she has my timetable. She knows exactly when I'm supposed to arrive. I will call her from the Richmond airport after I've checked in and I said, we're ready. And when I hit the ground in Denver, I will call her and tell her we're on the ground. And it's just a little thing. It's subtle, but that's a necessary thing uh, <clears throat> for her comfort, not mine. I'm comfortable. She needs to know that. The people in my life need to know that. You need to know, and so I tell everybody, my home group is known as an AA group, and we meet at St. Joseph's Hospital at 6 o'clock every Friday morning in the Aspen room next to the cafeteria. Now, if you happen to be in Denver and you're looking for me and can't find me, I'll be there, or if by chance I'm on the road, they will know when I will be back. My group knows when I'll be back. They're informed too, because I'm a member of that group. My little group does things together. We don't just meet on Friday morning. We're still in our evangelistic stage. We just slickered this hospital head nurse into accepting a box of big books from us. We bought a case of third editions. So she will have them so she can pass them out when she runs across an alcoholic. And she will call us so we can go see her. She has agreed that it would be a good idea, we planted a seed, that maybe we could do an in-service for the entire hospital staff. We'll bring some a couple alcoholics and an al with us and do an in-service for the staff. Following that, we will post a meeting notice in every unit. And from time to time, we'll just drift through and talk with the nurses. Uh, this is the activity that's real service. We're, 
we're trolling for drunks. We know there's one in this hospital somewhere. (laughs) But it's up to us to go find them. Okay? Uh, So I became a member of his group. Took it as it was, where it was. But because I didn't have any long experience with working out of the 12 and 12, I've read it, I, there's pieces of it I like, but I don't work out of it. I, I couldn't share from that. They would read a piece from the 12 and 12, and then everybody share their experience, and I didn't have any. But it was on the steps, and I do have experience with that, so I share my experience with that. And then Jim came to me one day and said, Where'd you get that? And I have learned to be courteous, please. I said, do you really want to know? (laughs) Okay. Yes, I really want to know. So I took my big book out and showed him. And I said, would you like to hear some more about this? Well, yeah, I would. So the next thing you know, I've got me somebody to sponsor at 6 in the morning. And before long, there were five of them. And then pretty soon, we were allowed to start... A big book. We call it a workshop. It's a long-term group walk through the steps. An hour and a half early, so it wouldn't taint the regular membership. But uh, that got going. That's still going. Yeah. Yeah, the group going through the steps together, and then going to the regular meeting. See that that activity of walking through the steps with the group is not a separate activity. It's an activity for those who would like to do that. But you still got to be part of the main group. Don't let us separate you. We learned that the hard way. We had a step group that did that and then tried to become a group of its own. Within three years, it was inbred and died. New people wouldn't come. We were so good at what we were doing, we just blew everybody off. Uh, don't want to do that. I'm, I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I've got to be able to go anywhere in Alcoholics Anonymous and accept them for who they are, as they are, so I can be accepted the same way. To bring my contribution. We each have a contribution to make to life. Nobody but me can make mine. Nobody but you can make yours. And it's up to me. And that's what I mean by change behavior. I'm not to stir up stuff. With one exception. If you ask me to sponsor you, now I'm compelled to stir up stuff. (laughs) Tom mentioned it. I give you permission or you give me permission to come unannounced. One of the new ways of of change, ways of making amends, I don't ever show up unannounced anywhere. It would never occur to me to stop by your house just unannounced. How rude. I'll call first and see if if you've got anything going. Do you mind? And I don't want you doing that in my house either. Uh, I do things in AA a certain way, as does everybody. But when I am asked to chair your meeting, I follow your format. Whether I agree with it or not has nothing to do with anything. I'll follow your format. Now, after we get into the main meeting, I may become an irritant to you. <laughs> and maybe not. But I will, I, will, I will comply with the conditions of this group, however it is you want it done. Same thing at home. We learn to take group conscience by first admitting there is a group here. Okay. One of my most fun amends, I don't think Tom knew about this one yet, I, uh, our, our memories come back slowly over a period of time. That first inventory is always shabby because I don't have enough memory, nor to, nor to the discernment to know all the stuff that's going on. It comes slowly. Anyway, I've been on the street for about a year and a half, which means I was about yeah, close to three years sober, still on federal parole, working, beginning to be allowed to visit my kids again, getting back into life, house father at a place called the Hand of Hope. I told you about that little two-bedroom house with an empty basement where we put drunks on mattresses. 
and then dignified it with a name. Uh, and my memory came back that uh, on, my, on my last long run, when the kids and I were running in Cheyenne, Wyoming, uh, I wrote a check because that's what I did. I'm a paper bandit. It, had no, it, it wasn't even real. We had gotten, somebody had stolen a sample book from a print company that was samples of checks, and we were just <laughs> using them. <laughs> yeah. They were payroll checks. <laughs> I wrote a bad check in order to get a prescription that I had also written filled <laughs> so that I could be awake enough to get the hell out of Cheyenne. <laughs> And that memory came back. And I come from the school that says there's no slack. If I harmed you, I owe you. I must even be willing to go to prison because my spiritual condition is more important to me than anything. So I must do something about this. I also believe that when the book says if others will be involved, we should consult them. And I have guides. I went to Gary. Because he wasn't all too smart, but at least he, he now had a family and he was doing better than I was. And he was my sponsor. And I told him about it, and he said, yeah, we got to do something. But who will be most affected if you go to Wyoming and confess to two more felonies? My federal parole officer, that's who. So now I'm faced with a proposition that I need to consult him. I can't leave the state without his permission. Can you get the feeling? i got to go tell a federal parole officer about two more felonies I've committed. My old behavior was, maybe we can wait a while. <laughs> no, in this life, everything is immediate. So Gary and I went down to see him, laid the whole thing out to him. He says, you're right, you got to do something about it. Here's the deal. You have my permission to leave the state, and if they arrest you, I will not violate you. Go get it taken care of. Because he'd been watching. He knew about AA. And on the ride home, Gary and I were talking, and he said, it also says in there you're not to be a foolish martyr and stick your head in the lion's mouth because other people will be affected. He says, you've got a job now. They're starting to let you see your kids. You're becoming a member of the community. It would be foolish heroics just to dash in there because you're facing probably seven years. He said, I come from Cheyenne. I know the guy at the Rexall. Let's do this. Let's write him a preliminary letter first and lay the whole thing out. Now, I've got to confess to these things on paper and sign it. Well, it makes you a little nervous. I did it. Sent it off. There's no high drama ending to this because the letter came back. The man had died and the business had shut down. So there wasn't anything I could do there. Then I got to thinking, well, wait a minute. Don't I owe Wyoming something? I committed a crime in their jurisdiction. Went back to my parole officer. He said, don't do that. <laughs> he says, here's what's going to happen. You're going to go in there and confess to a couple felonies that they can't prove because the records are all gone. And you're going to have to deal with nervous policemen. I don't want you dealing with a nervous policeman. He said, you just keep living your life the way you are, and an opportunity someday may come along. Well, it did. Uh, the job I had for Tom was to establish and, and kind of supervise alcohol and drug treatment in 15 prison units. So I learned how to do that, took that back home, and established the same basic program in a community correction center in Colorado where we took inmates and ran them through a 45-day intensive inpatient, which is a fancy way for saying we created an arena where you could come and get them. Because we had five speakers a week. The only thing we did was AA. And so we got that going. And about, uh, what's it been, four years ago, they sent me to Cheyenne to establish the same program in Cheyenne, in it?
got it up and running. Came back home, and it was about six weeks later it hit me. It's paid. It's all done. Which was weird. To the best of my knowledge, I'm straight with the world. If I leave today, I leave without regret, and I'm straight with the world. There is nobody left to impress. And what a change that was when I realized that because I got to see how much of my life is spent trying to impress people one way or the other. <coughs> so I'm in the middle of a whole new examination of me. I don't even want to impress you with a message because then you'll attach it to me and it'll be diminished. <laughs> I just want to carry it. What I'm trying to share with you is that while my life is none of my business, the conduct of my life is entirely my business. I am responsible for my conduct. And that really puts some pressure on. I've got to ask constantly, okay, give me the strength to do the right thing because I no longer can claim I don't know the right, right thing. I've always known the difference between right and wrong. And today it's acute. And because I know the difference, I'm faced with the fact that I'm just a weirdo kid. I don't have the strength to do that. I don't even have the will to go do that. So God uses my ego for His benefit. Oh yeah, don't discount the wonderful use of the human ego. Think about this. You know where I came from. You know I'm lazy. Uh, you know I just assume sit in my big comfortable chair and listen to Mozart and read James Lee Burke novels? I really would. In 1988, somebody comes to me and says, we would like you to go to Russia and carry the AA message to Russia. Was my response, oh, shucks. So, put me in a game, coach. I'm ready. When do you leave? That's a very necessary part of what gets me to the airport. Now, once I get there, that's gone. But that gets me to the airport someday. Okay, Don't discount it. I've changed. I'm not the person I used to be, but I'm still a person. I'm not a human being trying to have a spiritual experience. I'm a spiritual being having a human experience, which makes me totally available to the human experience. Because I really am you, and you really are me. And there is it's not just an empathy. It's a reality. We're kin. What happens to you hurts me. One last little deal because it's pertinent. With that sense of things, I was devastated September 11th. We lost people. Went through all the emotions of that. And you got to know, deep within me, there's a creature. And there's a meanness in me because of this. I didn't want these people caught and tried. I wanted them caught, covered with pig fat, make them eat a ham sandwich, then turn them loose and see how they fare with that because they can't get in heaven now. That's pretty mean. <laughs> That's what's going on in my head. Huh? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> With mayonnaise. <laughs> and I'm doing the battle that I know most of you have done with that deal. I, I really don't want to feel that way, but I do. Uh, and one of my guys called, and he's having the same problem. What am I going to do if I can't deal with this? He's Jewish. And he's got the other thing going on, and he's trying to fight this whole business. Well, my guidebook says there's a simple deal for this. I'm to realize that people that harm me are perhaps spiritually sick, and I'm to ask God, because I'm too small to do so, please show me how to take a kindly and tolerant view. And I said to Jack, maybe if you both, you and I both pray that together, 
because there's a promise that if two of us are praying, something really does happen. Let you and I both pray that the rest of the day. He called me the next morning. And he said, I don't know if this is right. And I could hear in his voice he was okay. He said, I had a thought. It occurred to me that if I'd have been raised there by those people with those standards, I'd have probably been flying one of those planes. And there it is. That's forgiveness. The understanding that given the right circumstances, I'm capable of anything sets me free. Because now I will do my very best not to not do this, but to do something else that is so positive and so creative and so loving and so different that this never comes up out of the pit. And I felt better. It made me at peace with that whole deal too. Still don't like it think it's awful the way we treat each other so let's us not treat each other that way one of the reasons Alcoholics Anonymous become a worldwide phenomenon is that people observe the restoration of family they saw families who'd been torn apart put back together they saw new families being born out of it they saw the family of Alcoholics Anonymous they don't care how far down you've sunk you're welcome here In fact, why don't you come sit in the front row? We're slick, too. (laughs) The making of amends is a process by which I continually advance my becoming a part of the human race. More and more, I fit into more and more places. And that's what it's all about for me, is to belong here. I accept you as you are where you are. That means now we can talk. I don't have to agree with you. I don't even have to like you. And I don't like some of you. That's a fact. (laughs) Some of you don't like me either. I don't much give a damn, but that's a fact too. (laughs) But I will make every effort to cause no more harm. Uh, Don't want to go off and get philosophical. But it's a constant process. It's not, I'm sorry, the the addressing of the wrong that I was done is only the beginning of the activity. The thing with my mother was about regular. I go by on a regular basis. One time when I was there, my, my brother, it took 22 years before my brother and I could get back together. Because what I had done to him was not direct. When he was 19, he was writing music with Stan Kenton. When I was 19, I was in a federal penitentiary in Tokyo, Japan. I was his hero. And I betrayed our dreams. My dreams, his dreams, our dreams. He watched the harm I did to the family. My brother is a straight arrow. He would put together bands and I would sell them marijuana. comes together (laughs) (laughs) at least for the trumpet players (laughs) so it took a long time and he's a very decent man very kind man so he never but he was cold it was clear we got nothing going on he watched me for 22 years that's how deeply he was hurt took 22 years for him to even consider And then he invited my wife and I over for dinner one night. And after dinner, he said, You know, I don't know if you and I are ever going to be friends, Don, but this was nice. We can do this again. Which was the beginning. On one of those trips home, because when I was in North Carolina, I still went home. You got to visit your folks on a regular basis. My wife would come down here, and then I'd go back there for a weekend. And I was visiting Mom, and my brother came in. I sat down and we were just chatting. And I had my leg crossed like this and all of a sudden he kicked me on the bottom of the shoe. And he said, you know, Don, I'm really glad to see you. And he was shocked because he really was. I've <laughs> 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 for a long time. He says, look, next time you're in town, let you and I go up to the cabin and do a little fishing. Now, I'm a listener. That is not what he said. He said, next time you're in town, you and I need to spend a whole day without telephones and interruptions. 
and straighten us out. So we went to the cabin. We spent the whole day doing it. And uh, as the discussion ended, he said to me, you know, there's one other thing I need to tell you, Don. He said, I'm 58 years old, and I believe I've made a decent contribution to life. That's important stuff. You don't just say that to anybody. We have put it back together. And in putting it back together, one of the things we realized, he said to me, we're doing the same thing. He's a very spiritual man. He said, I'm trying to reach people with my music, to touch them at depth, to stir them. And he said, and I've watched you. You do the same thing. I use my music as my instrument. You use your mouth as your instrument. But we're doing the same thing. We don't have much in common, my brother and I. We love each other. We like each other. There are very specific things we do together, but not much. I mean, he just got back from Russia and Scandinavia where they took him to teach music for a while. Uh, he's the head of the sound engineers organization and is a very busy man. In addition, he writes a symphony every year for the Colorado Symphony. And just lightweight stuff. He's busy. I'm busy. So we get together from time to time. We, he and my mom came over the other night. Just to sit down and have hamburgers. We do that pretty good. I love to go to his shows. He's had a spiritual experience with a Navajo one time and has put together a show called Navajo Star Lore. They have these wonderful stories. And he was touched so much that he wanted to put them to music. And he put together the show that you wouldn't believe. It starts with the sound of a quasar. Whoop. Then he breaks out all the sounds that make up that one sound. If you have a little bit of chaos, and then he's a, an improvisational jazz musician. He begins to pull them all together, and he and his son and girlfriend begin to make music. And then he narrates the story, and you can hear it. Stuff like that. I'm kind of proud of him. But we don't do much together. That's not what it's about. There are members in my home group... <clears throat> We do a lot of things together. There's other members of my home group. That's about all we do together. They have their own lives to lead. I think I'm about done because I've got about a three-hour talk bubbling up in me. Because <laughs> I really, really wish you could see the world as I see it. And uh, if you'll just keep doing this, you will. But only as much as you want to see. One of the most profound statements I ever heard was when in Nelson, Nelson Mandela's <coughs> inauguration speech. And I can't quote it, but I can give you the essence. Most of us are not afraid of failure. What we're afraid of is our own excellence. And our job on this planet is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and those about us. This is from a guy somewhere else saying the same thing I hear. My job is to make myself fit so that my magnificence can come out once in a while and touch you so you can go touch somebody else. And it's a simple thing. It's a healing thing. And I do it by changing, by allowing myself to be changed. I love actors because I am one. So I, I watch Bravo's actor studio where they bring the best on and ask them how they do it. I like to listen to that. And Chris Walken was on the other night. And whether you like him or not, he's one of the best. And James Lipton asked him, Chris, why is it that you think you're a good actor? And he said, oh, I simply make myself available to the material. And that's the essence of, of my life. I make myself available to the material. In AA words, that means you don't say no to an AA request. You say yes. Just make yourself available. You all have done that. You're excellent. Oh, you are. <laughs> oh, yeah. You're goofy, but you're excellent. <laughs> Is that lay the ground work you wanted laid? I think that's just right now. I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll run dry. It's time one, to go. one thing, uh, the reason he wants to sit and listen to Mozart because he doesn't know about Coltrane. That's the <laughs>
that was a that was an awfully good sex session that uh, Donald did this morning. That uh, extremely well done. That I don't think I've ever heard a, a men's dealt with in a more sound spiritual kind of way, and that that, that whole process of restoration that comes out of that was 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 good, and it does set up well for where I'd kind of like to lead us toward this morning. Uh, it was, you know what he was talking about was that thing of getting ready to engage in life, and he gave a lot of examples of how to do it. And I'd, I'd like to kind of focus around the last three steps of the program, and particularly in terms of, of how that how that gets us into the business of living. Uh, you know, some people refer to those steps as maintenance steps. I don't, uh, because I think they are tremendous action steps that spell out a, a real a route and a direction for uh, for putting the program into into maximum use. And uh, let me just stick one little thought in your mind to to, uh, to 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 worry around a little bit. We used it last night in the in the in the discussion we had at, at meeting after the meeting, and uh, it it sort of has some meaning for me. And it's it's about some people would call it thinking out of the box, but but I like to think of, of, the, of the, the, the idea is thinking beyond the circle of my personal magic. Of thinking beyond the circle of, 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 you know, so often we look at things in terms of what I believe, what I feel, what I do, how I work with somebody. And, and if we're going to really be effective in, in trying to, to be of maximum service to God and those around us, you know, I believe that we have to get beyond that circle of personal magic of just what I personally do and start seeing how the fellowship as a whole, the group as a whole, are, are part and parcel of, of what my effectiveness will be about. If I think of it only in terms of what I personally do, it'll be an extremely limited thing. And so I have to find ways to get locked in and married in to uh, the things that make that effectiveness growth and so those just keep that in mind a, a little bit as we're going along and I'm not sure exactly how it is to spell out I don't have it have it written up but I want to get into some 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 tangible issues that have to do with with making that stuff happen um, you know I like I like to I just kind of hit the steps and then we'll get to get in it the uh, Tenth step to me is uh, it does a number of things. Uh, one, I think the, one of the basic functions of the tenth step is slip prevention. And they, they, it has a way of, of, of assuring that I'm on solid ground doing what I'm supposed to do so that I stay constantly aware of what's happening and don't let those, those, those things start cropping up that rob me of my sobriety, of my peace of mind, of my well-being. Uh, so it has a very practical value in that. To me, it also has a, a, a tremendous value in terms of, of taking a look at how I'm plugging this way of life into being a way of life. Uh, like what, what I do at a practical level is I, I, when I review, normally at the end of a day, I review what that day's been. And, and, you know, the, the, the emphasis is looking for places where we were wrong and where we've got some stuff that we need to straighten out. But I think written in that very heavily is the, uh, the notion of taking stock of what was right as well. And, and so today, when, when, I, when I do that at the end of my day, it's a rare day when I am not absolutely overwhelmed with the, the tremendous things that have happened in my life uh, just by practicing the principles. And you know, my, my buddy Steve back there is probably as much a past master at doing what I'm talking about as anybody I know. And it's just simply loosening up and trying to add a little something to the people around us. You know, Don, Don was talking about it a little bit that, that when I'm focused on doing things for other people, Mine is a given you know, that I absolutely can't give. I can't give more than I get. 
Let me tell you just a couple of things of, of, of what I'm talking about. And, and this is daily stuff. I mean, this is not once in a while. This is daily stuff that comes from just simply being free to be responsive to opportunities to be of service. I, I start my day normally. I, I don't have a rote prayer, but I basically start my day by asking God to help me go through the day in a way that would, would seem worthy of the gift I've been given. Now tell me what kind of an attitude I want to have. And then very importantly, to be sensitive to opportunities to be of service. Because, my God, they're everywhere, but often I don't see them. I don't look at them. Or if I see them, I don't acknowledge them. And so what I want to do is be sensitive to, op- to opportunities to be of service. And, and they're everywhere. And, like, I, I tell you one thing that I, I ran into that, um, uh, just a couple of examples. There, there's a place where I used, when I was working, I'm unemployed now, but when I was working and before I started loafing, I used to go for lunch. I either go full bore or not at all. Yeah. And once in a while, I would slip next door to another office building and get some emergency rations, you know, just some little grilled cheese sandwich or something just to sort of keep the wolf out. And one day I went over there and went into the, to, to the place, and there was a little, little mousy girl that was working. And she looked like she had been beaten by every weapon known to man. I mean, she, she just was a, a beat up, disheveled little old gal. And uh, I mean, she needed somebody just to sort of lift it up a little bit. I was there. I figured I'd do it. And so I just started messing with her a little bit. You know, just just, just playing a little bit about stuff. And <laughs> I don't know what. It didn't matter what. Just any human interaction was good news to her. It didn't look like she'd had any for a, a good while. And so, and so we started doing a thing. And, uh, and she said, well, what do you want? I said, a tuna sandwich. And, and I like tuna pretty good. And it's a good thing. Because when she fixed that tuna sandwich... I mean, that sucker was running off the plate. I had tuna on me. On the, everybody around me. I mean, she just got carried away with that thing. And uh, but I mean, that was her way of responding. Yeah. Now, I'm not looking for uh, an overdose of tuna. I'm just trying to, trying to help a little, little gal out. But, you know, the point is that you can't give away more than you get. And uh, about six months later, I went back over there for another dose of <laughs> she was still there and when I walked in the door you would have thought that the guy from the 10 million dollar sweepstakes walked in because she still starts grinning and she grabs that bread and starts <laughs> <laughs> I wanted a ham sandwich I didn't know. <laughs> but, but, but that's what happened you know that, that if, if I just turned loose and, and, and sort of engage in the business of living and try to be of service, just lighten it up for somebody, you know, whoever it is. Amazing what happens. Amazing what happens. That what, happen, what happens is that the world I live in becomes a different place. If I let myself do it, I could start being anxious about the world I live in because I live in the same world everybody lives in. And most people tend to sense a real hostility and a lack of civility. Now, I know it's there. And once in a while, I'll run into a jerk. But i got enough sense to get away from them. And most of the time, what I run into is incredibly good folks who respond well to decent treatment. Uh, like Donald, like I spend a lot of time in airports. And I don't like it one bit. Uh, the fun went out of flying for me a little over 30 years ago. And so I have absolutely no joy in, in that activity. And, and since the stuff has happened and, and, and that, that security nightmare started to happen, I enjoy it even less. And, and so it's not a pleasant thing. I, I know the first weekend after, after the, the, uh, the New York thing, I went to the airport prepared for the worst, and I wasn't prepared enough because it was worse than I expected. And so I went in there, 
And it was just pure bedlam. I mean, it took an hour to get in the terminal, never mind on the plane. And uh, when I was in line, I was watching a, a little gal. Well, little gal is not the right term, but she was a lady. And, and she, if you thought we had trouble, you should have seen what she was doing. This gal was having to handle every passenger who were routinely disgruntled. They were already mad about being marched around with an Uzi. And she had to not only handle the people, then she had to take the suitcase and carry it, or cases, and carry it a considerable distance and search the thing, then search the people while there's somebody else getting mad at the counter. And this girl was sweating, I mean, big time. And so I got up to her and I said, my God, girl, you look like you're not having a whole lot of fun with this thing. I said, why don't you work on to quitting time and take the rest of the day off? And she, she, she said, you bet I will. And I ain't going to be here tomorrow either. I'm going on vacation. I said, you go, girl. That's exactly what you ought to do. Take some time off. Well, I mean, I'm just messing around with her, you know. And uh, so we get through with that. And t- if she finally met somebody that wasn't mad. And, and so we just had a nice little th- deal there. And, and, she, and, I, and I started walking away. And she called out to me. She said, hey, wait a minute. Come back. <laughs> and I went back. Now, I'm talking about a nut house scene. She kicked me to first class. <laughs> Most people couldn't even get on the plane. But she can, now, I can just imagine whoever this New York businessman was that said, we're full in first class. You've got to move the coach. <laughs> I didn't look for him at all. <laughs> but, but you see what I'm talking about? And that's not manipulation. It's just what happens when I do things that, for no real reason, other than to just practice these principles in the way I live. And, and what a difference it makes. You know, that it's not just squishy kind of stuff for waiting for mystical things to happen. That if I put it in place... My God, what a difference it makes in the way I live. And I don't know about you, but that's the kind of world I want to live in. I don't want to live in a world that's that's full of anger and and distance and coldness. I want to live in a place where there's a good, warm kind of working relationship with people. And that's what I find everywhere I go. You know, people tell me that every city I go in is the worst one in the country. But I swear to God, I can't find out why. If people tell me California, you're just at high risk to even get off the plane. And I have never had anything but cordial, helpful interaction with people. Uh, amazing. And the only difference, is, you know, I'm the same guy who used to, to have antagonistic relationships with everybody. And so that simple thing of, it's not just the, the tenth step that that you know, we talk about these steps being connected it's kind of like I mentioned yesterday this whole process is connected they're not isolated activities that we do mechanically it's a way of life that if practiced as a way of life changes the quality of that life and, 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 and so 10th step is just a way of, of putting it in place and reviewing whether it's happening or not and, and it's enormously gratifying to me to, to, uh, to, to be able to see that. You know, what, what, what I have to recognize is that the way I live my life is the most important message I'll ever deliver to anybody. It's not wisdom. It's not a whole bunch of knowledge about stuff. It's the way that I live my life. And it's amazing how much, it, it, you know, certainly as you get older in the program, it's amazing how much people watch what you do. Because uh, that's how they evaluate. You know, I, I was at an assembly a while back, and um, we were voting on something. And it's voting. And Jesus, if you've ever been to assembly, you know it's, it's about like making sausage. It's, it is not a pretty process. And, and we just have an amazing faculty to take an issue and gum it to death. I mean, we'll beat it forever. So we were voting on this goofy issue, and I didn't agree with it. I, I thought it was dumb, well-intended, but anyway. So I was voting against it for about the fourth time. 
And then I did some math, and I said, shoot, this thing ain't going nowhere, but I'm going to get it off the floor if I can. So the next time I came up, I voted for it. Well, I didn't think anybody going to pay attention to that. I bet you I had at least six or eight people come to me, why'd you change your vote? I got tired of messing with the dumb thing. That's what I mean. <laughs> But people watch that. And so the way I live my life is a tremendous amount of what I'm about. You know, like, I'm kind of careful about where I hang out. Uh, my, uh, uh, my wife's not an alcoholic, and, and she didn't do much drinking. She'd given up on that. But we'll have company sometimes, and, and, and she likes to have some booze for some of her wealthy relatives from up in Canada. And uh, she wants me to go get it. <laughs> well, I'm an obedient husband, you know, so I go over there. And, and I swear to God, every time, now I'm grown, you know, I haven't been carted for a long, long time. But, but every time I walk in an ABC store, I want to sort of put a bag over my head or something. <laughs> <laughs> because I, my thought is, suppose some guy that I just had in a newcomer group last night watches me going in and says, oh, I see how this works. <laughs> yeah. You don't drink on Tuesday, but on Wednesday you come down here and load up. You know? <laughs> I doubt that very many are going to say, oh, I understand his wife sent him on a mission. Yeah. No. <laughs> the, the way I live, you know, I'm free to do whatever I want to, but I'm responsible to do things that will be attractive to folk if I want to be effective. And so how I live my life is a critically important thing in, in, in terms of, of, of that thing we're talking about on, on how to be effective and also how to get the real rewards that come in, in our college or not. Um, they, we'll go through this kind of quick like that. The um, 11th, 11th, a lot of time, and when I first started looking at, at, uh, at, uh, at 11th, I really thought of it as a go stare at your navel step, you know, where you go off and find some secluded place and think great thoughts and, and all of that. And certainly there's a place for that. You know, there, 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 there's truly a place for feeding the soul, you know, for, for just quietly finding a place. Like I, I've, um, I'm a guy that loves water. And uh, I don't like to get in it all that much, but I just like to be around it. And there's nothing to me more, more restful or uh, soothing than to get around moving water. You know, I just love kind of getting rapids and stuff like that and waterfalls. And uh, I wanted a pond for a number of years and uh, thought about building it, but I'm not smart enough. And so I finally wound up getting somebody to, I wanted it, but I didn't want to take that money. And so I gave it to my wife for her 33rd wedding anniversary. And... Uh, <laughs> I thought I was being real slick. And, and, you know, I've, been, I've been talking to her for 10 years about how much I wanted that thing. And so I said, it's yours. <laughs> She's starting to like it a little bit. I, <laughs> but you know, that, was, that was something I really wanted. And, and so my morning deal now, where I do a lot of the, the meditation and stuff like that, I sit out with that pond, you know, the beast and I sit out there and I have my coffee and, and read the paper and stuff like that. So I like that. You know, there's a great place for just sort of getting spiritually prepared to do stuff. But when I look at 11, I find it uh, now to be one of the most powerful action steps in the program. If I'm really wanting to let this program become the guide for my way of life, because what it says is that, that, that there are a couple of components of that. One certainly is to sit by the pond and think heavy thoughts and to get spiritually connected and to improve that relationship. Very, very important. But for what purpose? And, 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 and right in the middle of that step it says praying only for knowledge of His will. When I'm, when I'm seeking through prayer and meditation, praying only for knowledge of His will for me and the power to carry that out. And therein lies my purpose. Now, I don't think it comes in just one failed swoop of saying, okay, you're supposed to go do a workshop in Virginia. I don't think it happens like that. But it does open me up to being willing to serve. 
And, and, and so that step to me becomes a powerful thing where I am now willing, now that I'm able, you know, now that I've gotten rid of the baggage, now that I've gotten open to being of service, I think this is where it starts to formulate a plan of action. And that I'm responsive to the things that come along. I want to know the knowledge of God's will for me and the power to carry that out. And, and my God, does it ever happen? Does it ever happen? The minute I become willing. And, and from the time that I became willing, it's, it's been a, a long, long time since I've had an empty agenda. I mean a long, long time. Uh, I've been doing stuff like, like we're doing here. I don't mean workshop, but stuff here for 40 years. For 40 years I've been doing it. And um, first, somebody reminded me yesterday, the first conference I ever spoke at was the Virginia State Convention in 62 uh, at a quality inn on Highway 64, not that I remember or count, but in 1962 at, uh, at uh, over by what you call it, Norfolk, at Norfolk. And from that time to this, you know, I've done a lot of this kind of thing and a lot of stuff in AA Beyond. I've made it a practice. It, 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 Don said it this morning that I never say no, never say no to a genuine request for service. And the way I look at it, these steps help me to get a new manager in my life. And if I'm going to be the guy who's the resident critic of, of, of what the, the directions are that come, what the opportunity is to come, if I'm going to pick and choose on the basis of of what I think fits me best, I'm contradicting the whole process. So I've made it a practice of, of, of never saying no. And it, it's, a, it's a phenomenal thing in a way, this stuff of, you know, of getting on airplanes and doing, doing things. In 40 years, I have never had to miss one single co commitment, except one, except one. And uh, I, I, I'm not mystical about stuff, but I was, I was out in Tennessee and, and I was doing a little traditions thing at, a, at an assembly. And in the course of it, some brought it up, and I mentioned that I had never missed a commitment and never had to because of illness, weather, broke planes, or anything. It's always worked out. And uh, I said, gee whiz, I ought not to have said that because I bet I'll have to miss the next one. <laughs> well, the next week I'm supposed to go to Florida. And we had two feet of snow in North Carolina. We don't get two feet of snow in North Carolina. And when we do, we sure don't know what to do with it. <laughs> there was absolutely nothing moving in North Carolina. I couldn't get out of my driveway for three days. And uh, I, 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 I really was an important lesson for me in that thing. I, I was on the phone with the guy that was my contact in Florida. It was about like the death watch from the go waiting on the call from the governor. You know, I'm calling down there. I said, I'm trying Amtrak. And then Lilia called back. didn't work. We're going to try this. Well, I tried everything and nothing was there. Finally accepted the fact that I wasn't going. <laughs> so I called him up like I'm delivering the fact I'm sorry, man. We're going to have to unplug the life support. And <laughs> man, I'm, I'm just not going to be able to do it. There's nothing smoking getting out of here. And uh, he said, oh, what the hell? <laughs> I thought that was absolutely perfect. It was absolutely perfect. It was totally appropriate that I was highly concerned about that. It was even more appropriate that it didn't make that much difference. It didn't make much difference to them. In fact, he told me later they already had another speaker already lined up. They knew I wasn't coming. But, <laughs> but they let me go through all of that stuff to do what I was doing. So that to me is the way I, you know, I like to look at how I, wanna, I want to be available to carry out God's plans for me. So that when I find out what's God's will, I don't get in the way of it. <clears throat> I mentioned yesterday about paying attention to hunches. And when I get a hunch about something, I have to take it pretty seriously because it normally has some real weight to it. And so being available to service, being available for God's plan, my belief is this. It, it's just mine. It doesn't make it right. But my belief is that for every one of us, 
who goes through this program of recovery, whether we AA, Al-Anon, uh, Alateen, whoever, if we work these steps and they become a way of life, <coughs> I believe an avenue of service will open up. And it'll, uh, it may be many things, many things, but it'll open up. And I be personally believe that without any question, the quality of my recovery will hinge on how I respond to that. If I'm able to just take a look at the avenues of service that open up and walk away, I'm the loser. I'm the loser. And when I do that and walk away, I'm diminished in the process. If I can take a look at a need that needs to be addressed and I'm capable of addressing it and I walk away, I lose. I lose. And, and so it's critical for me in terms of becoming a real functioning, well-rewarded uh, member of the world and member of AA that when those, those opportunities come that I do them. Yeah, I think everybody in the world has a story that somebody needs to hear. You've got a story that somebody needs to hear. Don't need to hear mine. They need to hear yours. And when I selfishly withhold that, I lose big time. And so a real action step you know, of, of, of finding a way to, to, to serve, of being open for those kinds of experiences that, that, that bring me out of myself, uh, gets you into some deep water. I tell you this, that even though that has, has been my track record, I have never yet, taken on a, a, an activity that I felt perfectly comfortable to do. Never have. Now, even though I've, I bet you I've talked 10,000 times in AA, I have never done it without a certain level of tension and anxiety. You know, I mean, it's not like the first time I did it when I got, got blacked out. I mean, I literally <laughs> blacked out the first time I ever spoke. And... Uh, but it's always there. And I personally think it always should. Yeah. I sort of got it in the back of my mind. If I ever get to the point that I can just comfortably get up in front of, of a group and talk with no, no neurons firing, I think I'm going to sit back down. Because that means that it's moved to my head instead of my heart. And, and there's something intimate and personal about what we do in AA, or else it loses its meaning. And so I think that's really appropriate. It was also appropriate that when I responded to those things, recognized that I had to step through the fear, but recognize the value of stepping through the fear. If I live within my comfort zone, I'll never go anywhere. And, and so really important for me to be in the spiritual condition that I'm ready and willing to serve, and I'll become able awfully important for me and um, in the in the 12th we, we, we're talking about the, the, the stuff of of, um, of really making this a way of life where you're know, having having done these things there's 200 words in the steps and having done what's laid out there what it says to me is that I'm going to have a spiritual awakening I'll have an awakened spirit I'll have a different way of looking at things this mind of this chronic alcoholic will be geared a different way. And that's, a, that's to me, is a real promise that's embodied in, in what we do. And then having had that happen, we do a couple of things. One is we try to carry this message to, 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 to other alcoholics by whatever method that we possibly can, no matter what it is. It's like what we're doing here today. Uh, I've been watching the, the stuff that's going on you know, Don and I have done the, the visible part of it. But the stuff that's behind this, what a powerful service that is. Now I watched how those things appeared on that table back there. I watched how they happened, how they happened yesterday. Tremendous service involved in that thing. Somebody got this hall. I watched people straightening up these chairs. You know, all of those are really valuable services that help make something happen. So opportunities to serve, opportunities to carry a message, go far beyond just what I can personally do. And so I think it opens up, and the uh, 
And, 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 and so our task is laid out in there is to try to carry this message by any message that a method that we can. And, and then practice the principles in our affairs. You know, that, that's the kind of thing I was talking about in 10. It sounds easy. Except I'm going to, oh, here it is. I, I, I don't know, I thought I lost my coffee. It sounds kind of, kind of cliche like to say that practice these principles in our affairs. And I don't want to skim by that too lightly. And, I, and I'll just touch on this thing and then maybe come back to it a little bit when we get into to, to, to this, this other part. I think it's awfully, awfully important for these principles to be engaged in this process to keep from self-destructing. Uh, we can self-destruct in this program if the principles aren't solidly in place. And uh, there's an important thing that I, I think it was important for me is to understand the difference between real purposeful action in Alcoholics Anonymous and activity. Big difference in that. You know, purposeful action as opposed to activity. You know, for when I was first in the program and I didn't even know what purposeful action meant, I was a guy who was fantastically active. And I don't second guess that one bit today because it served its purpose. You know, it protected me from myself. It kept me too busy to get in trouble. It kept me getting out of myself and getting acquainted with other people and learning about the program. You know, I don't, I don't question it. Uh, I know that I was hid in that activity for a while, and it helped me get the muscles to start engaging in life. So nothing wrong with that. <coughs> but if I see a guy with a, a good number of years of sobriety who's still frantically making seven meetings a week, I'd be about as concerned about that person as I was somebody making one meeting a week because there's something really out of whack with that. Yeah. The... Um, Learning the difference between activity and action is tremendously important. Don talked about a thing that, that about how we get trust in the people that we uh, that we we enter or we're really closely related to. Think about this a minute. We say sometimes, I used to say it, but I don't say it now, that AA has to come first. It has to come before everything else. I don't say that anymore because I don't believe that anymore. Because when I try to operate under that banner, I set up some real red flag conditions in the life of me and the people who are close to me. If I say to my wife, you know, if, I, if she doesn't understand the difference between what I'm committed to and what I'm just doing, I've got a lot of trouble. If I say to my wife that, well, Wednesday I'm going to run over here and I'm going to do this, and she's got some trouble with that, and I say, well, you know, AA's got to come first. Well, there'll be a fight at my house. I, I don't know about <laughs> you, but there'll be a fight. You know, because there are other things that are important. You know, the uh, what What I have to do, that's critically important for me, and I am an extremely active member of AA. And it's, it's doubly important for an extremely active member, and I know some of you are. My family fully understands, everybody who knows me understands, that I have some commitments that are not negotiable. They're not negotiable. My home group is a commitment that's not negotiable. And if I'm not there, it's because I've got some, I'm, I either cannot get there, or I've got some service that I'm doing that I think is, 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 is worth making the move to do. But otherwise, it's an absolute commitment. And like Don was saying, if you want to find Tom Ivester, you go to Moore County, you say, where is that boy? If it's Monday, they'll tell you to go over to the Baptist Church of Southern Pine, you'll find him. Uh, if it's Thursday, they'll tell you the same thing. Now, that's important in terms of being trustworthy. And my family understands that that's a commitment, and there's absolutely no conflict. That's who I am. And you can trust me that that's exactly what I do. And, and so, the other day, my son came to town, and it was a very unique experience. He wanted to take us to dinner. And he's... <laughs> 
he's been a he's been a struggling medical student for a lot of years, and he's now self-supporting as a young physician out in Tennessee, and he could finally afford to take us to dinner. And so he said, "Dad, I want to take you guys to dinner?" I said, "That's great." And uh, only thing is that he caught a little look in my eye, and he caught himself. I didn't have to say a word. He said, "Oh, wait a minute, this is meeting night." He said, "We'll." Do a different time. Yeah. No problem. But suppose I'd have said to my young visiting physician, no, I'm sorry, son, I got something to do in AA tonight, and that's more important to you because that's got to come first. See what I'm talking about? You know, just a simple thing of letting people know who I am and what my commitments are, not what my values are about them as opposed to this. So when I say to somebody, AA hey, got to come first, that's a, an insult to somebody. And it's a contradiction of practicing principles. Now, there are also principles involved in a marriage. There are principles involved in a parental relationship, in a work relationship. Sometimes we get into a box of, of, um, of, of trying to compartmentalize our lives. You know, people talk about balance, and they'll use some sort of graphic demonstration of you know, so much time for work and so much time for play and so much time for AA. And, um, and it's not real bad thinking. It just sort of misses a very important point. Is that if I'm doing it right, if I'm practicing these principles as a way of life, AA does not compete with anything in my life. It does not compete with anything in my life. If it does, I'm not doing it right. If it doesn't make me a better employee where I work, not doing it right. If it doesn't make me a better parent, a better husband, a better employer, not doing it right. Because this this is a way of life. It's not an activity. It's not something that I go do and get what I need and then get on with my life. You know, it, it, it undergirds and makes happen everything in my life. And so that's what's so important to me about having real commitments about what I do in this program and then having commitments to other things as well so that I can have a, a well-balanced life. And so if I do it that way, I'm not, not running into to, to opposition and roadblocks and, and, and creating friction in things. I can resolve that on the basis of the principle. And, and so... Uh, I go into that a little bit because it, 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 it lends to, 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 to stuff that, that when you start thinking beyond your your level of what I call it the circle of your personal magic. When you start thinking beyond that, you got to get into broader issues than just how I do my sobriety and how I do my home group. And then when we start thinking in those terms, it, it starts looking at some expanded kinds of activities, expanded kind of thinking. And awfully important to me to be to be well grounded and to understand that difference about committed actions as opposed to just frantic activity. Um, when when I look at, at what I want to get done as an AA member, I, I guess if I had to identify a mission, and you probably got your own. If I, had, if I wanted to identify a mission of what is it that I really want to contribute to Alcoholics Anonymous in gratitude for what's been given me, it would be something very much like this. I want to do everything that I possibly can, contribute everything that I can to ensuring that the next man, woman, boy or girl who comes through that door gets as good as was given to me. I don't think I can do any less than that. And that's what I want to do. Now, that's a tall order. Yeah. Certainly what I do in the circle of my own personal magic is a vital part of that. Yeah. Certainly there's a contribution to be made. Like, I welcome people to Alcoholics Anonymous. Yeah. I don't care where I am. I guarantee you I do it in my home group. If somebody gets out of my home group without me wrestling, arm wrestling with them, you can bet that they hid, because you know, I'm going to get that turkey if he walks in there. Home group members, everybody, I'm going to make sure 
that everybody who walks in there knows they're welcome or they're going to know that they've been harassed one or the other. <laughs> <laughs> that is their choice, you know. <laughs> but, so I can do that. You know, I, I can do that. And that has its value. You know, one of the minimum values that it has is that it makes every meeting I attend a warm and welcoming place <laughs> because it starts with me. And so I'm not somebody who, who hides in corners and this kind of stuff. I'm somebody who gets right out into the mainstream of the action. And, 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 and so I can do that. But that's limited, isn't it? That's limited. That's just one little thing. It's valuable. Like I went in to speak at a little meeting uh, down below where I live. And uh, <laughs> I just did my usual thing. You know, just walk around, shaking hands with folks and, and all that stuff. And I met some lady I didn't know. And she came over afterward. She said, can I ask you a, a personal question? I said, sure. What? what? She said, what do you sell? <laughs> 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 I said, well, nothing. I, I, well, I said, wait a minute. Yeah, I do. I said, I sell recovery, and I got one hell of a deal on that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's true. And that's true. Yeah, because if I want to be somebody who contributes to the attraction of Alcoholics Anonymous, I can do that. I can do that. And it'll have some value. Okay. So that's one of the things I can do. But that's a limited thing. And so if I want Alcoholics Anonymous to be a place where somebody can count on getting as good as I was given, that's one little contribution. But it's tiny. So what do I do beyond that? I'm somebody who believes that a home group, a home group, is a vital, not only a vital, but the most vital single ingredient in Alcoholics Anonymous. We call it the basic building block. And I believe that it, it absolutely starts with a home group. See, my personal, my circle of personal magic is going to have influence, but limited influence. And when I meet with somebody, whether I'm doing it individually or whatever, yeah, I can do my thing, but if I don't have a group that delivers on what I promise, I've sold them a bill of goods. And I have to recognize that my personal magic is only going to go so far. And so I've got to have a group that I can trust to deliver the goods. And so when I take them in there, I want, I want that group to be a place where alcoholics have a good chance to get well, a good chance to know that <clears throat> excuse me, that they're in the right place. And so I have to think bigger than just me and my magic. I've got to think about my dependence on a group to get what I need and to be sure that folk get what they need. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you what's important. Well, I don't need to tell you. You know what's important about that. I had a 12-step call one day, and uh, and uh, I messed with the fellow all day long, and he was actually agreeing with some stuff. And I, and I got him to a meeting. And I wanted to take him to a newcomer meeting for obvious reasons. And uh, so I, I remembered a group that had a newcomer meeting. And I went over, and uh, they the huge group. And they announced how they were going to break up, and the newcomer meeting was going to stay where we had convened, and then others were going to scatter out to other meetings. Well, I bet 85 people stayed in a newcomer. I said, my God, they've had an epidemic up here. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody dropped. <laughs> well, and all it was was just people hanging out. You know, you, you, in an ill-defined newcomer meeting, you'll get a lot of mixed baggage. You get some newcomers. And there were a couple in there, I think. You get a lot of people that want to hide somewhere to keep from doing anything. And you got some that want to beat up newcomers if they get an opportunity. And so here we sat, 85 people, and I got a brand new drunk sitting with me. And they start some, almost sound like a who's got a problem <laughs> meeting. I, and we were just going into some mundane kind of conversation. And I'm sitting there, talk about throwing up. You know, let's talk about something made sense to a newcomer. And I mean, it wasn't nothing happening. Nothing happened. And this guy is more brain dead than I was. And, and now normally, 
Yeah, I'm not somebody that just likes to speak up in a meeting. I, I just don't like that. I, I learned not to volunteer very much, and so I just don't like it a bit. And but that time I did. I, I, I figured if I wanted him to hear it, I better say it. You know, cause, well, you've been listening to me all day. I wanted somebody else to say it. Uh, so, stuck my hand up, and I started talking newcomer stuff. An amazing thing happened. You know, I just said a few words, and you could see people turn around looking, like, where'd this guy come from? You know, and started listening, because I was not the only guy in there that was totally frustrated by a newcomer meeting that wasn't a newcomer meeting. Uh, and, and such a simple little action can make a difference. Now, it was not going to make a permanent difference, but it made a difference in that meeting. From that point forward, I didn't chew anybody out and say, y'all are misrepresenting. I just started demonstrating what ought to happen in a newcomer meeting. And then people jumped right in. The meeting never went back to what it had been before. Now, that's not a major solution, but at least it's an action. You know, and, and the point is that if I want my group to be effective, i got to be careful that it's a group that has the capacity to be effective. If it's a newcomer meeting, it needs to be a newcomer meeting that actually does newcomer stuff. So that when somebody comes in, I can count on that resource being delivered effectively as we're capable of doing. And that's part of that thing about thinking beyond just just my own limitations, my, my own personal circle of my own personal magic. But, but starting to think about how the group becomes a huge resource. You know, I want to be sure that when somebody comes into my group, they know it's a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't want them to have to guess what we're meeting about. I want them to know. Now, I, that sounds like a throwaway, but I'll guarantee you I've walked into many meetings in this country that would have defied Bill Wilson to interpret it as a, as a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. You couldn't tell what it was. Well, I can handle that now. But suppose I'm a brand new person that's trying to see if there's any hope for me at the last stop on the bus line. And I walk into a meeting that's so ill-defined that you can't tell what it is. And that's a very real issue in this country. A very real issue. And so part of what I can do is try to be sure that my place talks Alcoholics Anonymous. That is not myriad problems anonymous, it's Alcoholics Anonymous. That's what it's about. And recognize that we've got a clear purpose to be served here. You know, like one of the things that we deal with enormously now and have for a number of years is this thing about about uh, well, I, don't know, I guess it all sort of, sort of came from the time when we started doing wholesale treatment of folks. And we started getting just various people sort of shifted into Alcoholics Anonymous with the, the, the thing of dual addiction or just addiction is, a, is an enormous problem around this country. And when I get off an airplane in most any city that I go, there are two problems that are paramount when I start asking how things are. One is the thing of, of, uh, of dual addiction, that we, we, we just don't have real alcoholics anymore. we got hybrid types, and we got such an influx of addicts that we just don't know how to deal with them. It's a huge, huge problem around the country. There are places where it's no longer an issue. Folks have just given up. They've just given up and let it become whatever it is. Now, I would, I would suggest to you that that is a tremendously piece of bad news. Tremendously piece of, a piece of tremendously bad news. When we start giving up any pretense of being what we say we are. Some people are tired of fighting. They've just given up. I have had a good friend, he died a while back, an old timer, that was a he was just almost the heart and soul of the group in Norfolk and the central group in, in, in Norfolk and and he, I was talking with him one day and he said that he was no longer in the central group and I said why 
My God, man, you've been there since day one. Why? And he said, it got so bad I couldn't stand it. And he did that, that white flight thing, you know, like he ran out of the city and hid in the suburbs. Now, I can understand that. I can understand getting frustrated with the fight. But that's what happens, you know, when, when we start to, to give up the battle. So what happens to folks who go into Central Group now? That, that kind of issue is, is the kind of thing where I think it's awfully important for those of us who want to serve effectively to recognize some responsibility in how we deal with this. Now, how do we do it? You know, and so in my home group, I can be sure that we do as much as I'm capable of doing to see that we have a genuine meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous so that when the person walks in who's alcoholic, he can have that sense of trust that he's in a place where folk understand and not walk in and have to guess at what the agenda is. Sounds like a minor thing. I'll tell you a thing that happened, and, and, and some of us were chatting about it a little bit last night, that we had a group I was in, in fact, I think it was the one, I mean, a different group now, but the one that Don was talking about. There one night, and a guy came to me after meeting and said, uh, Tom, we need a group inventory. I mean, that's an unusual kind of thing for somebody to say. I, I said, why? <laughs> he said, you've got too many addicts in you. And I said, what are you talking about? And so he told me. And, and, and what it turned out, I said, let me take a look, see if I see the same thing you do. And so I took a look, and what it was, that there, there was an adolescent treatment center there in town that had a bunch of youngsters. And they were they're herding them up and they're bringing them over to the group. And, and, and people at that point didn't have a clue what they were. They just knew that they were kids in trouble. That's all they knew. And they knew the catchphrases that they'd heard. They didn't know if they're alcoholics, addicts, or outer space marshals. They, <laughs> they, 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 so they come in... And uh, the problems that happened were mostly created by us. In order to try to make them feel welcome, we would have them get up and read something. Well, you know, that's a little bit of a contradiction when you got a, a 16-year-old drug addict doing the presentation, looks like, at an AME. And that's what it was. And, and so we had a little steering committee meeting and, and said, let's see what we can do about this talked about it and, and and they decided that somebody ought to go over to the facility and, and talk to people about the problem. They asked me if I'd do it and I said, yep, be glad to. So that went over met with the director of the facility and a uh, nice lady, nice lady. she never heard of a closed meeting. She just knew today was a place she sent people with problems. And so I explained to her what the problem was. She said, oh my gosh, yeah, we'll take care of that, no problem. See, nobody had ever bothered to tell her what we were about we just expected her to magically understand yeah and then we want to get mad at them and go burn their place down because <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but you know, if I want to do something about it how do I do it and yeah so that was one thing but that was the least important thing the problem wasn't them the problem was how we dealt with it and so what we did is we set up a newcomer program that is an open meeting and we don't care what he is when he comes in there. Because we recognize that when somebody comes out of halfway houses or treatment facilities or jails, there's a good chance that they're going to be thoroughly confused about what label fits them. And so what we don't want to do is have that resolved at the public level by embarrassing them in front of a crowd of people. We think that a person who finds themselves in Alcoholics Anonymous at a minimum ought to get a warm welcome and guidance about where they need to be. They don't need some angry old man like me humiliating them. And that's what happens sometimes. You know, we'll try to deal with these things rather than having a responsible way of dealing with it and helping folks figure out how to deal with their, with their problems. You know, if they can't get a warm welcome from us, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty bad news message. And so that newcomer program, what a tremendous resource. It's been one of the most valuable additions to our group. Group I'm in now. I doubt that I'll ever be in another group that I don't lobby hard to have that as part of it. 
because it's a way of effectively dealing with that. In, in all of the years that we've been doing that, with that newcomer deal, there have only been two incidents where there was any kind of an unpleasant exchange, you know, like an argument over something. Only two times. Both times, it was caused by our member who didn't know how to communicate something in anything less than negative terms. But we precipitated our own problem. And that's been a tremendous <coughs> resource. So when I start thinking about it, certainly I can't go out and, and, and change the world in that regard. But I can doggone well change the way I deal with it. And I can contribute to how our group deals with it. So that there's one place where somebody can come in and they can clearly understand that this is a program that that is for them. Yeah. And, and so we have that. We have that open thing at every one of our meetings so that um, we, we can deal effectively with that. So when I want somebody to get as good as I was given, that's one of the things I can do. It, and by the way, anybody wants to join in any time or just, just, just throw anything up, just, just have at it. Or you, you know I won't try to tease you out of it. It's just has to jump on. The, uh, so how I, do my, how I do my group is a tremendous contribution. That isn't enough. It's, it, it's from, important for me to recognize that it's, it's a sneaky kind of a thing, but I'm glad that I belong to a strong group. I'm really glad that I belong to a strong group. But it's important for me to recognize that that by itself isn't enough. I have to recognize that it's no better than the group next door. I have to recognize that most alcoholics in my county will not come to my group. They're going to go somewhere else. So while I value having a sound and solid group, part of what I want to evaluate is what kind of a neighbor are we to the next group. Is our contribution holding ourselves in contrast and saying, geez, you ought to be like us? Is that the way I approach it? Or do I approach it in a way of how can we contribute to this community? How can we contribute to the groups around us? The autonomy doesn't mean isolation. Our, our tradition about that says we're autonomous except in matters affecting other groups or A as a whole. So if all I can do is just sort of pump up with how wonderful we are, does that have a little impact? I suspect it does. I suspect it does. And sometimes those of us who get into good, strong groups like that get carried away with that kind of arrogant sense of self-righteousness or, or, or whatever. So it's very important for me to be connected and recognize that I'm a part of Alcoholics Anonymous as a whole. And just being one sound member or one sound group is not going to do it. I've got to be connected to other things. Uh, another thing that I can do and, and do is uh, to be connected to Alcoholics Anonymous as a whole. I'm the, <laughs> I'm the alternate DCM in my district. And uh, it's a good job. I don't really have any responsibility, but I've got a lot of work to do. I, I, I sponsored the DCM, and my job is to make him look good. <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and so we do some stuff. You know, we do some stuff at a district level that can help us be a good neighbor to other groups around. Uh, so I can contribute that way. I can try to be a well-informed member who's conscientious about what this fellowship's about. And I can try to be of service at the various levels that I can, can contribute. I'm the area chair, the state chair for uh, AA and Corrections in our state. And it's not, not, it's not, I'm not heroic particularly. It, it, it's just that it's kind of like I was saying earlier, I saw a contribution that I could make. I, you probably gathered from Don, I had a long career in Corrections. And uh, I retired a year uh, year and a half ago. And the day I, I retired, I had already been elected to be the chair 
of the A in corrections the day I retired. <laughs> so it did be legal then. And, and so the only thing I did, I just retired. All I quit doing was getting a paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> and I moved to the other side of the fence. And, and it, there were two reasons I did that. And, and, and I hope that you'll think of this in terms of your realm of influence, your, the realm of where you can have impact. When, when, I, when I retired, I'd been for 39 years dealing with the problems that are related to corrections, and I had watched what we do in corrections on a daily basis. Uh, and if there was anybody in the country that understood the frustrations and difficulties of trying to, to, to uh, work with corrections, it had to be this guy. And so when, when I left, I knew that I was in a, a unique position to be able to make a contribution. And the system, I was the oldest employee in the system, knew practically everybody in there. And I'd hired half of them, it seemed like. I swear to God, it seemed like most of them were folks that I'd known when they were rookies. And so when I walked out, I knew that I had access to that system like nobody else ever would have. And I knew that there were tremendous problems associated with, with, with AA members trying to work in corrections. And I thought, my God, man, how can I take a look at that and walk off and not do something about it? And so I took on a job. It's a two-year commitment. I'll finish it up about 150 days from now in uh, December. And there will be two things that I will hope to, to contribute to getting done in that two-year period. And then I will phase out of that and move on to something else, to whatever I do. But the point is that what I said earlier, if I could have looked at that situation, now certainly after 39 years, you know that the last thing I wanted to hear was a door slam behind me. You know that. But if I could have looked at that level of need, and my ability to contribute to it and walked away, I doubt that you would have wanted me to be here this weekend because that would say an awful lot about me. Uh, if I can take a look at a need and then just back away and say, gee, somebody ought to do something and not step up to the plate, I'm the loser in that. And so when, when I look at at, 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 at effectiveness and, and you know, how I can do something in this program, very important for me to recognize that it's, it's kind of like I, I mentioned earlier, sometimes we get so locked in to looking for excellence in our personal recovery. You know, and we'll get into sort of an endless series of workshops and studies and things like this. And if we don't watch it, that can be a real narrow world. Real narrow world where I'm spending my life checking my emotional pulse on a regular basis. And so, tremendously important for me, the vision is how can I start thinking bigger than that and how can I start being participant in things that will truly make a difference. And so, to me, that's a lot of where, when I look at effectiveness, that's the kind of things i got to do. There's a thousand more. But... Let's, let's stop and now and see if, if any, any kinds of reactions, questions, comments, or whatever. Uh, and I'll take a drink of coffee. Yeah. Um, I kind of feel interesting how you said a strong move to go and to do, speak with neighbors. And, um, cause that's to be here again. Um, but it's a little bit like Well, being, being a good neighbor, it, 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 what, what she was talking about was this, this idea of a, of a strong group being, being a good neighbor to the other groups around. And it's just like being a good neighbor in the neighborhood, you know, to being, being friendly with the folk around and to be, be kind in our thoughts. You know, a lot of times we want to criticize. Like, I was pretty critical of the stuff I was saying earlier about meetings that bear little resemblance to AA. But if I went there, I would try to go with an open mind and make a contribution. Uh, last Saturday, I, uh, we had something I was scheduled to do canceled, and I wound up not going anywhere. And so we got a bunch of folk from, from our group and just broke out some groceries. And you'll always gather a crowd if you break out groceries. So we got <laughs> had a bunch of folks show up. And so we 
pigged out and you goofed around, went to swimming pool, chased horses and stuff. Then we bunched up and went to a local meeting. Yeah. And we just dropped in. We weren't there to tell them how to do anything. We were just there to be a good neighbor. You know, we just sort of went in there and uh, they were so thrilled that we were there. <coughs> it doubled the size of their meeting that night. You know, cause we just came in and ate up all the donuts. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, simple things like that. You know, of just being and not getting caught up into that sort of subtle superiority of we're doing it right and they ain't. See, see, what I have to keep in mind is that we don't have a quality control department in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> and nobody can tell you when it's right. Yeah. We're about as generous as any organization could possibly be. That any time two or more of us bunch up and, 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 and our purpose is to stay sober, we can call ourselves an AA group. And nobody has to approve that. Now, we can meet for the purpose of trying to get an insurrection against Alcoholics Anonymous if we want to. Nobody is going to be able to challenge our right to function. So even though I talk about the, the variations of quality, it, 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 there, nobody can say what is or is not a group. From my personal standpoint, some of the things have no semblance to what I think a group is. But that's not my business, really. Uh, it, mine is to try to try to contribute however I can in the ways I describe, you know, with how I can make a, a good, strong group, how I can provide some leadership and help to tie that into the groups around us, uh, how I can contribute overall. And so, you know, if I approach it with how to be a good neighbor, how to be helpful to folk, uh, the ways come out, uh, including folks in. Uh, you know, I, have, I, I, I won't go into all of it, but one of the things we have to do is <coughs> deliberately avoid taking over our district. Uh, we have to avoid that because when we go in, if you don't watch it, we'll have every office, whether we intend to or not. And so we have to deliberately manage so that we don't take over the district. And so things like that are just kind of thoughtful things to do. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Um, when you yeah, Bill. Say how you started newcomer meetings yeah. to deal with the problem of like, you know, school addiction, yeah. what exactly are you doing those meetings? We have an agenda. We, we don't throw it up for grabs. We don't just have a free-for-all, you know, of let's all talk and reason together. We, we have a, 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 an agenda, and it's not a school, but it's a, it's a thing built around introductory stuff, stuff. What we asked people to do when we revised it last time was remember when you came in. What did you really need to know? What did you really need to get? And so our agenda is our memories of what we needed. And, and so it's got specific things on there. We go for, um, we, we repeat it for, well, I think three cycles, I believe, that we, we repeat. Uh, we do the thing for a cycle, and then we repeat the same thing over. Uh, so it's, it's, it's structured that way. We try to involve the folk somewhat in the meeting, but it's not a discussion meeting. It, it's, uh, it's, it's to give that information and then to engage them just like this. You know, we did a whole bunch of presentation, a little bit of interaction. Uh, but that, that's what it is. It's just introductory material based on what we believe we needed when we came in, and the other folk are not going to be radically different. It really works well. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, Say what, Steve? The General Service Office has a package. Yeah, it does. It, it's a good, a good package. We've used it. Uh, what Steve was saying is there's in the literature there's a listing for it. That one is a it's a it. We quit using it. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but because there were some things that just were not adequately addressed in it, and so we use a little something different now. But that's a great package for if you look at the introductory material. It's right there in print, and it's cheap too. <laughs> <laughs> Always think about that. Yeah, yeah thanks, Steve. Anybody else? Here? Name it, claim it. What what we're talking about, I, I don't know. Maybe it's the stuff that you need to think about. But uh, you know, you know, what we what we talk about uh, to me, it, it's a tremendously important dimension to gain in alcoholics. Now, I, I just 
just say this and we'll, we'll wrap her up. I, I think there's some, a lot of tremendous junctures and turning points in the program. For those of you there Friday night, I think I alluded a, a little bit to one of the junctures is in going through the steps is when we get to the to through with inventory and, and, and there's a real critical decision point of deciding to move forward and do the rest of the program. An awful lot of people never get past that juncture and opt out and, and, and wind up seeing Alcoholics Anonymous as just a place to go and get what I need. And you can absolutely go to the bank on it, I believe, that people who make that decision ha are going to have a time-limited recovery because it's only a matter of time till you start getting saturated if that's all you can see it is a place to get what you need. And if I don't get to a point where I become an active channel in carrying this to other people and into to, to getting those things straightened out in my life, th that I'm, going to, I'm not going to have a good time in Alcoholics Anonymous. And there's another juncture, and I think it's the one we're talking about right now, where this program has to shift from a me focus to a we focus. <clears throat> a buddy of mine in, in uh, Raleigh used to say it well, that it's the strangest kind. It is a selfish program, no, no question about it. Those little examples I gave about the kind of selfish. You give it away and you can't give away more than you get. The guy used to say it's the strangest selfishness in the world. It's about 10% gimme and about 90% give. And if I don't learn that, I'm going to have difficulty in alcoholics and you know, I have to get to a point where I can recognize that my greatest insurance is how well I can actively try to, to serve others. And in the process, I get more than I could possibly <coughs> imagine. And, but if I don't learn it, if, if my motivation is always on what can I get, I miss the whole spirit of what this thing's about. And, I, and that's what it, it's about this morning. It's, it's about seeing that it's great for me to be a decent sponsor to guys I work with. It's great for me to do the best I can something like this. But I have to recognize that it's got to be bigger. And so if I can't tie in and see how I can contribute to this thing as a whole, I'm not going to get much effectiveness done. Anybody, any last thing? Well, I agree with Donald. Y'all have been a, a great bunch. I, I had a good time here this weekend. Yeah, Sam, Sam. That we, what she's talking about, the, the, the folks that have a whole bunch of agendas, come, uh, different agendas than this. That, you know, we, we, it's, it's tricky, you know, and there's no real simple kind of a, a response to that other than to say this. The, the surest resolution for those kind of conflicts I know is, is focused on the primary purpose, as stated. You know, that the primary, uh, that each group had one primary purpose, carry its message, the alcoholic still suffered. When you start get, trying to handle it at the personal belief level, it's always a big fight. But the, the more you can focus on the principle, the principle of the primary purpose, that starts to define what, what moves toward it and what doesn't. 
And, and so I think you got to do it. And in the planning, it's like that uh, correctional facility thing we're going to do this afternoon. Uh, we'll be talking about the primary purpose there. Now, if we got into to individual fine-tuning about how we do it, how each one does it, if, but what we'll try to do is come to that primary purpose. And so what I'm suggesting is that, that, that the personal level is not always the best place to attack that. It's to get it in a neutral ground, like if you've got a treatment facility committee. Is to get that committee to put that on the agenda, and the agenda is the primary purpose. What are we doing to satisfy the primary purpose? If you start trying to do it just on the basis of personal debate, uh, it's always a real sticky wicket. And so that's one of the places I think we have to broaden the agenda a bit. So are you suggesting that we should do uh, workshops within the committees on primary purpose? Or just have the committee meeting around the primary purpose? You know, review what you're being doing. Review what you're doing. It's like we did in newcomer business, where we set an agenda on the basis of the collective experience of what achieves the primary. You know, it doesn't need a workshop. You know, I think workshop stuff to death. Sometimes you just take the principle and then try to work around it. You know, how do we get this thing accomplished? Yeah, you know, it's the thing that, and that, that the way I would go at something like that. You got to broaden it from just that personal kind of combat thing. Yeah. Committee it to death. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks guys. Thank you very much.